It's time to go for one of the toughest races in the year. 12 hours of going up and down a mountain with walls either side of you reminding you of the danger. Some call it the blue hell. To us, it's Mount Panorama. Welcome along to the iRacing 2024. 12 hours of Bathurst powered by the coach Dave Delta. Who will be able to keep the Delta in the green? Who will be able to put it purple and leave it in victory lane? We're about to find out in what is going to be one of, if not the toughest, special event of the year. It's Arjuna Kegi party it's you and o'leary here to kick you off uh, kick you off as we get ready to go you and i've been waiting for this one the mountain can be treacherous at the best of times and we're gonna have a rip roaring 49 gt3 cars rolling out there here at the mountain yeah very excited for this one really enjoyed the real life buffers 12 hour last week and so this one should be more of the same it's the second endurance race in the iracing special event schedule at this part of the season they come thick and fast but i think i'd go along with you outside of the 24 hour races which of course bring their own challenge this might well be the most difficult endurance challenge elsewhere with the wall so close the circuit so challenging over the course of uh, 12 hours here today. And of course, we start under the pitch black of night. Drivers will have to qualify with no uh, real light other than the headlights with which to illuminate the path. So that always keep, uh, keeps things even more interesting. This is just the start of what is a very, very long journey, though, on the iRacing special event calendar. And of course, we finished off with our focus at the World Center of Racing. We won't see Daytona until we roll back around in 2025. Let's talk about the history about this event because boy does it have some history because go back to 2018 when this used to be a multi-class affair much like it is in the real world it was pure racing team and hoisting belt core motorsports albeit with two drivers that everyone's going to recognize now with other names lauren heinrich and moritz Lohner coming out on top in the porsche cup car go to 2021 the first year that we made a gt3 only well max verstappen took the first of two back-to-back -back victories luke McHugh and elvis ranking coming out on top last year you and unpredictable, I think, to say the very least, what we're in for here today. It is going to be unpredictable somewhat, but we do know in terms of things we can predict that Team Redline are pretty strong round here. Two years in a row for them in 2021 and 22. Now that Luke Bennett is back certainly uh, this year to try and repeat his 2022 success. Enzo Benito as well. Max Verstappen, I think, is unlikely to appear, but, uh, <laughs> but he's won this race twice and uh, as has uh, a couple of others. So rich history, as you say, now into its seventh edition, this great race. I don't know what you're talking about. Max Verstappen's got a sim rig on his plane, doesn't he? Uh, so he'll join Apparently. us. He'll join us from the sky. Let's talk about the cars, of course. Since we last came here for this race, we've added some new cars into the mix, of course, of the Audi R8 LMS Evo 2, I believe the Ferrari 296. Um, and as well, uh, of course, let's not rec forget that we've got the brand new Porsche 992, which I think was here last year. So there are some new cars. BOP or Always a hot button talking point, and I think the biggest talking point you see the largest number a 3% power cut to the Ferrari 296. Not sure how many of them we'll see here today. Yeah, that's rendered it a little bit on the uncompetitive side, or, or well, maybe not on the uncompetitive, but certainly on the unpopular side of things with the amount of power that's been taking away. So that's a bit of a shame. But some of the other cars will be very strong indeed. The likes of the Lamborghini expected to be strong, especially early on in the race in the darkness. Porsches were expected to be good in qualifying as well, but there's always question marks about the viability of that car over the course of a long distance. Of course, Porsche coming out on top a week ago in the Bathurst 12 hours in the real world. It was Iron Chen Guven along with uh, Lawrence Van Tour and Matt Campbell winning in the Manti uh, EMA machine. And of course, I know Lewis, uh, Ewan loves that uh, livery. So does Lewis McLeod, the, the Grello Manti car. Here's a look at the track, though. We're talking about 6.2 kilometers of mostly public roads. It's 23 turns. 174 meters, almost 600 feet of vertical ele uh, vertical elevation change. I mean, it really is one of those tracks where you know there's two or three passing opportunities, and for most of the lap, you and you're running single file. Yeah, that is true, and it makes this race one of those really important ones in terms of qualifying. You don't often say this in a special event. But it really is important to qualify well around here. Otherwise, it's going to be a very difficult, certainly first part of the race for you. I think qualifying at the back of the field, you've got almost no chance. Even qualifying 20th, you're going to be a long way off the lead by the end of the first stint. Let's go ahead then and take a look at our track guide. There are some returning drivers here to the iRacing special events today and maybe no more special of them, at least maybe to me, than Moritz Lerner, winner of this race all the way back in its inaugural edition. Hello yeah, everyone, so please. And welcome to the iRacing Bathurst 12 Hours um, track guide. I'm Moritz Luna, driver for BMW MT Mouse. 
and I will take you on a lap around Bathurst in uh, the BMW M4 GT3 and uh, yeah, show you the lap. First up, we start the step in the last corner, obviously. Um, over start finish, get a good run for the fast lap that we want to do in qualifying. Um, braking and turning into turn one is tr quite tricky. The car almost wants to slide out all the time. Use all the curb available on the exit um, because you have a long straight ahead that's going uphill. You want to take as much like, power out of the corner as you can. Over this crest here, um, shifting into fifth. And then, yeah, very tricky corner up here, down to third. You want to stay on as, as far on the inside as you can. Outside has no grip, especially if you try moves, uh, it won't work on the outside. And here, braking here is very difficult. Also here, try to be quite far on the inside. There's a crest on accelerating. The rear tires lift off a little bit, you lose traction. So you gotta be thoughtful and careful with uh, acceleration out of this corner to not lose traction and uh, spin your wheels. Everything here is full throttle. Um, this one especially with the wall coming very close. And here, a small lift over the crest. Uh, stay on the inside, don't take too much to curb on the right side. And then, yeah, downhill, skyline it's called. Um, very tricky braking, easy to lose the car under braking. Small jump in the left corner here. And also here, hard braking zone, downhill, stay on the inside, it gives you rotation. Onto the Falcon uh, wall, um, easy to kiss. I think this is probably the, the wall that will be hit the most throughout the race. Um, yeah, long straight ahead over the crest here, prepare for the braking zone, which is quite important. You would think the next corner is quite slow, but you can carry a lot of speed on the apex. Down to third. And then, yeah, try to not go on the grass there on the outside, obviously, uh, which I just did a little bit. And then last corner, very tricky, easy to mess up a good lap, because the curb on the inside is too high to hit, so you should avoid it. And then over the first line, that is your finish line, and that is your lap at Bathurst. I hope this helped you a little bit to understand uh, the circuit. Um, very tricky um, track, especially driving for 12 hours when fatigue um, kicks in and uh, tiredness. Then the walls are getting very close and uh, it's easy to make a very small mistake, which eventually can end your race. Hopefully that doesn't happen for most of the people, for most of the drivers out there. And hopefully we have an uh, exciting race up ahead. Great to have Moritz back on the iRacing Special Events. He self-admittedly is in the stream team, BMW M Team Mal's uh, car alongside Yuri Kastorp, but Max Benecker, uh, Patrick Holtzman, I think here with intent. Yes, 10K Benecker is back and with the 10K next to his name. We get out of that track, guy, just in time to catch the second half of the qualifying session. Eight minutes thrown onto the clock, drivers get the track to themselves and two laps with which to work. Often we don't really know which of the laps is going to be faster, lap one or lap two. Historically, they're have been you know trends as to how drivers have conditioned have built up temperature in their tires and so right now as Benica works his way to the line we're watching his BMW M team mouse car right now I get the sneaking suspicion conditioning on the opening lap that lap time a 202 291 maybe never mind that's a pretty quick lap time let's see where everyone else will stack up though on the board Ewan yeah, it's going to be uh, pretty thick and fast by the looks of things with some very fast lap times coming in early on. Tristan Iglesias for semi-fine, Daniel Lafuente for Williams are already below the 202s, Team Redline as well. We do have some very quick times coming in first, but I'm sure these, these guys won't all be going for two quick lap times in a row, surely. I mean, somebody might well go for the slow first lap strategy here this afternoon, but uh, as of yet, not seeing many slow laps. Now I can see a few slow lap times actually at the bottom of the field. Uh, Try, just try to keep on top of their tire temperatures really and really sort of uh, prioritize that second time around. There are some interesting team names in the mix here today and with three minutes left in qualifying, it does seem as though everybody will get the chance to complete two flying laps. As mentioned, plenty of slow lap times coming in, but interesting that there were some drivers with quote unquote benchmark banker laps, whatever you want to call them, just to make sure they got some stability as they run their way around the track. Let's jump on board though with Benneker. 
in this uh, run down through Skyline. That was quite tentative, if anything, through uh, that uh, entry. I get the sneaking suspicion he may have invalidated his lap at the first couple of corners. He will not get a chance to fight for pole position. Instead, let's focus on Tristan Iglesias, who in the IMSA Esports Global Championship, Ewan was flying in this Porsche. He was flying around Forest Elbow there as well. That was extremely close to the wall, especially since, well, maybe it helps, I suppose, that he can't really see where the wall is at the moment. But, uh, but there you go. Down onto Comrade Straight now, and there'll be maximum commitment on the way down here in towards the chase. As I said earlier, expecting the Porsches to run well here in qualifying, but how long are they going to be up there in terms of the race? It is sometimes more difficult to keep this car going for hour after hour in iRacing compared to some of the others here at Bathurst. So let's see, first of all, and settle qualifying here as Iglesias comes out the final corner. You can also see, by the way, the sun beginning to rise. It does mean us race start, not in complete pitch black conditions, but the qualifying session is now. Simu find no improvement, so that's interesting. Here comes Redline and Florian Labigra. He's within a hundredth of a second of his best lap time, but no improvement for him. Lafuente for Williams to fifth. Ariel for Redline up into four to make two of their Lamborghinis into the mix. Marla Racing Team to six, and Luke Bennett out of nowhere by almost three tenths of a second to pole. Cody D slots into second. Here comes the Altitude Esports car, which does sit in 13th on this run to the line. That's going to take some beating. The triple one stays 13th by the looks of it, but Luke Bennett is going to take some beating in this qualifying session. A 2.016 is exceptionally quick from him. Cody D in second place. It's Lamborghini and Porsche filling out the first three rows in that order as of right now and it looks like a top six difficult to break into for the rest. Here comes the uh, Delinti Esports by TK Machine, new sponsor for them and no lap time on the first attempt and Victor Miranda is going to settle for 44th position and that might be for the most part qualifying done and dusted, 30 seconds left on the clock. David Toth in the Brabham Esports car switched on over from uh, the Arnage competition colors, you see him on your screen there. Uh, he might be the final driver with a chance to try and set a lap time, but 20 seconds to go, he's cutting it close here. He is, uh, is he gonna get to the line in time? Uh, I think so, but not with many seconds to spare, and you can imagine that slight stress of that is probably not a good thing for his lap. He'll come into the final corner now in the 62 car, and will just about get there but it's going to be a time a little bit wide of the mark i'm afraid and he will be starting from down the back of the order so difficult to do at this circuit and interesting max benneker did seem to go out there for another attempt in qualifying if not getting the chance to finish it onto the board well that's the qualifying session in the books a 12-hour sprint now lies in store how important will that qualifying be Maybe it helps you keep out of trouble. Let's find out how they will line up through the 49 machines ready to do battle in the 2024 edition of the iRacing Bathurst 12 Hours, powered by the coach Dave Delta. Pitch black conditions for the drivers to deal with, but Luke Bennett navigates through them all successfully. He'll put it on pole position, trying to, of course, replicate his win alongside Verstappen, who might be watching on from the sidelines. Cody Deeth alongside in the virtual coach.gg by GNG Machine, the 001, and then Florian Labigra inside of three red line machines on that inside row. Tristan Iglesias flying in the Porsche as ever on the outside of row two. Enzo Benito, Luke Crane's favorite driver uh, inside of row three. Daniel Pastor in the purple front end Williams Esports BenQ car rolls alongside. We've got a lot of cars to work through. Dylan Burst uh, from down under in the door Esports Lamborghini is, rolls alongside Gustavo Ariel for Team Redline. Lafuente for the Chill Blast Williams car. Then has Felix Kornback for company in the Marla Racing Team and his teammate, uh, uh, Phil Dinez back in the first of the BMW MT BS Plus competitions cars. Jakub Maciejewski for the Drago HC 696 is 12. And hopefully not unlucky 13 for Parker White for Williams Esports Fanatec. Ricardo Rico, Drago Racing in 14th. And James Baumey for Altitude Esports alongside Alex Dunn for the Apex Racing Team. Some work for them to do. Not getting the most out of the Mercedes seemingly in qualifying. Fenelosa 17th. Yeti Tekela for GridandGo.com 18th. And then to bookend the top 20, the returning Max Benica in the BMW M Team Mouse Car. Seven tenths off, not sending the lap on lap number two. Sam Ward alongside, and then Mark Perez, Thibaut Prevost for Simify Williams Esports Academy and Simify and Falcon Sim Racing. Round out your 
front 24, and only around halfway through the grid, we find our previous race winner in a GT3 special event, Sontek Racing. They're rolling on the formation lap. We got a blast. Williams Esports Academy, Entropic, Sontek, ATRS, and Drago make up the rest of the top 30. And as you still go through strong drivers, BMW M Team BS Plus competition, two Apex Racing Academy cars, Sabolt, PGZ, and Falcon Sim Racing make up the top 36. BS Turner, German Sim Racing, BMW M Team Mouse, WSR Esports Butt Kicker, and then Fire Sim Sport make up the top 42. And final couple of names on your screen. Ewan, your closing thoughts, opening thoughts, as you get ready to go racing. Well, stay out of trouble on the opening lap has got to be the order of the day. Get into single file for the first run across the top of the mountain is going to be so key. But most of the damage for those that are out of contention already has already been done. Well, pace car off and away, and we're not hanging about instantly. Luke Bennett picks up the throttle. He'll keep the Delta in the green. We're racing for the Bathurst 12 hours, powered by Coach Dave Delta. In towards Hell Corner, it's going to be single file at the front, side by side for third as Enzo Benito, Cody Deeth, juke it out through the long left-hander. It's on to Mountain Straight, though, for the first time of asking, can we get... 47 GT3 machines out of turn number one safely. That's a question on all the team managers' minds. Seemingly one car starts on pit lane. No drama though through the field. It'll be up to Griffin's bed. First time of asking. And if you're left on the outside, a dangerous place to be on cold tires. And that's why single file we get through the field, up to the cutting, a double left-hander, not a passing opportunity. And I cannot believe that I'm saying this. Ewan, a tidy start to the Bathurst 12 hours. And I think that Luke Bennett has got a, a role to play in that as well. Such an early start from him. Immediately as the pace car pulled into pit lane, he went and took advantage of the fact that Red Line were all lined up on the inside three in a row. He was able to get Florian Lapina into second place from third. And he was able to get Enzo Benito from fifth into fourth position. Couldn't quite get him past Cody Deef, but it's Red Line, three of them inside the top four, which is a fantastic start for them. And as they suspected or, or uh, said that they wanted to at the start of the day they can begin to control and dominate the front of the race from the very beginning and as i said no crashes to start this i racing bathurst 12 hours words i'm i can hardly believe myself fighting down out of what is here on i racing the falcon tire elbow that corner seems to get a new name every other weekend for us it's a site of a battle between the likes of the apex racing team and williams esports fanatec and even altitude esports there's really not much happening at the front this first stint to the race you could actually save up to two three laps of fuel when you're hung back in traffic max benneker not trying to hang around he'll try and get some moves made. He's up to 18th already around the outside of Altus uh, Esports and now trying to work past Grid and Go next up in queue. Still has to deal though with Carlos Fenelosa alongside. Yeah, I think if we're looking for cars to move forward through the order over the course of the day, then take a look at some of the BMWs and just watch and marvel at some of the overtakes that are going to be made here across the course of the afternoon. It's going to be at Max Benecker as well, especially, who's going to be making the... Whoa! Oh, that's a bit of a squeeze, though. Not sure whether uh, who's really at fault for that one, but Benecker certainly run out of room, and now he's under pressure from one of the Williams Mercedes as well. Just to reiterate, two red line cars at the front. You might expect them to try and bump draft to get away. We'll keep you a beam on the timing that they'll try and pull away look at these moves though being made Benica really getting compromised there he'll stay in front though of the battle behind us that's Thibaut Prevo in the Williams Esports Academy car that holds off Sam Ward for Team PGZ I mean this is really where all of the action is especially knowing that we haven't had any issues on lap number one side by side into the cutting it's Troncoso for Drago Racing passing Sonsex Lassie Urina it's slightly bizarre to see more side by side on lap two into the cutting than we saw even on lap one, certainly inside the front positions. But for the first time, we do see them uh, trying to run through that narrow section again uh, side by side. Now over the cross, the top of the mountain, it's still one long line, really. Everybody trying to stay in touch. And this is what I meant about in qualifying being so important. If you're up down at the back of the field at the moment, where do you make the moves? basically more than half the circuit is sort of off limits for overtaking it's not very conducive to making up tens of places no it's difficult and it's why we do see breakaways in races like this out of the elbow one more time long run out of uh, that corner down into the next breaking zone maybe your primary passing opportunity and at least right now uh, cody deeth uh, australia's own holding on quite well now he does race uh 
if I remember correctly, is it uh, Hyundai XL? No, I'm com confusing him with Dylan Burris, correct me. Uh, Cody Deeth, the former Williams eSports driver that's made the switch over to Virtual Coach by uh, Grid and Go. He finds himself in a precarious spot, though, in front of Enzo Benito, and then separating Benito from the two red line machines in front. Think back to Daytona, Ewan, when the red line cars combined so effectively to pull away through the pump drafting strategy. Exactly. And are we going to see a similar thing here? You wouldn't say it's impossible at a circuit like Bathurst. There's some very long straights here. And if two cars do get together and start bumping one another down the straights, or, or not even that, just you know, putting on a, a, a strong pace at the front of the field, who's going to be able to match them? That's going to be the tricky thing for, for everybody else. And it's basically in the hands right now of Cody Deef as to whether this field continues to be in touch with those red line guys or not. And at the moment, he is slipping and uh, beginning to lose touch. Riding on board, you see the sun continuing to rise. By the time we get out of this first hour, you might suspect that it will be mostly risen. That's going to be part of the challenge that these drivers have to deal with, the changing conditions. Now, we are in the Australian summer, so 24 degrees Celsius now, about as cold as it's ever going to be. Yesterday, in our Friday night preview that we had on RaceBot TV, uh, covering some of the official GT3 racing, you and we saw track temperatures in excess of 45 degrees Celsius. And, and those are the temperatures where other cars may come into play. We're speaking to a few teams before the race about which cars are going to be strongest here and when. And the Lamborghini is going to be strong at this part of the race in cooler temperatures. If we get a cold day, then you'd imagine they'll be away and home in the Lamborghini. But if it gets really unbearably warm, how difficult is it going to be in those temperatures? And is that going to affect Redline either way? That's the big question here. But... You just never know what kind of temperatures we're going to see over the course of this race. It fluctuates at one of the most sort of uh, most amount of fluctuations, if you like, of any special event that we have. You're having issues, by the way, watching us on iRacing's Twitch. Apologies for these technical issues. Uh, we seemingly are unaffected, though, on YouTube. So do come and join us there, whether it's on the iRacing channels or on RaceBot TV. If you're on RaceBot TV, you can always enjoy the fascinating chat of uh, Vince Cousy, who fortunately, at least so far, you and we're not talking about wet toes. I've just brought it up, though. I apologize. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> it's, all, it's in there now. So uh, and upside down because we're in Australia. So there we go. Um, but It's uh, true. It, it's, uh, it's a disadvantage, but, uh, it, but, but you might, race prop TV might be your option, so, uh, it's, so never mind. Um, you, you'll have to deal with him, I'm afraid. But uh, he'll keep you company over the course of 12 hours, and it is going to be a long race, so we're, we'll, we'll settle in, and I'm sure that, uh, or I hope anyway, that people will enjoy the, the duration of the race and stay with us as well, because it will be an interesting one. Yeah, especially because we do have a lot of driver cameras, so we're going to continue just to hopefully get to cycle around all of them. Parker White alongside of uh, Daniel Pastor and a couple of the Williams Esports cars. And of note, we're watching Pastor in a Porsche, uh, the 992 Generation Cup car. Uh, of course, a Generation machine, not Cup car, uh, but shares the body of the Cup car, the, the wide-angle stance that makes it a little bit more difficult to pick the two apart. You go back to Parker White, of course, who splits his duties, not just in the Porsche Esports Super Cup, but in the... Uh, uh, E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series as well. He's in one of the Mercedes uh, for the team, and so that's going to make things a little bit more interesting as to how they built the setup, how they shared the data. At the very least, you and they know exactly how strong every other car is. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that Williams has decided to sort of split their strategies in that respect and, and go for different cars uh, with different teams, but I guess it's just the, the way that each team feels comfortable, the way that they've uh, sort of settled in terms of how they've practiced for this race, and this is what they've landed on. Mercedes for Parker White, uh, the Porsche for the uh, Daniel Pastor driven seventh place car as of right now. We've got Vasilis Belotsiotis driving the number one chill blast car as well at the moment, by the way. He's in ninth place in the Porsche, so it's certainly the Porsche that's coming out on top at the moment, but I expected that from qualifying, to be honest. So BMW M Team Mals, if you're tracking them, uh, Max Benneker to 18th position has just passed Carlos Fenelosa. Can follow along with live timing and scoring by heading to timing.racebot.tv. Can also try and follow along by heading to timing71.org and using their uh, suite of data analysis tools. If it works for you, just download their Chrome plugin. It seems to make things work just that little bit better. Here we come for a move up front, though. Gustavo Ariel's going to look to try and pass Daniel Pastor. And we've got four of these Redline Lamborghinis already inside of the top 10. It's an 
ominous sign mentioned that some teams had to switch away from the Ferrari seeing the final BOP. Uh, I don't think it's any shock to people to hear that Redline, who have been very f uh, fond favourites of the Ferrari since its debut, one of those teams as well. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be affecting them. As you say, they're, they're right up there again. And this is sort of a, a similar performance to Daytona, and you might be wondering, well, there's, only, there's four cars here, and there's only two at the front of Daytona finishing on the podium together. Well, that is true, but when you think about it, you need less drivers for a Bathurst 12 hour. Most of these teams in the past, and I'd imagine this year as well, have, have gone with two drivers. In fact, only two teams in the past have, have won in GT3 with more than two drivers, and the last of those was now four years ago. It very much seemed like three drivers for a 12-hour race is a thing of the past, and for a big team like Team Redline, that means you can put an extra car on the grid. And when it comes to these 12-hour uh, races as well, you have less ability to try and uh, divvy up the stints in a way that's, uh, let's say, responsible uh, to the sleeping habits of the drivers. And co commentators alike, to be fair, uh, self-pity, hashtag, on the broadcast. We've managed to, to bring that one in. It's uh, it, it, I, I, The only reason I bring that up is I see Phil Dinez starting the number 89 BMW M Team BS competition car. Uh, he lives in, in Monterey, California. He spends a lot of time actually flying out to uh, Italy uh, over the course of 2023, where he was racing in the Italian GT Series, uh, not in the BMW. Well, no, I, shall, I, I will just point out. Uh, but it is 4:50 in the morning for him, and you and he's decided he wants to start the race off. I don't know why he's decided to do that, or whether someone decided that for him. But I can, I can only imagine. Uh, what he's been going through this morning. And it's not only about waking up for the start of this race, is it? It, it? It's not like he woke up 20 minutes ago to start this race now, is it? He will have been in the practice session before. He's got to do all the sign-up business. He's got to practice beforehand. He's got to wake himself up. So goodness knows what time he woke up this morning. Maybe he's not even been to bed yet. Oh, no, he's definitely been to bed. Trust me. There's no... Uh, as a someone who goes through this on a regular basis, you, you have to get whatever sleep you can. Um... Moving through the field, by the way, we're not really seeing any real breakaways building yet. 13th and 14th split by around 1.5 second. S uh, second and third split by around 1.3 at this time. So no one yet out of drafting range, but increasingly we're getting closer to the threshold where we are going to potentially see those at the front start to see their advantage open up as the temperatures start to uh, rise as well. One name, by the way, that you may see through in the field later on today that is not in the car now. No Max Verstappen, so no quote-unquote real-world driver in that regard. But Sebastian Weldon is going to be part of the Mahler Racing Team entry, which, by the way, is the best running of the BS competition cars right now currently under the power of Felix Kornbach. Uh, Weldon, part of the Andretti development program, of course, the son of the late, great Dan Weldon. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how he continues you in getting experience here on the sim. Yeah, and uh, not no stranger to the sim in, in, in some respects, but we'll be good to see him out there when, uh, when we get there. But maybe not throwing him in straight for the start of this race, which is a pretty intense affair. There's uh, no doubt about that. So... Felix Kornbach starting the, the number 10 Mahler Racing Team car and the sole representative of BMW inside the top 10 at the moment. I think that fairly accurately shows which cars are maybe strongest for out qualifying in the early part of this race. BOP conversations have managed to sneak their way into the mix, but we're starting to see some action, business picking up as look at this into the final corner, Helter Skelter, who's going to come out on top in a battle for what I think effectively is 25th position. It's side by side between uh, BMW M Team BS competition, Ruben Bonger trying to lean on Nicholas Laubisch in the Falcon Sim Racing car, powered by Door Esports, but no change as we filter out of turn one onto Mountain Straight. And one thing to note, it's anything but straight. Plenty of undulation to speak of. Here comes a move to the outside. Sontek Racing trying to take advantage. But you really can't afford to be, and there you go, just a lifting off on the way in towards turn two. You really can't afford to be on the outside there. The camber of this turn means that you f fire yourself straight up the hill, and if you're not careful, straight into the wall. So you really want to avoid being on the outside there as much as you possibly can, and getting single file by the time you get to the real mountain section is probably a good idea too. Because as we've noted, this circuit is somewhat uh, difficult to overtake on, which is a bit of a misconception that people get around here, that there is a lot of overtaking chances. And, and there is, but at this time in the race, there's not many, uh, not much ambition to do it. And the chances are not so clear. So that's why we're seeing 
fairly limited overtake, especially inside the top 10. Especially given that, you know, cold temperatures, this is the chance to drivers really save some fuel if you're going to try and do any sort of strategy it begins now when it's uh, fuel savings at its hardest you see on the left side of the screen not really any movers and shakers inside of your top 10 i think that's more just indicative of how the start uh, led by luke bennett a like you and mentioned i think fair point led to a very tidy clean start but b in some ways also led to a jockeying of the rows alex dunn with a big send up the inside of jakub maciejewski to slide forward to 12th as the apex racing team try to charge forward can't quite believe i'm saying this but we're 15 minutes in for the first time let's take a look at the replay of what kicked off you and all of the chaos Oh dear, that's Williams a bit over ambitious down the inside there into the chase and then all hell breaks loose here. Lots of weaving around and, and close to a secondary accident actually there. But thankfully we got away with it. It is remarkable that we're 15 minutes in now and we that is pretty much the first one we've seen to be honest all, all day long and, and that's a fantastic thing. Glad that we can say that as well. Not often that uh, you have clean starts uh, at Bathurst. Uh, Friday night preview, I alluded to it. It's something we've done now at RaceBot twice, once in 2022 and once in 2024. Uh, in 2022, we crashed in the final corner before the green flag. This year, you and at least we got to turn number one. Well, it's, a, it's a start at least, but uh, but to be fair, that's not normally where the incidents actually are. It's You normally get through turn one here, okay? Maybe sometimes turn two, but and it's just after that that's the problem. Yeah, the cutting's dangerous, isn't it? It just is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And we saw that in real life, didn't we? Someone nearly oh, uh, totally hot. nearly getting out of the boundaries of the circuit, very close to it. I can't remember who it was, but uh, but it was a fairly large accident. Hopefully we see less of them today. It was a BMW. It was... Uh... <laughs> I forget who it was. That was partially assisted by traffic. So just, you know, one thing to keep in yeah. mind. And this race, of course, now being a single class affair, as opposed to the multi-class affair that it once upon a time used to be. We're not going to get the, 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 the punching, uh, the, the boxing round in effect. That was the first pass through of traffic under the night skies when the poor Porsche Cup cars really did get bullied. I get the sense, by the way, Patience is going to wear thin sooner rather than later because now the draft officially has been broken. Cody D, two seconds back from your race leader. Luke Bennett, Florian Labigra, Enzo Benito at some point. Ewan is going to have a, a moment of reckoning when he realizes he's got to get past and not hang around. Well, is he going to have that desire, though, or is he going to stick behind here knowing that everybody's being slowed up by this and his teammates are benefiting from it? How much of a team game are they going to play here, Redline, with Bennett and Labiga out front? Does Benito want to join them or does he want to see their gap extended? And to be fair, he might be able to do both at once. If he goes for an overtake and whether he makes it through or not, he's going to slow Cody Deeth down and that will allow the red line guys to get out front further and it could allow Benito into third as well so there could be a double benefit to that but look at how close he's getting on the way into turn two he is having a look for the first time so maybe he's not so willing to just sit there by the way Tristan Iglesias I'm, I'm quite disappointed because he's made his bed Ewan and then gone and blurred his background can you believe it uh well I think he's I made his bed. Exactly, that was my point. How can you really tell? <laughs> because I can't really see. But, uh, but yeah, I mean... My, my logic is, is I need glasses, Ewan, so I've just, I took them off and suddenly everything was in focus for me. <laughs> Very good. That's how it works, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure it does. I mean, I wouldn't know. I don't need glasses. I can see Oh, uh, look at you, showing off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I, I half joke, but, you know, my, my glasses for a long time, I thought that was what was holding me back from being a racing driver. Then I got iron racing i learned it was something totally else entirely we're about 20 minutes complete in this race we're still unsure as to well exactly how the fuel window for this first stint is going to play on out uh, based on some of the information that we have gotten 29 30 laps or so that's sort of the target sort of a stint um, in this ballpark range we'll see how it plays out though with all of these long queues allowing for mega fuel sake effectively the train goes first second then third through 13th, and then you in 14th on back. Yes, it, and, and this is what I mean about qualifying earlier on. It's so difficult to work your way forward and see, see the, the, the large trains that we've got further back. How are you ever going to move through that? We haven't seen too much overtaking back there, so it's not just these front guys who are not willing to do it, but it's just difficult. So you can see that the amount that the field is strung out now. I mean, look at the guys back in 40th place or so, and they're nearly half a minute off the lead already. 
these are just gaps that you're never going to be able to close over the course of a, a race like this. So, unfortunately, for some of these teams, the damage has already been done for this race, even in the first 20 minutes. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, it, this is a 12-hour sprint. There's no ifs or buts about it. There's no safety cars to help bring you back into the mix. You have to get it right, right from the start. You have to go for it. Gustavo Arion thought about it. Excuse me, Enzo Benito thought about it. Didn't really want to go for the move. Gustavo Arion to go back in the red line machine that has to work its way forward to join the top two up front. Currently Ryan rides behind Damon Woods in the Door Esports machine. The, the number nine Lamborghini. And again, in terms of the balance of these cars, interesting to see that mid-engine, rear engine looking quite strong. Other thing to note, naturally aspirated cars running quite strong as well. Yeah, looks, uh, looks to be the way for the moment. And so... Uh, where is the first turbocharged car? I guess 10th place? Uh, BMW is still turbocharged, isn't it? I think yep, so. It is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just making sure I've not uh, <laughs> missed, a, uh, missed a fact. So, uh, yeah, 10th place back to the first turbocharged car. But, uh, but yeah, it's good to see the somewhat variety at the front of the field, I suppose. I think towards the end of the race, we're going to get a bit more variety, though, because as, as I mentioned, the Lamborghini is going to be not quite as strong as it is right now when it heats up a little bit later on, although some of that depends on how much it heats up, which we still don't know. Hey, variety is the spice of life, is uh, what they say, right? Oh, looking from up above as Tristan Iglesias closes on Enzo Benito, as mentioned earlier, Luke Crane's favorite person in the world. If you want to follow along, by the way, with Team Redline, you know, they've got one of their team streams going on. I can only imagine the shenanigans they're getting up to behind the scenes and uh, it would have maybe been even more uh, wild in terms of the chat that they would be having if Max Verstappen is here to try and win this race for a third time and the reason I bring that up is Enzo Benito w won this race with Max Verstappen and I distinctly remember you in that race and commenting uh, commenting on just how perfect they were driving they didn't put a foot wrong it's something that not often can be said about races here at the mountain no, it's it's difficult to do, but admittedly, but back then we, that was the first time we hadn't had uh, traffic in this race, which makes me think, you know, what, was there a little bit of, I'm not sure what quite the word is, but a, a little bit of not quite being aware of how a race around here could be run, because in previous times the carnage, if you want to call it that, would have been created, if you like, by traffic. But since it was just a GT free race for the first time, did we have a slightly uh, unrealistic idea of uh, of the driving that day i don't know but it's it, it was a good race for them that day i'm not sure why max verstappen didn't pair up with him again the year after but anyway enzo's only won it once as a result i don't think enzo ran that race if i remember correctly but uh don't quote me on that i could be wrong look at this shot by the way of cars just working their way up the mountain initially before they begin the plunge down we're getting to that point where the sun's rising. Not quite uh, something the drivers are having to contend with uh, in terms of sun being in their eyes or anything like that. But something to keep in mind, the conditions changing and changing fast. And look at that shot down the Conrod straight. Anything but straight in terms of its undulation. Yeah, so much un 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 undulation uh, around this circuit. Easy for me to say. And that's what makes this circuit so special. In fact, it's built on the side of a mountain. is uh, just remarkable. Public roads, the, the challenge, the history around this place is uh, absolutely remarkable and makes it such a great venue to go. So pleased that we can come here again in the Bathurst 12 hour uh, this season in the iRacing Special Event Calendar. And it's uh, a wonderful addition to it. By the way, in terms of Enzo Benito in 2022, just to clean that point up entirely, he did race in 2022, but didn't make it a single lap, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there were 50 cars that started that race, and only 32 of them got to the end of the first lap. So that just gives you an idea of how his race ended. Who did he race with? Uh, Alex Pelo. I'm not sure who oh, started wow. the car, but only one of them would have driven. <laughs> well, I mean, you go you know, Max Verstappen, Alex Pelo, you know. One's a multiple-time Formula One world champion. The other's the two-time NTT IndyCar Series champion. But not at the time. No, not at the time. Oh, look at you. <laughs> so demanding. Sorry. But at the time, he would have been the reigning defending champion of the series, wouldn't he have been? I know, but, but Max Verstappen would have been the reigning F1 champion, so oh, it would have been... Come on. You know. Look at you, the IndyCar disrespect. Uh, sorry. I'm just, uh, I'm just giving the counter argument for non-IndyCar fans because I know that... Uh, you're going to big up the IndyCar side, so oh, I'm going to, pr to provide the balance. 
Uh, people got surprised by that. There was a clip that got posted on social media of Alex Pillow racing in Super Formula. People seemingly forgot that he went off to do that for a couple of years in the uh, uh, effort to build up some, you know, super license points and keep him in contention for an F1 seat. He could have been in that conversation, uh, maybe not as a world champion. Who knows how that could have gone, which car he would have been in in the F1 bubble, but, you know, had the quality, had the ability. They're racing, by the way, this weekend, once again at Mount Panorama, albeit with the V8 supercars, if that's your kettle of fish. Uh, don't forget, iRacing Bathurst 1000 will come up later this year, and um, while we still have the old generation supercars on iRacing, you know, maybe with parity getting closer and closer between the uh, two homologated cars, uh, new generation homologated cars, maybe we could see the new machinery making its way to iRacing as well. And I bring this all up because we're only what, a, a week or so away from completing the latest iRacing season, from unlocking a new iRacing build, and not only new things coming to the service, new tracks, new cars, but you and it was announced yesterday, four new tracks being added to the base content pack to allow anybody to race. New Four, four new tracks free to everybody to go and race around. Yeah, and some, um, some pretty recognizable circuits as well uh, on, in the world of motorsport included, in, like uh, Oschersleben and it was it Sneston that uh, it, that really stuck out to me. Um, so pleased to see some of those uh, cars out on the excuse me, cars. some of those tracks on the uh, uh, on, on the free side of things because it can feel like you're doing the same things over and over sometimes. So hopefully that will give a bit of variety to people who are just getting into our racing and hopefully it keeps them longer so that they can eventually get to the stage where you're racing in an event like this. To confirm, it is Circuit Ledenon. Uh, Oscherschleben, Snetterton, and Winton. Ooh, speaking of uh, nice. topical, yeah, those are four, you know, relatively unused tracks, I would say, in some regards. And so that's hopefully also going to see them get a little bit more popularity. And so, you know, Australia's action track, hopefully plenty of people experience what it is like with, you know, six decades of competition out in the real world. Over the top of Skyline once more, they will plunge. And uh, three and a half seconds now, the margin out front. A message has come through from... Uh, a, a fellow commentator. Congratulations to Redline for the win. Bit early, but I can see where that would be coming from because we've got four seconds basically over the field here. And it would be easy in some ways to blame Cody Deep for this, wouldn't it? Because he's leading the line after all. It's hashtag his job ben to Cody. stay with the guys in front. But I'm not willing I'm not willing to start that hashtag because it's it's harsh on him, to be honest, for, for Cody Deef. They're, after all, working together, Bennett and the Bigra out front. There's no issues at all, and there's no sort of worries about being overtaken there. They're just riding around together. But Cody Deef has got the pressure of Enzo Benito right behind him, the pressure of absolutely everybody right behind him as well. There's a big train there, and above anything else, it's just difficult to stay with them. So it's, it's hard to blame Cody Deef for allowing that gap to open. Hashtag don't blame Cody Deef. Is that what we're saying? Well, I'll start that one because uh, I don't want him to get the abuse for it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? It, it? People forget that. Well, I think maybe this is also, you know, often we talk about you end up running the pace of the car in front of you. Gustavo Ariel, let's be honest, he's probably as quick as the other red line cars out front. It's just not a track where it's easy to pass. So maybe what he's thinking is let's save some fuel, let's try and grab some track position. Not sure how he's going to be comparing, though, in terms of fuel numbers to his uh, teammates out front. And maybe that's also where some of these drivers further down the field, the likes of the Benekas in the BMW MT Mouse car, maybe even the Apex Racing team, uh, Alex Dunn sitting seven seconds off the lead back in 12th spot. Maybe they're thinking in this first pit stop cycle of the race, a short fill might not be a terrible idea to just get us some track position in you and put ourselves maybe not back into the fight, but back into the mix. Yeah, get yourself a bit further through the field because as we've seen so far, overtaking is fairly difficult. It is going to come down to pit stops in some ways as well, aside from qualifying, which has already been and gone now. It's going to be about the pit stops and spending as short a time as possible in there. But you also really ideally want to make this race 11 stops too. So you can't go short filling all day and somehow ending up making 12 stops because that will undo all of your hard work throughout the course of the day um, if you are making an extra stop compared to everybody else. So... That's to be balanced here and, and to be worked out. Uh, I think that's exactly what Enzo Benito is doing, though, in, in fourth place, especially just sat behind Cody Deef. He's he, Notice he's not getting that close to the back of the Porsche and sort of pushing him along. 
but he probably is field saving to be honest. He's probably lifting off. Done it again, haven't I? Confused Gustavo Ariel and Enzo Benito. I mean, two fabulous drivers, but uh, uh, apologies, Enzo uh, and Gustavo. Enzo can't be too mad at me, though, because you and let's not forget, I have a picture of him from last year that if it ever gets released, ends his career. It doesn't actually, but, you know, that's the joke at least. <laughs> What are you blackmailing him with now? What have you? Do you not uh, remember this picture of Enzo writing something on the board? Uh, I don't, I, no, I don't think I remember. While everyone else was playing Trackmania behind us? Um, no. So I can't even send you this picture because I refuse to put it on the internet. Um, it's not that bad. It's just uh, Enzo really doesn't want it shared, which means that I can hold it over his head. Uh, windshield wipers going. Fortunately, no rain for us 30 minutes into this iRacing path. There's 12 hours pow powered by the coach, Dave Delta. Delta at the front now up to four and a bit seconds as Cody D just continues to hold now a train going back to 12th position behind him. Uh, Vince Cousy says, by the way, as well, that it's a bad idea to do a short fill. Just to clarify what I was saying is do a short fill in that you go as long as possible and i'm not saying you take half a tank of fuel out of things <laughs> but you take two laps or three laps which around a, a track like this we're talking four liters a lap or so that's not an, a, a, a that's a second and a half two seconds at least that you'd be able to save in the pit stop which for benneke you know you're saying that might not be a huge gain for him right now it would probably leap him from 17 potentially up to 12. yeah exactly it's it's not about as you say, taking half a tank of fuel, it's, uh, that's not a good idea. But in, in the same way, to sort of uh, go along with, with Vince's point, just to give the other side of things, it's, it, it depends somewhat how close we are on fuel here. If it's a real struggle to make it to 30 laps or so, or we're, and we're only doing 29 on, on a normal day, then short filling is going to be very difficult because to make up the time, uh, again, until your next pit stop, to make up the time to prevent that splash and dash is going to be very tricky. So it does somewhat depend what we get from this first in. But if these drivers are able to do 31, 32, 33 laps even, then short filling is definitely a good idea, I would agree. And this is, of course, the stint where we expect them to uh, be at their worst in terms of the fuel number. You can see those track temperatures haven't budged from where they started. Not a lick of cloud cover as well that's going to make things very very interesting as the sun continues to rise and just baking the track one thing to note this was something that i only learned yesterday that track temperature ewan is measured at the start finish line who knows what the track temperature is around the rest of the six odd kilometers well that's true uh especially in some of the corners where the the, the load on the tires is, is a little bit higher over the top and it's over the top of the mountain. We, we'll see how wearing it is on the tyres, but, I mean, the equation for those are pretty simple these days, isn't it, really? We'll be seeing uh, 12 sets of tyres used over the course uh, of each hour here today. Getting the word that it's a bit of a situation for the Mercedes where the quality <laughs> performance may be not where it uh, wants to be, but the race pace is pretty good, so maybe we'll see uh, the Apex Racing Team and some of the Williams Esports cars uh, that are further back the Fanatec car of course make a charge after we get through the mid portion of the race still 48 started 48 out there and running which I think indicates that uh, we had one car that did not take to the start uh, because of course we had 49 cars on our starting grid that's, a, that's an amazing statistic although 48 cars that are now split by 37 seconds so give it about two hours or so at this mark we are going to have to start talking about traffic at some point yeah we are uh, but that's to be expected really it's it's you know gone are the days of uh, multi-class traffic around this venue of course but we will still get it of some degree i actually can't for in the gt3 era of this race uh, 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 by the way this is of course the fourth edition i can't find a single race in which uh, we have seen somebody make it somebody not make it to the end of the first lap if you see what i mean someone has crashed on the first lap every single year since it became a gt3 only race um so this is uncharted territory unless we're going to count the non-starter as a uh, as not getting past the first lap depends who you ask just had the fastest lap being set just had alex dunn move forward to 11 had max bennett to go up to 16 spots so plenty of little action here as the sun continues to rise sight lines becoming just that little bit better for the drivers to be able to peek their way through the margin out front now grows to five seconds it was only three tenths the margin between the times between red line and the virtual coach entry last time by but 
Those three tents starting to stack up now with 16 laps complete. At this pace, we are tracking for uh, around 350 or so laps. We'll have to keep an eye on exactly how those trends play out. And again, do remember, timing.racebot.tv, timing71.org, two places to try and follow along with live timing over the course of the day. So now that we are at the point where the sun, I am going to claim, has risen and no longer are drivers really so worried about the pitch black conditions that they dealt with at the start. Do you start to settle in now a little bit, Ewan? Do you start to see drivers get a little bit more comfortable? Is that a dangerous thing here in what is still a very long race left to go? I think definitely being too comfortable around here could be a problem, but I think they've been comfortable for a little while now. We've seen this, this group settled in for much of the race so far in this uh, battle for third position. Cody Deep hasn't been challenged by Enzo Benito so much and everyone behind has just been lifting off and, and sat here waiting to the point where we've got now 10 drivers in this train right down to Phil Dinez in 12th position and so as I say I think we've been settled in here for a little while. No longer save in the GT3 cars by getting on the clutch instead it's the typical lifting coast which you heard out of the number one machine Vasilius Belitsiotis the Greek and German driver that Powers out of the left of the final corner. Luke Bennett has just punched in the fastest lap, so get the indication that the tempo starting to pick up at the front as they've saved a bit of fuel and now slowly start to just edge away even further from those behind. Another four tenths eaten into the gap by your race leaders as they just extend the margin, pull away. Who's in those red line cars though out front? If you're curious, we've got of course the red line number seven. That's I believe going to be Sam Coitert, Ole Steinbrat, and alongside Florian Labigra. And then in the number 20 machine, Luke Bennett going to be paired up alongside uh, Chris Lullum. Johnny Vecchio in there as, uh, I believe, uh, a helping hand behind the scenes. Uh, not going to be responsible for driving responsibilities on that car. So one or two-man effort, one or three-man effort. Yeah, and, and as I said earlier, three driver cars becoming... A little bit more rare in a 12-hour race, admittedly, but seemingly uh, thinking they might need it. To be fair, six hours driving over 12 is pretty intensive as we've got side-by-side side on the mountain, maybe for the first time, actually. This is a change for 20th place. Uh, that's uh, Sammy Ward getting overtaken there and, uh, and shoved out the top 20. Yeah, there is some action down the back of the order. There is plenty of business happening. And I mean, look down here. This is outside of the top 40 where Fire Simsport just in front of the Drago Hops custom mate entry of uh, Jaden Ladick, Victor Miranda behind the Delinks Esports by TK entry. And then Simar C in their distinctive yellow and black colors. I mean, there are some really strong teams that find themselves in this top split of course and because this is gt3 only uh, as opposed to daytona where we had what was it 14 gt3 cars in some ways locking out many competitive drivers from top split you and here we get to see all of them absolutely i think one of those drivers actually from memory might have been Jaden ladick and his drago racing team locked out of gt3 if i uh, remember correctly he was driving the or was it gtd isn't it in that race but anyway um he was in second split of that race a few weeks ago and so he might have missed out as a result of uh, having not very many gtds in the field so good to see him in the top split here although i've got to say i'm very surprised to see him quite so far down yeah i think it goes to show if you don't get qualifying nailed on risk this race is really a struggle uh, Vince Cousy says, by the way, he's watching this in his red line hoodie. Uh, Arjuna wishes he could do that. Yes, he does. Uh, but I've got, I, I, I'm very glad to see Mouse uh, back in our racing, or I should say in our racing for the first time, bringing back some of those drivers. Uh, because all my pleas, you and have finally, finally been answered. And I've got a, a Mouse uh, shirt on the way. And just because I couldn't let uh, Lewis uh, be equal to me in the short game here, I've got a Mouse hoodie coming too. Oh, uh, well done. Um I, I don't have any uh, sim racing merch, by the way, but I, I don't think I've wear enough from the teams. It's what it is. No, because no, I, I don't really see myself wearing it. <laughs> so uh, that's the problem. So exactly. Um, so that is a problem. But uh, but yeah, I'm I'm pleased to see them in racing as well again. By the way, uh, of course with BMW now, which is a change in the off season, and uh, so 
I wonder how much experience... I, I don't remember Max Benneker ever driving a BMW, actually, in no. GT3, although I could be wrong. You're very wrong, Ewan, because oh. he's a multi-time race winner in the BMW Sim GT Cup, so... Uh, oh, nice. Sorry, okay. to, sorry to burst your bubble, no, that's, unfortunately. That's okay. I, I, I've not seen him, though, so um, that's just uh, that's just me. But, uh, but yeah, he, he'll be uh, experienced in that case, in this car. But, as you say, good to see Miles back in our racing, uh, back with the BMW as well which uh, they'll be getting used to and driving a lot of, you'd imagine, through 2024, as opposed to the uh, Audi they were driving and, and using so much uh, last year. Absolutely. That, of course, on some other platforms. And, you know, we haven't, sorry, excuse me, seen too much of Max Benneker on iRacing as of late. And so I think part of the transition back for him has been getting used to how things work. I know I was chatting with Moritz Lohner, who did our track guide at the start. He was saying it's been a little bit unfamiliar for him. Uh, getting back to grips with everything in, in the R racing realm. Of course, he's a little less experienced than Benneke, you would argue. But, uh, yeah, all of those drivers still continuing their focus outside of the R racing universe as well it means that they're bouncing back and forth, uh, forth and trying to keep sharp, to say the very least. We are only, let's say, 20 minutes away from pit stops. Now, increasingly, separation is starting to build. Top two, six seconds away from third on back, uh, 13th. Uh, position, Yakimashevsky, he's in a bit of no man's land. Parker White, Vlad Kimichev chasing him down two and a half seconds up the road, two seconds then further back to the likes of Benneke, who's bringing James Baumey with him in the Ultra G Esports car, but running away from plenty of strong names. Williams Esports in their academy, grid and go, and then the Entropic PGZ and Ultras battle that we saw slightly earlier. These drivers, you win 20 seconds off the race lead. Yeah, and this is the problem that we keep going back to. They're just falling further and further back from the race lead. So it doesn't matter what group you're in at this stage, if you're that far back already, it's going to be a very difficult day for you to get back on terms again. But this is Bathurst. Anything can happen around here. And that is one of the great equalizers of this race. The circuit can bite anyone at any time. So while we haven't seen any incidents so far, and, and it feels remarkable to say that after 40 minutes, that is not going to continue for 12 hours. I think we're just waiting for someone to get a good run out of the Falcon. Uh, elbow and to really launch it down into the chase. Alex Dunn maybe got a poor run because look how much of a separation they've now got to uh, Felix Quornback in that Marla Racing Team entry just up the road. Denez in the BMW M Team BS competition car not going to go for the move and going to settle back into line and hope they can bridge the gap to uh, the chasing field in front. Of course, you know, I mentioned for Phil Denez, 2023 saw him flying plenty uh, to Italy to race in the Italian GT Series. Uh, Alex Dunn, of course, win, winner in the 2022 F4 British Championship GB3, runner-up in 2023. He's going to be racing in the FIA Formula 4-3 Championship this year. I mean, he's just got a bit of experience to his name. Yeah, he has. And uh, good to see him out here for... Apex as well starting their race. It does feel like Apex have got a little bit of a diminished lineup for this one in terms of the amount of cars that they've got out on the grid here today. Just the one full car and the two academy cars to go with it. But uh, that feels like a little bit light compared to what we've seen in the past from them. But I guess that uh, focuses elsewhere. Um, and don't, what, don't want to maybe have the strain of doing this race on uh, what would otherwise be a, a fairly light week in terms of at racing for them uh, before things pick back up again for the end of uh, Pesk and the final, what, four rounds of that season to go. Now, do Gustavo Ariel just hit the wall or was that, uh, excuse me, Enterman? I keep doing it uh, because it mainly uh, Gustavo Ariel was running second yesterday for so long in our Friday night preview coverage. But did Enzo Benito tag the wall or was that just a, a trick of my eye? Now, we know, I know they're pushing the limits of the track, but you and you tell me. Oh, yeah, I that mean, did look like on. a hit on the wall. Yeah, yeah, that did look... It, the trajectory certainly was changed by the, uh, the wall there, and it's worth noting or worth taking a look as well at whether his uh, alignment is still straight because he was starting to turn back to the left again, and, and so that would have clipped at an awkward angle. There is the moment. The camera actually almost perfectly uh, situated there. It would have happened just behind that camera angle there. Uh, so I don't believe there situated. would have been any major damage, though, surely. Uh, one more look at it. I, I don't know. It just stood out to me. I mean, 
maybe this is also just the joys of the internet, right? That on Enzo's end, it wasn't so bad. On our end, it's a little bit worse. And I you know the iRacing gods have smiled down on him, but that did scare me. That was Gustavo Ario, by the way, that had a peek on the Door Esports car of Damon Woods. And uh, the Team Redline 44 has stolen, by the way, the Falcon Sim Racing number. Of course, Falcon traditionally would el enter the number 44, but numbers on iRacing for the special events, if you're curious, uh, teams have the option to go and set a number if a couple of different teams all choose the same number then the highest i rating wins and so team redline courtesy of or partially i guess gustavo ariel's 11,000 i rating come out on top in that one yeah that is a remarkable amount of i rating from him uh, to have he really needs to do something else um to be honest but uh, but there we are he's uh, do we call him mr 11k was he the first one to get there this doesn't quite have the same ring to it though does it um, of, uh, of what we had in the past so uh, so there we are but it's it's an advantage and I do ask the question sometimes well why do these guys actually care about our rating doesn't actually matter for uh, but it actually does you do need to qualify for these uh, events and that's how it's done so you've got to have good our rating and that means sometimes on the run up to these special events there's some very uh, long and pretty uh, tedious weeks trying to gain our rating for these drivers. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to uh, World Championships and some of those things as well, qualifying series pay out points based on strength of fields, which is determined, of course, by the I rating of the drivers in that race. And so more I rating, more points. It's as simple as that. More chance of being able to fight at the top level. 45 minutes now or so have been complete in this race. The I racing battles 12 hours powered by the coach Dave Delta. It's Arjuna Kankipati alongside of you and O'Leary. In about an hour or so's time, Lewis McLeod will come and join us. And then we'll have uh, the likes of Cam Roger, Peter Mackay, and David Haynes to get us through to the end as well in what should be uninterrupted coverage as the sun comes up, as the track continues to boil, as Enzo Benito looks to the inside of the final corner, doesn't commit to it, slots back into line seen that so many times over the course of the day and, and you just wonder whether he's just using that to get into the head of Cody D for a little bit here slow him down even further which is allowing his teammates to break oh. out now to a seven and a half second lead it looks like we may see our first incident of the day yeah that looked like body parts flying couldn't quite pick it out big send from Lassie Urinen on the Apex Racing Academy car see if we can turn our attentions back over to what happened down through the chase and there's a car in pit lane as well, I noticed. So what's gone on down here? It's one of the BS competition cars down the inside. It's that awkward bit of Bathurst contact at the chase. And he's clipped by one of the Mercedes who goes past. Couldn't identify the car at the time, but there's rear suspension damage on that BMW. I believe it was an Apex Racing Academy car. And so as you watch another look at it, indeed it was, you can see the green and greyish front end. BS plus Turner slides through. And I guess then Ruben Bonga would have brought his car down to pit lane. Does he jink drivers left? Yes, he does. And just watch this as well. Pit entry is a sequence of corners. The commitment line for pit limiter very deep through the sequence. And so one thing we'll keep an eye on uh, is, is uh, let's say, pit, a commitment on pit entry going to be important over the course of the day. Back over, though, to your leaders. With about 50 minutes nearing now completing this race. Iglesias very close to the back of Benito, who's dropped slightly back from Cody D out of the run out of Forest Elba. Yeah, but nothing more than is uh, unusual for Enzo Benito. He does not often really get right up the rear end of that car on the way out of uh, on the way out of Forest Elbow, and so they're all spaced out quite nicely on the way down the hill here, down on, late on the brakes. And single file again. This has been the story of the day so far for these drivers, really. Just single file running in line and helping one another. But first, uh, for, the, or for the first time, a bit further back, there are some overtakes happening. I think that was Parker White as he stands on the brakes. You can see him actually moving the rig. And the e NASCAR Coca Cola iRacing Series driver always uh, doing a decent job of making sure the uh, sponsors are represented. Don't worry, that's not Jakob Maciejewski. That is Parker White. He's got the Coca-Cola hat behind him, Coca-Cola shirt on. The one thing he's also done a decent job of, just keep in mind, front end of his Mercedes still attached to that car. Look, two cars back in queue, Ewan. Not so good. Uh, and I'm not surprised based on... Uh, there, there you go. Not surprised based on the hit that we just see. Um, 
Now that's a Drago racing car missing yeah. the front end. Not so, the same car, just to be clear. Yeah, so that's so there's been two bits of uh, contact going on here with Mercedes, and so Drago Racing have lost their front end. What about that Apex Academy car? Has that still lost its front end, or was that from the rear of the BMW that we saw going cartwheeling across the road? That's a good question. Not entirely sure, to be completely frank with you, but it's one of those races where so much going on. Matty Siepler just gets past uh, Jersey Glatt in the Williams Esports Academy car. That's uh, running up down the cutting as they build their way uh, to the top of the mountain. Mentioned it as well at the start. Last time we had a, uh, a GT3 only race was the... Uh, sorry, I've just been distracted by the fact that whoever, whoever took the wrap for the Sontek delivery uh, didn't do a great job of applying it to the car. <laughs> I can't quite see. Oh come what on, you would look. Uh, uh, okay, let me. There's another Sontek car that looks correct. Let me see if I can get a side-by-side -side look uh, to show you exactly what's wrong. Well, maybe maybe I do see what you mean now, but uh, but it's not same car. One sec, I, I've clicked the wrong button. Okay, I think I see what you mean. Oh, they but, both uh, got the same issues. I th is it that sticker that's slightly wonky? Is is that the problem? Uh, th no, no, no. That is the least of the issues. Uh, it's just okay. a semblance of the issues. Um, oh. I'm pretty sure what's happened is they've uploaded that paint as a different car. So maybe it thinks it's a yeah. BMW, and so they've tried to wrap it as a BMW, even though it's a Lamborghini. Uh, Vince Cousy's noticed, noticed, I've just noticed it as well, by the way. Max Verstappen not racing, it's connected to the session to watch what's going on. He is uh, very committed to uh, to watching, even if when he's not racing. I remember if things before Miami last season, wasn't it? Or maybe the one before we, we did BMW together, and he connected to that race to have a look at what uh, Redline were doing. Even despite the fact it would have been about 7 a.m. over in Miami at the time, maybe a bit later than that, but it was early race day morning, and he was watching his teammates in uh, BMW M Cup, I think it was called back then, or whichever one it was, whichever iteration of that championship it was in that season close to the wall and officially announced by the way that uh, the bmw m is it power tour uh, joining the iRacing official series for this year i'm going to go back and make sure that i got the name correct just because uh, it's going to bother me if i if i don't uh, but it's basically going to introduce a bunch of classic uh, bmws alongside the modern cars the m4 gt3 the, uh, the m hybrid v8 uh, to make it all available for 12 weeks of competition next season, rotating band of tracks, rotating bands of cars, races from Tuesday to Thursday, so fixed time slots where you know you'll be able to find some racing. And I know this will make you happy, Ewan, the return of the BMW Z4. I have never been happier than when I read that. It was absolutely amazing to see the, the Z4 um, back on the schedule again uh, for everyone to enjoy. It will be uh, in Okiyama at the end of... Uh, March and at the end of April at Oschersleben as well. So a couple of weeks of the Z4 and I'm so glad about that. Yeah, I mean, I still remember driving that car here at Bathurst uh, a long, long time ago. Man, we haven't, we, can you believe we have a new Z4 road car as look at some moves being made further back because that Williams Esports chill boss uh, trying to really put the pressure onto the Marla racing team. Uh, Felix Quirmbach, of course, starting that car off, and now chaos behind. Which way does Alex Dunn go? Which way does Belitsiotis wants to go? Quirmbach covers the inside on the run-up, in towards Griffin's bend. Turn two, not the place to be on the outside, and look at Dunn just in the marbles and washing up on He does, and he won't be making up any places that way. Jordanes gets very close to him as well, off the end of that corner but no moves made by him. He clearly wants to stay in line. So I think we're getting to that stage in the stint now where everybody's saved the laps that they sort of can, really, and they've realised that, well, I'm not going to save another lap with just 10 minutes remaining. That's going to be too difficult uh, in terms of saving. So we might as well jockey for track position now because we're all going to be going into the pit lane in line, basically, here. Whether it's on the same lap or not, we're yet to find out, of course, but it will be almost coming into the pit lane together so track position is going to be quite important on the way in there as well. And so, especially down the back of the field, or down the back of this group, I should say, they're wanting to move forward a little bit just for some free time on the way into the pit stops. And who's going to be the most aggressive in terms of going long on fuel? 
Remember, in long trains like this, it's possible to say plenty. How aggressive have some of these drivers been in uh, their usage of fuel saving? Interesting to note, a couple of drivers have come in for early splash and dashes. I say splash and dashes because seemingly fuel only for Falcon Sim Racing number three and the ATRS machine, uh, the number 13. So they've come in a little bit before the top of the hour, not uh, taking tires, uh, full tires, I should say, not taking full fuel. Uh, because one thing that you can do in this race, let's not forget, you can do fuel and tires at the same time, although not if you're not doing the full service, I would guess. So, sun continues to rise. Curious to see what the weather conditions are at now. Still haven't budged an inch. Yeah, still not getting any hotter, but it is before 7 a.m. That does surprise me in some ways because the sun is out now and very much rising. So it just makes me wonder, what temperatures are we going to get to here? Is it going to be a, a relatively cool afternoon? The clear skies, I think, don't necessarily lend themselves to that. But the fact that it hasn't come up too much. Yes, I, I guess we're still waiting for the sun to really come up beyond the horizon. You can see now uh, that uh, glorious look at the rundown. What is, let's not forget, public roads. Can you imagine you having the chance to drive up and down the mountain every day? Can imagine it's probably not the most, uh, let's say, efficient if you want to go pick up some groceries. No, going from A to B, it's, it, it, it would probably get old if you live there, wouldn't it? Um, pretty quickly, if you're just trying to get about your day-to-day -day life. Just straighten this out, will you? For goodness sake, it's a bit, uh, <laughs> bit frustrating. But, uh, but straighten it out. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh. I know. Can, yeah. Can you imagine the motorsport world, especially in Australia? What would happen? Even now, even worldwide, what would I happen mean, if they just uh, straightened over this circuit? Let's just be clear here, you and you want to repave Sebring. You want to straighten out Mount Panorama. <laughs> what else don't you want to ruin in the world of motorsports? Uh, take the walls from Monaco or something? I don't know. Um, can what we else? Just get what rid else? of Monaco, though. What else could I ruin? Um, I don't know. Put some more corners at Le Mans? I don't know. Um, it's, uh, I, Do you know I, there I, are 33 turns at Le Mans, apparently? I'm trying to, yeah, put some more in. Put another 33 in. Yeah. It's too fast. Let's get, get up to Norschleife in that level. Is that what you want? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. It's nine seconds at the front now between first and third positions. I mean, you know, at this level, we often talk about there being tens and hundreds between the drivers. We're 27 laps now complete in this race, and the two red line machines at the front, Bennett and Labigra, have been metronomic in the way that they have navigated through the darkness into the sunrise and into this race lead. And uh, it was Lewis McLean. I'll just re re reveal who sent that message a little bit ago, saying that congratulations to Redline on the win. Uh, can we count that as a prediction, Ewan? No, because it had already happened by then. They, they, they were already a few seconds in the lead, so I'm not going to take that uh, as a prediction, unfortunately. Can we count it as a commentator's curse if they don't win? Well, you can debate that with him in an hour and a bit, because, <laughs> because I'm not going into uh, commentator's curse land. Um, they exist. Come on. I know you believe in them. Uh, do, do I? No, do I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, know that Lewis doesn't, so... Yeah, well, yeah, it, he's, it, and he's very clear about that, too. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, you could do, but uh, it would be very much a hindsight thing, wouldn't it, um, if, you're, uh, if you're going back and looking at that. But, yeah, I mean, they're in such a strong position, and that's been clear from the very start, almost, in this race. They got away very early on, and they haven't looked back since, and it makes you wonder, really, what... What can anyone else do about this? It, it, I mean, and I can't remember the last time a, a special event like this was sort of quote unquote, you know, won in, in some way. If we look back and they have won, will, it, will we look back at even the first hour of this race, first half an hour? Uh, again, I just, I'm, I'm still in disbelief that we got through the first laps cleanly. Uh, not words that I thought I'd ever say on a broadcast at Bathurst. I, and that's not just in the iRacing Bathurst 12 hours to be clear. That's in any race at Bathurst with any combination of cars. Just because of how treacherous it can be, and especially up into the cutting, the way the, the double left uh, hander builds up, it, it often invites sends into the second part of it. And so uh, cold tires, chaos can be uh, more frequent than maybe some would like, but it's a great track once you really dive into it. Red line just punching the fastest lap of the race, though. It's a 2.02.683. What's it going to be for Cody Deeth this time at the line? He's been unable to break into the 202s and still, un still unable to. It's another 203-1, almost half a second gained on that lap alone. And there's plenty of drivers behind who are able 
to go below the 203s as well. Damon Woods has managed it, although not on that lap. Felix Kronbach just managed to set his personal best on that last lap. That was a, a 2.8 from him. Uh, we've seen Otis into the 202s. Alex Dunn had the fastest lap for a short period of time. Luke Bennett and... Uh, uh, has since gone quicker. Florian Labigra has since gone 4,000 slower in the race. F Phil Dinez even at the very back of the field has done a 2.8 as well. And so I think after this phase of pit stops, we could see this second group sort of explode here because Cody D very much seems to be the cork in the bottle. Not a bad picture there for Alex Dunn celebrating after jumping out of the car. Look how close to the wall they get. I mean, what one thing that I was just thinking about, I did some laps last night uh, in an AI race with the night start just to get an, a, a sense for what it was like for the drivers to remind myself the last race start i did at bathurst for 12 hours was it 20 it was 2019 probably so a long time ago at this point and i just remember if you don't have a good sense whether you've got a single screen an ultra wide or triple screens uh, no matter what setup you have you don't have a good sense for where either side of your car is you're in for a very difficult and uncomfortable experience at this track and it's why you see these drivers you enable to get pixels not inches pixels away from the wall yeah they get so close and we, and we saw a great example of, of that on board with alex dunn just there through the cutting he was so close to the left hand side just clipping the wall but once again able to avoid it and, and they get so close every single lap they almost scrape along the walls as we've got pit stops out front luke bennett comes in after only 29 laps one short of where he'd really want to be Cody Deep comes in with him, so I think that's a bit of an indication that front of the trains, not able to save as much fuel, and in Cody Deep's case as well, slightly compromised in terms of pace. Belitiotis is going to bring in the Williams Esports Tool Blast car. Matejewski brings Drago Racing in, and no surprise, I think, to many to hear that after qualifying didn't go the way of Max Benneker and Maus, they roll down to pit lane at the effectively first time of asking. Now, technically, up on the jacks, no surprise there. I am going to say this is making the top of the hour. And why do I say that? Because you and they're going to leave pit lane after the hour has crossed, and therefore, effectively, the next stint has only begun after the top of the hour. Yeah, but think about what happens at the end of the race. If there's 30 True. seconds still on the clock, you've got to do another lap. So I don't count it purely because of that. But I'm not worried about it because I think you can afford to do a 29-lap stint in this race, can't you? Maybe two, and still get away with it if you do 30s for the rest of the race. So as long as Bennett can get that number up a little bit more after this one, and he can start to do 30 lap stints more consistently, then he'll be okay. But if you're doing 29 lap stints all day, I don't think he'll make it on 11 stops. There were tires taken, there was some damage beaten out, by the way, of the pan uh, body panels on the Lamborghini for Luke Bennett, just to give you some confirmation. Has been some drama that had literally just seen Sontek Racing uh, and Leandro Andaruti in the Team PGZ car return to pit lane. So as the pit stop sequence kicks off, chaos kicks off as well. and as we wait to see if uh, uh, Florian Labigra is going to come in this time by. Let's go ahead, take a look at the replay, and this is looking just out of turn two. Around goes the Mercedes, and three into one. Well, Leander Andaruti there had the chance to step on the brakes there and, and sort of alleviate that problem, but if we go up all with him here, look at the way he sort of sniffs out this left-hand side and think there's a gap here, but they're clearly... Look, he goes down this gap here, but... That was never going to be open, unfortunately. He would have been much better there to stand on the brakes and, and just wait for that incident to unfold in front of him before going again. Unfortunately, he tried to get down that impossible gap and ended up getting involved in the accident when he really didn't need to. Your eyes don't deceive you. One car stays out. That's Gustavo Ariel in the number 44. Team Redline machine. Look at the rest of the cars filtering their way on in. Up on the jacks they go. Fuel and tires again done at the same time. Seemingly one other driver. Is that going one lap long? Not based on the timing screen. That might have been a driver involved in some of the chaos. So I'm going to assume that was Ruben Bonga. Now where's Luke Bennett in the mix, you're wondering? Still coming around out of the final couple of corners uh, in his Team Redline machine. Engine fires for Labigra. It was a 41.9 second stop for Bennett after things were considered. So expecting a similar time here. Good short stop though from Enzo Benito. Track position clearly important for him. He will leapfrog to the front of the running order with a 30 second pit stop. It's red line net one, two and three. Three cars still yet to box. 
Well, that is a surprise in some ways. Enzo Benito going for a remarkably short stop by the looks of things here. We've got three still to come in, by the way, so these guys will be four, fifth, and sixth now. But Enzo Benito saves 10 seconds in the box there. Surely that means he can only do 45 minutes or so in this team. Surely this is also going to mean, though, he'll filter in behind at some point, Labigra and Bennett, and just save a bit of fuel. Uh, try and extend the mileage of this stint. Iglesias, was that a bit of damage on the right front? Yes, it was. So that hasn't been fixed through the damage, se the uh, pit stop sequence. And Felix Kornbach staying in the Marla Racing Team car now behind him and trying to put on some of that pressure. It does seem as though, by the way, one driver change was made inside of the top 10. Nico Rubelar taking over for Cody Deep. And so we'll see now if Deep uh, had a little less speed than Nico Rubelar. All you can say, though, at the end of the day about the stint from Cody Deeth is he kept the car in one piece, he kept it in the podium spots. Uh, I'll add another driver change to your list, by the way. Uh, I know you're talking about the top 10, but Luca Keita is in the Apex Racing Team car now in place of Alex Dunn as well. So uh, not sure why they pulled Dunn out of the car actually so early, because he was driving very well, but clearly he's being rested for later. I, I feel as well, this is a drive, we talked about it yesterday in our Friday Night Preview, you want to do... Uh, in my opinion, two stints as a driver at a track like this. Once you get into the rhythm, you don't want to be pulled out of it. And two stints a minimum, especially in the two driver lineups, I think it gives you a good balance where you can jump into the car, jump out for a brief moment, get a, a breather. And because you're never really wanting to, to, to look your eyes away from the race anyway, bit of a natural reaction. Now, does Gustavo Ariel do a bit of a short fill as well to try and gain some track position of his own? Yes, he will. It's another 30.2 second stop. Is this going to mean red line one, two, three, four? We'll find out on the merge from pit lane. Benito and Ariel side by side, and red line grab the picture. One, two, three, and four. Well, what a remarkable show of dominance from Team Redline. We did see and, and hear from them at the start of the race that. Uh, they posted on social media actually that they wanted to take control of the front of the race and dominate from the front and if this is not called domination then I don't know what is four teams right at the front mobbing the front of this field I mean it's been a very long time since we've seen something like this in a special event this is remarkable this is crazy and uh this is a statement like, without a shadow of a doubt we'll, we'll talk to you about the sequence of pit stops in a few moments time once we get the cycle well and truly rung out once the drivers settle back into the rhythm but uh, seemingly not many other drivers doing different things in terms of strategy it was only Altus that I can see in the top 20 that also did this slight short fill strategy must say I'm slightly surprised that BMW MT Mouse and uh, Max Benneker electing not to try and do something slightly different this though again one two three and four remarkable margin back to nico rubelar still holds relatively strong as well i mean from this point forward the question is which red line car not which team which red line car yeah and it's no surprise that it had to be red line isn't it the most successful team around this circuit uh, well in this event i should say really more specifically the bathurst 12 hour has been theirs it previously in years gone past apex racing team are the reigning champions of course but redline historically have made this race their own but none more so quite than they are doing right now remarkable start to this race the lamborghini clearly enjoying the early hours here with the low temperatures they're able to really get the best out of that car but there are some still some unsolved problems for Enzo Benito and Gustavo Ariel's car in, in particular how are they going to save that fuel they've got to all work together to try and get those guys back to an 11 stop strategy uh, maybe they've already realized they're not going to and so from this point they've compromised and they'll fight their way forward we'll keep an eye on it of course long way to go in terms of the mileage and so hard to really say what's going on a couple more drivers of course uh, graciously giving us a look behind the scenes uh, this is a look inside of the cockpit of Kalen Chin in the uh, Team PGZ entry all the way down in 39 spot Sabolt Apex Racing Academy and Jaden Ladick in the Drago Hops custom car directly in front and uh, as all great sim racers do there's weird things going on with the mouth <laughs> yes uh, absolutely uh, and by the way Chin on uh, on a uh, well, it looks a bit darker, doesn't it? It'll be evening for him at the moment, as far as 
I'm aware, so he will be racing into the night as far as he's concerned, whereas everybody else is sort of uh, racing into the day in the sim and then into the night a little bit later on. It's going to be night time a lot earlier for him, uh, you would imagine, over the course of the day. He'll be uh, sharing with a couple of drivers, actually, from what I've learned on social media and PGZ anyway. Uh, they'll be the only team that PGZ are running with three drivers uh, racing in one car. Yeah, we're going to see uh, Jorge Garcia and... Uh, who was the third driver? Can't uh, quite remember. Uh, Oyola. Oyola, there you go. So another one of the, the three driver pairings. Maybe it'll be interesting to talk to some of the drivers uh, who can always come and join us for a quick chat in the broadcast booth about two versus three drivers, how that impacts things. Now that's Mads Johansson, who's got a very beaten up rear end on the Apex Racing Academy car. So I think it's fair to make the inference it was probably the machine that got mixed up with uh, Ruben Bonga's little bit of drama. That's the 98 car. The next Apex Racing Academy car slightly up the road, the number 97. Like you mentioned, you and slightly uh, reduce output and, and uh, size of effort from the team as compared to Daytona, where so many of their drivers were in person at the Corby Center. Uh, this machine shared by uh, Alex Gall, Mini Guy, Guillaume Levesque, who did the first into the race, and I believe they have a third driver as well going off of social media. But uh, interesting to note that, you know, Apex Racing Academy program continuing to bring on some really strong new talent. And, and that's what we're hopefully going to see from, from that team very shortly too. I, I, I've noticed that quite a lot of uh, academy car teams actually have been signing drivers recently. Uh, it, do, it does make you wonder though, so many drivers are going to be under team banners in the next few years and it, and it could be a problem for sim racing to solve in the next few years with just a few too many drivers maybe being signed under uh, these big teams who have now collect, collected a lot of drivers, especially with some teams having academy teams. They're not quite the same. And, uh, Apex have got uh, other teams that are not quite called Apex, but they're sort of under the Apex banner as well. It's, it's, there's a lot of drivers suddenly becoming under the same banner here and with the uh, demise of Urano, unfortunately, as well. That's another top team who have been sort of taken in by lots of these teams, lots of drivers getting taken in by the same teams as well. So it might be a problem for sim racing to solve in the coming years. See how it goes. Dory Sports tucked up behind uh, Luca Quito, who's gone and passed in his Mercedes. Mentioned, of course, that the qualifying pace for uh, the Mercedes AMG may be not where it wanted it to be compared to its race pace and should expect to potentially see it just charge on forward. On board with Daniel Pastor, we ride uh, in the Williams Esports Ben Q car. Always great that Williams, let's not forget, make it nice and easy to pick out which car is which in their ranks. Of course, one's got the purple front end. Different sponsor on the hood as well. Can't get much uh, more different than that. I did what I'm bringing this up for a reason, Ewan, uh, as you can tell, because we've switched over to the team Redline card. Is there anything different about these Redline liveries? Not to my eye. Uh, even the wing mirrors that everyone likes to point out are, are different, which, you know, barely counts as a difference, really, um, is, uh, is not different. Oh, maybe there's a different shade there. Or is that just the lighting that we got off of, Mountain, uh, off of uh, Hell Corner? Maybe it was. Um, they oh, they seem... look identical. Yeah, they do. Oh, so somewhere someone's getting the message that Racebot's complaining about your liveries again. But at least, guys, no. it's not about your number boards being in the wrong place. Uh, it's only that you're making our life difficult as commentators. That's all we're complaining that, about. Th there's definitely a different shade to the main body for those two front two. There's, there's a slightly lighter blue at the front of the car, and there's a black for the 44 car. I mean, it's very minute, but you can see it, especially Ooh, when you look right. from behind them. Now compare the seven and the twenty. Can you see? Now they're a little bit more separated because, of course, uh, their pit stop sequence saw them actually uh, grow a little bit and swap around in terms of ordering, uh, just with the fuel save that saw Lebigre go one lap longer. So it's a little bit harder to tell. I mean, those two look pretty identical to me. Yeah, I, I, and I think they look like the forty-four car, which is sort of uh, black all over. Well, well, other than the red bits. But the Benito car, for whatever reason, they've gone with a slightly lighter blue, and I don't know why. <laughs> so it sounds like... Okay, I'm... Hmm. Now... 
Enzo, uh, uh, I'm, I have, I'm hazarding a, a guess as to what this is. Notice how the light, uh, we, we are into livery watch and it's only an hour and 10 minutes in. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen around the world. Uh, but this livery, the, the light doesn't gleam off it in such a way as it does on the number 70. I'm making a bold claim, Enzo Benito, or whoever submitted the paint scheme for your number 70 machine, forgot to include the spec map. You think it's a mistake, not an intentional I think uh, it difference? Was, I think it was just a slight mistake. Okay. Well, but, but the thing that would make me doubt that is the fact I've seen that shade of blue on red line cars Have before. Have you? Y yeah. Or red line associated cars, let's say. Yeah, okay. That is, that is a key word as well, because <laughs> I've got to say, it is so confusing in the Porsche Esports Supercut where we've got yeah. Stappen.com racing. Oracle Red Bull Sim Racing, <laughs> and we've got Team Redline, all who basically have identical liveries, to be completely honest, uh, at least when it comes from the perspective from which commentators usually see them. Uh, and so it is quite difficult. Let's focus on the racing and not the liveries for a second, because gap between Benito and this gaggle, uh, which is effectively fifth on back, Nico Rubilar in front of Tristan Iglesias, starting to grow. It's up to around 13 seconds or so. I think that's to be expected, Ewan, of course, because the top two, slightly less fuel. What you maybe were curious to see was the gap between the red line number seven and this chasing pack over the last couple of minutes. That's also been starting to grow. It's up to 7.2 seconds. Yeah, and, and the real problem is that these drivers who were stuck behind Cody Deef in the first part of the race have found themselves stuck behind Nicholas Rubelar now. And it seems that Rubelar hasn't actually got that much pace in comparison to Deeth and, and those around him as well. He was he did 2 minutes 3.7 on that last lap, which is a lot slower than those around him. In fact, you've got to go down to 14th place for a driver who was slower than Nicholas Rubelar on that last lap. So that is a real problem for everybody else behind. But do they have the desires to go through here with so much fuel saving opportunity now sat behind him? You know what's great about the sim racing world is sometimes you get messages uh, from people. I've just gotten one about the livery. We'll get back to that because there's finally a move. Iglesias makes it happen. But as Rubelar tries to fight back, there's contact, more contact after the virtual coach machine got turned 90 degrees on the nose of the Simufi car. There was already damage to the right front. There's a bit more damage now, but this is going to surely mean a chance to try and break away, a chance to try and run away but there's not even a look of expression on the face of Tristan Iglesias. Yeah, so there's a chance here to maybe get uh, get away, as you say, but the, we'll get some answers now in terms of, is it the grid and go-kart that's a little bit slower than the rest and behind, or is it the fact that they've been leading them around and now Tristan Iglesias is going to receive the same fate? That's going to be the big problem. And already Iglesias is defending. And look at that. That's very interesting. Rubelar flashes the lights. Normally that's a sign of anger, but I think on this occasion that's a sign of get in line. I'm not overtaking you. Please drive quicker in front of me. I think it wasn't a great run out of turn one, and I wonder if the right front damage is slowing that Porsche in a straight line. Um, I'm also not sure. I tried driving the Porsche a little bit last night. These drivers are doing what? 204s now? 203s or so, 2025s at the end of the first stint. Uh, I was doing 207s in the Porsche just because I could not get to grips with the way the rear uh, and the weight transfer, especially down the mountain. It was terrifying to me. Up the mountain, I could get to grips with it pretty quickly. Uh, down the mountain, it was just very, very difficult. And so I wonder if some teams have had to strip out some downforce to try and be fast in a straight line. I wonder what that's doing to them through some of the twistiest stuff. And let's not forget that, oh, wait, track temperature, Ewan still hasn't budged an inch. No, uh, and that's not helping everybody else either. The Lamborghini will start to crumble a little bit more if those temperatures do uh, get higher, but only if they really do increase from there. It's now 10 past seven in the morning. It's still no warmer than what we saw earlier on in the darkness, which is uh, somewhat remarkable. You, you've got to think, for, for some of these teams who are hoping for higher temperatures, you've got to think that these clear skies and, and the sunlight is going to start to kick in soon and start warming the track up somewhere. Max Benneker passes Drago Racing and uh, Vlad Kimicev for 16th spot. So Benneker's trying to slowly carve his way forward. I think the best that Maus are realistically going to be hoping for here is a top five. And that might be realistic if 
top four are gone, and it's fifth on back that we're thinking of. Simufi last time by did do a 203 614. It was only two tenths lower than Team Redline. So let's keep an eye on the time this time around, given that not having to go defensive out into turn two, better run out of the opening corner, maybe a little bit more to think about. Uh, as I was mentioning, though, I, I thought it was a spec map issue, and apparently. Arjuna apparently sometimes knows what he's talking about, Ewan, because indeed, I've got a, a message from a livery designer that says, apparently it is a spec map issue. So, so they did intend to make it as hard as possible for us. Yes. Oh, no, they did. It, not that that is providing any distinction at the moment, by the way, this dark blue that they've got going on, as opposed to the black, it's really making no difference at all. But... Uh, but, but anyway, thanks for that red line. I do notice, by the way, that these, these cars that have a colour after them have sort of gone out of fashion recently, especially in Team Redline, because when they won this race two years in a row, they were called orange both times. Now, I'm sure they didn't have a single piece of orange on their car anywhere, which is very nice of them, <laughs> but um, that's what they were called in the game. I think it's a legacy, right, of when we used to actually get the te different Team Redline coloured cars, which, by the way, guys, bring them back. I mean, uh, I, I, there's no other way to say it. Makes our life easier. Looks really cool as well. I still remember uh, when, of course, Max would come and race with us. He'd be in the Team Redline orange car, which wouldn't have the darker base. It would have the white base with, you know, orange highlights and still the red distinctive line down the center of the car. And so, uh, you know, uh, I this, of course, is, a, is an ode to the branding of Verstappen.com and, and the Red Bull partnership. So uh, totally understand that. But if you can find a way to sneak the highlights in there, We'll love it. We, 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 we will only love it more. I guess that's a better way to say it. Uh, let's check in, by the way, further down through the field. Uh, previous race winners. Not sure what's happened to the BMW MT mouse car. Uh, Moritz Lohner now behind the wheel because I think they had to make an extra trip down to pit lane and they run the last car on the lead lap. But I did say that they call themselves the stream team. They're here just for some fun. They are, and uh, I'm sure that they'll be... People enjoying their streams, hopefully, here today. And uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, Moritz certainly having to get used to iRacing all over again. I don't remember the last time Yuri Kazdorp drove on iRacing either, although it may have been more recently than I quite realise. Um, so maybe they're a little bit out of practice in that respect, but for whatever reason, they have been in twice. And their 16-second stop last time around maybe suggests something about what happened to them. Yeah. Now, I'm seeing it as a second trip down pit lane on consecutive laps on my timing so maybe there was a, a lack of fuel in the car uh, i know moritz would be very very happy if we did mention by the way that uh, he's very very proud i'll break out my yellow pencil just because i can uh new helmet for 2024 looks lovely uh, uh, yeah i can't see it very well but I can't, honest, I can't remember his last one either so that's good but um but there we are and he's got pink gloves i'm, I'm enjoying the pink gloves a bit more to be honest with you good shout actually I, that is probably just the iRacing default though to be completely <laughs> honest uh, well I, they're, they're not they're nice gloves I, 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 I need to um, assign them to my driver to be honest they, they will give you a couple of tenths of a second that's the way <laughs> that's the way that it will work uh, Steen Ledger says that uh, I can thank Grid and Go for having very different looking liveries now let's put that to the case uh, put that uh, test uh, put that case to the test boy you can tell that I had to wake up early for this one, can't you? So that's the virtual coach dot GG by GNG, which say that one five times fast. It is a mouthful. Uh, do we have any of the other grid and go cars up inside yeah. of the top 20? I'm not sure. Here's the next one that I can see on the timing screen at first glance. They forgot to submit a livery in that case. Do you think? I mean, that's got no sponsors on it. So I promise you that's uh, un unless they intended to go sponsorless on the 002. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe. I, I thought initially they'd gone reverse, so gone for the black where the yellow is and the, the yellow where the black is on the other car, but uh, that's not quite right either, is it? Um, so, well, at least it's different. That's something. It's different. Uh, you, and you're not wrong that maybe that's the difference that Steen was alluding to. Um, we just don't get to see it, unfortunately. It's a shame. Um, the, yeah, it is, it is, to be honest. But, uh, but, but I'm, I appreciate the effort. Um, it, it's very difficult, isn't it, to sort of build, uh, build a, a recognisable image, if you like, as, as a team, while trying to keep the same livery across the board in that respect, but also try and make it different in some way, because it's difficult to tell them apart, but it, 
also you don't want people confused as to you know you want people to know absolutely that that is a so-and-so car when you look at it rather than having loads of different colors and all sorts going on which makes Ooh. easier to distinguish between people but but not so easy to recognize them in a pack well gabriel strike matter is correct we, we have some technical issues on one of our computers that's uh, giving us the looks and well the grid and go car does indeed have a livery. It is indeed inverted in colors. It's now unfortunately hit its right side into the wall, and I hope it's not dinged up as a result of that. No, but uh, but I, we appreciate the effort for that there because that's uh, that's a good effort from them. Although, uh, as I say, it's it's difficult to build a a recognizable grid and go car when you always have two out there that look totally different. You know, it's it's a very uh, double edged double edged equation. Uh, I think the the answer to all our solutions. Uh, answer to all our questions uh, is let's just make our paint schemes every different hex color coat imaginable. Yeah, but some of the colors are not that different from one another. Right, no, no, but so that's where you start, right, with the, the obviously different colors, and then you slowly start to introduce the ones which are, let's say, not so obvious and easy to identify. Oh, it's easy to pick up a Falcon Sim Racing car in the grass, unfortunately. Yeah, Nicholas Laubitz driving for Falcon these days, having gone for a spin at the chase. Now, is this a similar situation to the uh, Ruben Bonga BMW earlier in that he was trying to make a move down the inside and it went wrong because his car was positioned very similarly to that car that lost four laps earlier on? Well, we'll or three, it. even. We'll try and get our replay machine sorted with the correct paints as well. So get that up on screen. Matty Siepler got off track as well as a result in the Sontek racing car. Back up front, Sun continuing, uh, continuing to rise. See, by the way, there's, we'll try and get a camera shot of it at some point. There's that bollard. There's a, with the man just pointing at the Fujitsu logo. Um, one of the great racing billboards of all time. I I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself and say I'm not sure which one you Do mean. Do not know which one I mean? <laughs> oh, we'll have to go find it, but only after I think you and we take a look at the replay. Okay, uh, I'll see if I can embarrass myself further with this one. Uh, down the inside, it looks like very similar to Ruben Bonger, actually. That is almost a replay, actually, only without the contact afterwards, thanks to that Lamborghini that had to take a trip across the grass. Yeah, good on Cipola in the Sontec racing car for avoiding all of the chaos and with a bit more success than was the Apex Racing Academy car, wasn't it, that lost its, uh, some of its bodywork trying to avoid the, the stricken machine of Ruben Bonga in front. Into the chase for what is the 41st time uh, in this affair. Still on for about 350 laps of racing in a 12-hour clean sprint. There's no safety cars to come and interrupt us to uh, slow down the tempo of the race. It is a straight sprint from the drop of the green to the flying of the checkered. We jump on board with Phil Dinez, who rides in eighth position. Luca Kita has closed back up in the Apex Racing Academy, uh, Apex Racing Team car has brought Door Esports and both of the Williams Esports machines with him as well. Now let's give a bit of a shout out to Carlos Fenelosa in that Altus Esports machine. Mentioned that he was one of the ones that did the short fill. He's up to 13th as a result. Yeah, and, uh, and Altus really needed that because uh, they were out of sorts at the start of this race in terms of their positions for, for both of their cars. And so they are uh, now a little bit further up the field, thankfully. Uh, with Carlos Faniosa, or with, with their singular car, I should say. They've only got one in this race, but they're now 13th. And they're very near to that group that is from fifth place on backwards. And in, in some ways, it feels kind of sad to say this for even a team like Altus, but they couldn't really hope for fifth position here. And if, that, if they get on terms with this big group up in front that uh, we're very much in the mix with at the moment with Phoenix Quirnbeck. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Altus never really have had the most success, I feel, at this event either what you'd class, uh, classify as their home race of course they've had plenty of success in some of the other special events so it's not like it's for a lack of uh, success across the board so at one point or another you think it would all come together uh, and they'd be able to make a good crack of it of course not with many entries here today i think the likes of jordan caruso uh, and plenty of others grabbing a, a well-earned rest after what has been three back-to-back -back weeks in the porsche esports super cup uh, to kick the season off margin though between simufi and redline and now that of course tristan iglesias has taken on the 
uh, responsibility for trying to close the margin. Well, it hasn't closed. It's up to 10 seconds now uh, between the third and fifth position. We're not even talking here about the gap up to your race leaders with Enzo Benito, Gustavo Ariel. We've kind of been wondering, Ewan, when they're going to pay the piper, when they're going to be saving some fuel after the short stint uh, that they've set up effectively in the first pit stop cycle of the race. They haven't dropped behind their teammates, though. Labigra and Bennett, in fact, dropping back in time. Yeah, they, they can't be far away from a pit stop either, those front two. They're lighter on fuel, and so they're probably going quicker as a result. Last time around, they were uh, pretty equal, actually. But generally, the gap is going out and has gone out. That's somewhat down to the, the less fuel that they'll be riding with at the moment. But the, the real key for them and the, the thing that they've got to solve is where are they going to make up the time in terms of uh, their fuel? Uh, where are they going to make up the fuel, I should say? And... Meanwhile, one of the Williams Esports Academy cars has ended up off the road at the chase. And this time it oh, no. went wrong before, and I'm, I'm amazed. Amazed that car didn't pull a hard left down onto pit lane. Somehow the magic of iRacing, the front end reattaches. And so it was Bradham Esports and David Toff, the Hungarian, that just slightly miscalculates, and bam, that's a hard shot into the right side wall. And as, as you said, I, I'm equally amazed that that has not resulted in a pit stop for that car, which was, uh, I don't even think it on the brakes yet, was it? It was just hit up the rear once. There's the first bit on the way into the corner, and there's the sort of convergence of the lines. And I think the BMW has got to hold a lot of responsibility for that there. Uh, you say a lot, I say all of the responsibility. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, tr tr typically, you want to only brake at after the 150 meter board there. In a supercar, you're, you know, through that right, it's a scary corner, and then you're trying to basically straighten it up and straight away get onto the brakes with no ABS to help you, of course, in the straight line. So, a uh, bit of a, an interesting situation there, and no live race control, let's just remember. Uh, but that is an unfortunate incident, to say the very least. Uh, once again, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Team Redline show. Your eyes don't deceive you. It's Redline 1, 2, 3, and 4. It is slightly on strategy, yes. It's been a fascinating race so far. It's bound to be fascinating as we continue to work forward as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't forget that track temperatures still haven't really started to rise. And so the Lamborghini's looking very good. Two Porsches running the fifth and sixth. Two BMWs running behind them before you get to the first of the Mercedes. While it is Lamborghini one, two, three, and four, it is all in the hands of one team right now. Manufacturers at the front, just a little bit more mixed up. Yeah, it is good to see that we've got, uh, what, what's that, four manufacturers inside the top 10, if I'm uh, counting up correctly. It's very good to see, but unfortunately, as you mentioned at the start of the broadcast, the Ferrari's really nowhere to be seen as a result of, well, some people are saying as a result of uh, BOP. You could say as a result of some of the best teams not racing it, but that's a separate problem. Um, we've also not really got very many Audis in the field either, which is a, a bit of a shame, but it's going out of fashion a little bit, even with the Evo version. Uh, the Ford GT, absent, disappointed. I am disappointed in the McLaren as well, not being up there, but... Uh, I, I don't think you are particularly. No, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we don't need the Fords and the McLarens. I mean, yeah, we do. No, we don't. I mean, the Ford's so old, it's got a shifter sticking out from its floor. <laughs> um, you need to take your hand off the wheel to shift it up and down. That's clearly not fit for the modern era of GT3 racing. And then the McLaren, okay, I can't say too much mean about the McLaren. It, it spits far out the back. Um, I think the only thing that's bad about the McLaren is it's just how scary it can be to drive. I mean, yeah, uh, that's a car where you've got both feet covering both pedals so that in case you need to do the Malone shuffle, which is slam on the brake and the throttle full capacity just to try and bring the car back under control, you can, and that's not an experience I want for anybody. No, but it, don't forget, it's had, it's had success around here in the past, and it's been the, uh, the most popular car and the, the race winning car in the last two years, so it's not... Uh, Unfancy totally. So the McLaren. The next time there's a terrible trend going around TikTok, you and I'm going to send it over to you and see what happens. Why? Y you would do the Tide Pod challenge, wouldn't you? What is that? Oh, good. I'm glad you don't know what it is because, boy, uh, the internet can be very, very dumb nowadays. I, I cannot go on things like TikTok. The what now? What did you say? Tide Pod challenge. 
I've never heard of that in my life. Good. That's all okay. you need. To, that's all I need to hear about you, you, and to know you are a very sensible human being. Okay. Um, and so I'm very, very happy to hear you have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, let's be real. When we're talking about strategy, we have no idea what we're talking about right now, Ewan, because as much as we might have a semblance for what makes sense, what the teams might be doing, what they might be trying to do, we should say, it's not until the end of the race that we're actually going to know how things have worked, what strategies are going to convert, and like you mentioned, especially for the two cars out front with their short fill, they've got a real task on their hands to try and match the number of pit stops that the rest of the teams and drivers do without going one more time down to pit lane. Yeah, we, we, we're going to get some ideas, though, at the end of this stint, I think, because we're going to see just how early these two have to come in. And if Ariel is able to go one lap longer than Benito, which you'd imagine he will be able to, from what we're seeing in terms of lap times, you can't imagine there's a, there's a crazy amount of fuel saving going on between them. But in my opinion, they're going to have to do a pretty crazy amount of fuel saving to actually win this race. If they want to make up the amount of fuel to do this on 11 stops. But to your point, just immediately on the other side of the pit stops, are they even aiming to do 11 stops? Have they just decided, well, it's going to be 12, isn't it, today? So we don't want to fuel save. We're just going to go for this short fill early, keep a low... Uh, low amount of fuel in the tank throughout the majority of all of the stints remaining and then hopefully in their case win the race but it's not as simple as that of course and, and we're going to find out at the end of this stint I think between these two whether are they going to try and save for 11 stops here or are they going to uh, just make the extra one so we're waiting to find out sun very much by the way is now rising and it's going to be in the eye line and the, the sight lines of various drivers as we continue to work our way through this race, another look, a great look at just uh, that run down through Skyline. And uh, the track plunges away from you. There's no other way to really describe it. Uh, the rise up to the cutting. Uh, just look at how, even from this perspective, you and I feel like you can tell how steep it is. It, uh, absolutely. And even on a computer screen as well, which is sometimes very difficult to do, um, just gives you some wonderful aerial shots. ROC models it so, so well these days. So uh, realistically, there is the writing about Panorama. Some of those famous written letters in all of motorsport, I would say. Yeah, and you know, uh, I like the way that this is done. Um, Laguna Seca's got its corkscrew lettering as well. I don't know. It just doesn't look as good, in my opinion. There's the, the run down the Conrod straight, anything but in terms of the up and down elevation change. A couple of the stragglers at the tail end of the field. And here come your race leaders. So not far away from traffic being a, a factor for them. And in fact, if you look 60 seconds away, so about half a lap away from where your leader is, you find yourself in 32nd, the WSR Esports Butt Kicker team and the number 23, which is, of course, uh, adorned with the Australian colours for today's special outing. And uh, why not as well? Makes it uh, slightly easier to pick them out. WSR Esports Book Kicker makes them a little bit uh, different to how they normally live read as well. But there we go, the traditional Australian yellow, which I've always been puzzled as to why they play in yellow in all sports, because they, they don't have any yellow on their flag. But anyway, it seems to be the traditional colour. And so... Uh, Special livery, special time for them uh, here this race. Do you know what is, in my opinion, the best-looking Australian cricket jersey of all time, Ewan? Oh, God. You what? know what it is? Because we've got the colours on your screen right now. It's just well, not like the car we're focusing on. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. The, gr yeah. the green and gold. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it's not quite as... I don't know. I think I prefer the yellow, to be honest with you. I'm just saying, that green and gold, I still remember the, the ODI jersey. We're going very off the rails in terms of cricket talk, but at least we should talk about that instead of when Lewis McLeod gets here, because then we're going to have to talk about golf. Um, yeah, and he, he can't stop. And no one wants to talk about that. Yeah, so uh, anyway, WSR Esports butt kicker. By the way, of course, special colours for today. Neither of their drivers, at least from what I know, from down under, they've got Lucas Prada <laughs> and Lucas Linkvist. So uh, I wonder if they've got some other Australian drivers in the stable and uh, maybe they just had to uh, mix things up because even, uh, you know, with this being a single uh, class affair, just GT3 cars, and so there being a lower I rating threshold to get into this split, you still need about an average of like 8,000, 8,500 I rating. And so... I can see another WSR Esports butt kicker car slightly further behind, but I can't see any more, and I know they wanted to try and stack maybe three or four of them in the top split. Yes, it's 
so difficult to do though, isn't it? It's so competitive. Uh, and this is what I was saying earlier on, but some of the top drivers really needing a, a very, um, I don't know what the word is, very, very, well, I said tedious at the time, a very tedious week trying to gain I rating to get into the top split. Unfortunately, that won't be possible for some of the pitch. And, and you know, it, if you are a R racing driver, of course, and don't be disheartened by not being in the top split by any means. There's lots of very competitive racing below, uh, below this split. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, talking to split seven winner of the Bathurst 12 hours was 2018 or 2019 um, won by a full lap uh, and that was fortunate because uh, I may have forgotten to come down to pit lanes well and you might be thinking no that would never happen no team would ever run out of fuel at this level uh, they'd never forget to come down pit lane oh believe you me we saw it multiple times over the course of 2023 Dave Chin chimes in by the way into the into the chat along with Donut Tom, some great names by the way. We use golden, <laughs> not yellow. Golden green, I agree, it looks spectacular. Uh, Dave Chin says gold for the beaches and the metal found in Ophir and green for the forest and gum trees. Now I'm just gonna say, I know Australia has got a wide range of diverse environments to think about. Yeah. Forest is not a lot of what I associate with Australia, I'm just saying. No, but I think well, no, I'm not going to say that. I get what he's saying. No, I'm not going to say that. That's that, that would, that's. I'll, I'll research it and maybe I'll say it later. <laughs> because just, once I've done some research, because, Look because I don't want to say that without research. A proper <laughs> researcher and everything. I'm just saying, like, I love Australia. Don't get me wrong. I grew up in Singapore. I've only actually got to go to Australia once. It was a lovely time. We spent uh, some time in Sydney, Adelaide. Uh, enjoyed it a bunch, uh, and so nothing but fond memories but you know australia is a a, a, a big country uh, and yep. there's a lot in the middle that you know it would be hard to live in that's how i'll put it <laughs> yeah uh, i would say so i wouldn't want to live there anyway bit too bit too warm i'm a bit scared of australia to be honest with you it's a bit too uh, there's too many animals that might kill me <laughs> All the snakes and stuff like that yeah, it's just a bit scary. Um, but being from, being from England, where there's literally nothing that can kill you. Well, um, at least here on iRacing, you don't have to worry about kangaroos on the run-up to the cutting. Exactly. There was a great clip on social media. Was it a practice or was it the race where they actually had to slow down for a bunch of kangaroos jumping their way around the track? It, it was practice in like 2019 or something, wasn't it? But it's one of the most I, it's some of the most iconic pictures I've ever seen have come, come from there. Just the bizarre sight of... Because the kangaroos did like half a lap. It was remarkable, um, and everyone had to just sit behind them waiting. So, uh, so that was a few years ago. As you say, thankfully, that's not a, a thing here um, on our racing because, unfortunately, many of them do get uh, hit. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, unfortunately one of those things as well, right, where you're on a public road. It's hard to police a lot of the time. Uh, all the different ways to block off entry points for, for animals and stuff like that. Uh, and it's uh, unfortunate that uh, that can be a thing. Same thing at Laguna Seca when it comes to some of the uh, local environment as well. From what I've heard from some IndyCar testing, they've had uh, some wild occurrences. So both of the, the uh, Donut Tom, Dave Chin, they're both saying they've got rainforest. So I don't worry, I believe you. It's not that I doubt you. And again, I'll just say again, green and gold, the best uh, cricket jerseys that uh, I've ever, I've ever seen the Australian cricket team wear. Um, Oh, that does, this, this is very off topic for a conversation on an on a iRacing broadcast, but the conversation has just reminded me, Ewan, that cricket's coming to the US in a couple of years' time for the World Cup, and I should register to try and go see some of the games. A couple of times, isn't it? Like in a couple of months. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. You need to get on it quickly because I think it's in June. So is it in June? I think so. Is it this uh, year? Unless I'm unless I'm getting mixed up with uh, two years away. So so yes, uh, cricket is attempting again to be an Australian. Uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> an American sport. It is an Australian sport. Uh, uh, an American sport, and we'll see how that goes they in got, a few months. They got Major League Cricket, and you're right. It is this year, June the first. It all kicks off. Um, okay, so now I've got. Uh, okay. Uh, that is for two hours time when I jump off the broadcast uh, I can talk to Lewis about my excitement to go and see a cricket game he's going to love that conversation uh, grid and go team manager I think Kala has just jumped in to say uh, don't get iRacing started on scanning kangaroos we'll get the uh, dynamic kangaroo model uh, worked on which will be very very fun I mean we, we haven't mentioned it so far yet Ewan I mean we're 90 minutes in so that's a bit of a uh, surprise but 
we're almost there. We're about a week and a half away from rain on iRacing. And rain is going to be the big game changer, right, in a lot of ways. These special events, 12-hour sprints, it's not going to be entirely mixed up, right? If you go a couple of laps down, you're not suddenly going to be able to get those laps back through a safety car system suddenly. But having the rain might just make it a little bit more unpredictable. In a case like this, for example, fuel saving for red line that they're having to try and think about right now. Let's say we get a rain shower that then puts the rest of the cars that are saving fuel slightly off kilter. Suddenly, wabam, we're all on the same sequence once again. Well, exactly. That, that would really help the two cars that are out front at the moment. But it just adds these different dynamics, doesn't it, that uh, will, will help racing, hopefully, in these special events. I, I really hope that it would. Because, uh, and I really hope it brings a bit more adaptability into these special events as well. Because uh, if you look at the field at the moment, everyone is, is so perfected in the way that they drive. Everyone is, uh, has really got this circuit down to a T. They've practiced around here for a long time, of course, but when there's changeable conditions, I hope that we've got the case of people don't quite know how much grip is going to be into each corner with the, with the rain and, and everything. And so I hope that that's going to mean that the adaptability skill is, is a lot more important than it is at the moment in our racing, where admittedly conditions do change rather wildly for a 12-hour race, and, they, and I'm sure they will do today, but not as much as when there's moisture in the air. I almost feel as though, you know, as, ooh, this is a bit of an indication. We'll get back to that conversation. It's uh, Enzo Benito that comes into pit lane. Had to catch myself before I said Gustavo aerial timing screen. Didn't quite light up with the pit entry initially. But the fact that he's come in 16 minutes before the top of the hour. In 10 hours of racing, can they save 16 minutes of fuel? I mean, hypothetically, yes. I guess the question is, is it going to be fast? Well, that is the other question, to be fair, uh, uh, and somewhat as well. How uh, how are they going to be? Uh, how many laps are they going to be able to do in a stint? Because if they can do 31 laps for the rest of the race, then they can make it, in my opinion. But only 30 laps might not be enough in terms of uh, the pace that they're running at the moment. So I think it's tricky. And, and the problem for the two of them as well is that they're going to come out in quite heavy traffic. There is a driver change happening. Johnny Vecchio now getting at the wheel of that car, actually. But he will be right in the traffic, and that's another problem around here. So Benito out and Vecchio in. See how he can run as he gets up to speed. Should come out in some clean air as well. You'd hope to be able to get up to speed. In fact... Uh, Got some clean air and then some traffic. ATRS and Falcon Sim Racing directly ahead. And so, given that we don't expect those drivers in for at least another probably seven, eight laps or so, see how Vecchio does in terms of working his way through. This is going to be the gamble, of course, with coming in a bit earlier. You're going to get deposited off into some traffic that has yet to come down pit lane. We'll have some lighter fuel. Yes, worn tires, but might still have some decent speed because uh, just having that little bit less of a load to carry around. 2.06.48 uh, last time for Ariel, so very quick at the end of the stint. was more than half a second quicker than both Labigra and Bennett in the pair of red line machines that was slightly uh, better off on fuel last time by. And Ewan Gustavo goes an additional lap even beyond the one more lap he got on Benito. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is the advantage. So he's going to come in with about 10 hours, 12 to go which puts his situation a lot better. But what happens, I would imagine, in the next stint is that Ariel, or whoever takes over from him, will lead around in the 44 car, and then they'll be able to save in that second car. So if they sort of alternate who's saving and who's leading, then they can maintain a good pace, hopefully, but also uh, maintain fuel saving in the same way that they are right now, as uh, Alta Sea Sports also have to come in early, of course. Yep, as Carlos Fenelosa had been able to get past the likes of Daniel Pastor, uh, but not Vasilius Belitsiotis, as far as I'm aware. You can see those two Williams cars uh, slightly separated from the main train trying to hunt down the red line cars at the front. Parker White then in some no man's land slightly further behind as we get ready to see those first real driver change sequences play on out. Another glance towards the weather conditions because it is starting to rise, not quickly by any means, but it's a, it's a one degree Celsius warmer. Not going to do much in the grand scheme of things, I know. But Ewan, it's just that indication that things are starting to change. Yeah, exactly. It's symbolic, really, of what we've got at this stage in the race. And I think it's fair to say that it's not going to take us another hour and 45 minutes for it to increase another degree. The rate of increase is going to increase also. 
um, towards the middle of this race and then the midday, which is still a long way away, of course. This race takes a bit of recalibrating of your brain. It will be reaching midday. We'll be pretty much halfway uh, of this one. Well, we will be halfway at midday. So it does take a little bit of working your head around um, compared to a normal 12-hour race, which would end in the dark. But how special is it to make this race stand out from the rest by starting in the dark it's such a unique and, and a wonderful thing and of course you know the fact that a couple of uh, was it last year or the year before uh, we ran the race a little bit closer to the australian winter and it did actually mean that uh, we we had a bit more running in the darkness at the start really changed the complexion in my opinion as to how you approach the first couple of hours of the race aerial into pit lane maybe no surprise that he is forced in this though really positions i think that car so much better than uh, benito and vecchio in terms of uh, the mileage that they've got to try and hit it's going to be Labiga uh, and bennett that take one and two back over simify will slide forward to third with the train VirtualCoach.gg, Marla Racing Team, BMW MT, BS Plus Competition, and the Apex Racing Team, along with Door Esports, all in the main queue behind them. 11 minutes before we see them down to pit lane, though. Ewan, I mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the bollard, whatever you want to call it, slightly earlier. Best bollard in motorsports. I mean, look at how happy this man is. Oh, right. <laughs> I see what you mean now, yeah. Okay. That's... Uh... <laughs> That's good. I've not especially noticed that before, but um, but there we are. He's uh, he's very pleased, nice. and. Uh that's that's interesting writing, but it's very um, difficult to write with a high DPI <laughs> mouse is what I've just learned. You, you, you'd think that uh, with the amount of times you do it, you get better at it, but uh, Th this was with a new mouse. It was even I thought oh, it would I be see. easier. No, it was even more difficult. Okay, oh, I could tell. So, uh, so there it, it, it is iconic, though, isn't it? it? It would look strange up there if it uh, if it didn't look like that. Starvo Ariel drops out of the car for the time being. Diogo Pinto takes over, former Porsche Esports Super Cup champion. I wonder if uh, Pinto and Ariel channeling a bit of the Portuguese connection between the two of them. Of course, Gustavo Ariel down in Brazil speaking Portuguese. I wonder if they're able to just communicate slightly better in terms of what the car wants with Diogo being the native, I'm sure, Portuguese speaker. One of those unique things that in big teams like you were mentioning, you and as some of these teams consolidate drivers uh, at the top level, you still are always going to have pairings that are a little bit stronger than others. And so keeping your drivers working together well, such a vital skill for a team manager. Yeah, and, and, and Redline seems to have really got that down recently as well with uh, some certain pairings. But it, it does, in the same way, seem that whichever pairing you decide to go for, uh, and whichever way round it all is, they seem to be okay in terms of uh, a driver pairing. They seem to be strong to uh, Team Redline. So in some ways it doesn't actually matter, but it, it takes a lot of building that team sort of relationship and it takes a lot of building that kind of atmosphere that they've got to allow pretty much any pairing to go well in, in this kind of event. Just got a message through in the paddock from the BMW M Team Mouse machine as we see a bit of jockeying into turn two. No swap arounds though inside of this uh, chasing pack for the lead. Uh, word out of the, the Mouse Esports camp, uh, Mouse camp, sorry, excuse me, is that Patrick Holtzman actually suffered a back injury in recent times and so he's not feeling uh, up to the challenge of really digging into this race and uh, being able to really give it the best that he's going to be able to so they're going to have to retire that number 71 machine at some point not sure exactly when might be at the end of this stint but a shame for them Benega had done a decent job of being able to position them for a good at the very least top 10 if not top 5 finish on the debut of Mouse into the world of iRacing. Of course, Patrick Holtzman coming off his very first win in the Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Deutschland, uh, breaking the streak of Benneke Ewan. He had won seven races in a row, and it took a bit of contact to see Patrick Holtzman break it and finally come out on top. It's good to see Holtzman doing, doing well, and a driver that certainly improved a lot throughout 2023 on that uh, platform. But unfortunately, probably better to uh, to rest, as sad as that is going to be for us to see. Effectively, both Miles cars out of contention within two hours is a real shame for us as spectators. 
but uh, I think his uh, his health is the priority there and he's got to make sure that he's uh, fit and healthy for the rest of the season of course no point uh, making anything worse in this race yeah I'll be honest I again did it like I said earlier an AI race about 40 minutes last night and I was suffering at the end of it again I, I haven't raced much recently so you know uh, like these drivers use strong brakes uh, you know strong forces through the wheelbase to, to give them the feeling of the car and so you know by the end of the 40 minutes my knee was going ow 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 why are you stamping on the brake so hard my shoulders were going can I have a break this is a, a relentless and rough lap with only a couple of chances to really take a breather and uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy race by any means not just the track itself which uh, some have described as the blue hell a mix of the Nürburgring Norschleife, the Road Atlanta, and Laguna Seca. I mean, it's got a little bit of everything that you could ask for, and it really is a fun challenge. You, and in a few moments' time, we're going to say goodbye to you, and uh, you'll rejoin us in a couple of hours' time to walk us through the middle portion of the race. What are you expecting to see when you rejoin, though? Because very clean start. We had all 48 cars running through the first hour. Starting to see retirement start to build up slowly but surely. What can we expect in terms of fuel saving as well? In terms of fuel saving, it's, it's been speculated, hasn't it, that with the warm uh, temperatures later on, that fuel saving is going to be a bit easier with the slight less uh, speed around here. Is, whether that's going to be true or not remains to be seen. I think when I return, though, Redline will be leading. I think that's quite a safe uh, assumption to make, to be honest with you. And, and possibly less cars in the race as well. But admittedly, with, within these... Uh, stints so far we've really seen very little incidents in, in fact we this is like 45 minutes in that Ruben Bonga had that incident at the chase and that was pretty much the first one in terms of car contact then we saw a few people running off into the grass uh, through the chase but nothing in terms of car contact until about 45 minutes in it's been a great start to the race for that and uh, hopefully that will continue but you can't imagine it will carry on all day yeah they got the memo to keep it clean and green at the start uh now I know it's hard to tell but which of the red line cars at this point do you think is best positioned? Uh, because, of course, you know, uh, Vecchio Pinto, they've come out together with one another. So, you know, they're basically still working together. Labiga and Bennett, you'd assume they'll do something similar where one driver leads for an hour. They'll come down and do a pit stop and then cycle back around. The driver behind now does the towing and back and forth, back and forth. It, it's, a, it, it's tough. I think it's, it's, it's basically pick a choice at random. How would you decide which red line car comes out on top? Uh, that is a good point. I mean, I don't know if they are gonna, how they are going to settle it either. Are they going to fight with each other in the last hour? I'm, I'm not sure they would do on a normal day, but maybe they would. And, and, and in the same way, you can't see them being split apart through natural causes at the moment, can you really? You, you, you can see them running like this for a very, very long time. So, And they kind of need each other as well. So I'm not sure how they are going to resolve this at all. It was at Daytona where the only way that we split the two red line drivers was a technical issue that saw yeah. one of their uh, GT3 entries drop a lap down. What happened? Well, they just sinks right back up and got back to the task of pushing each other. Yes, one lap down, but one lap down still to a victory. That's all they really cared about. Um, we had livery watch earlier. Let's have light watch. Uh, endurance lights for Luke Bennett in the number 20 machine. That's the middle bar that's uh, really glowing strong. You can see the uh, leading red line machine a little less illuminated with the headlights. Uh, and that is basically just a setup option. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the iRacing garage, you choose which uh, light configuration you would like. Um, I, I don't know if there's really a, a, a difference between the two. I guess it's just preference at the end of the day. I don't, I don't think so. It's, uh, well, it's not making our lives easy. That's, uh, let's, let's put it that way. But, uh, but there we go. But thankfully, the sun has properly risen now. I, I was thinking, actually, just earlier on, by the way, just a uh, little bit of a tangent. Um, when we joined pra excuse me, qualifying earlier in the race, I was thinking, goodness me, can't see a thing uh, out here at the moment. And uh, it didn't really help with the camera angles either. It was just everywhere you look, complete darkness and, and uh, just no chance. So uh, everyone would be glad that that phase of the race is behind them now. Virtual coach by Grid and Go. Nico Rubela brings the 001 into pit lane. And so releases Quirmbach and Dinez to try and now close back up to Simify and make something happen. Now that is before the top of the hour. That's an interesting pit stop timing from the virtual coach machine. 
our expectation is that it is going to be easier to save fuel that the longer you get into this race once we start to see the track temperatures build it becomes a little bit harder to spend as much time full throttle but at this point in the race we know it might be harder to go the full hour and i think we're seeing that right now in this pit stop cycle well that that yeah that is concerningly early i've got to be honest and it shows again that despite the fact that Rubelo wasn't leading the train, he is still really struggling. Tristan Iglesias has been leading around here, which is, uh, it, I would have thought actually would have helped him, but it really hasn't hit, and, and that stint was uh, not long at all, for, or not long enough, I wouldn't say, from, uh, from Nicholas Rubelo. So it may well be a, a reversion to something else in terms of strategy in, uh, in the not too distant future, but another 40 second pit stop for them. They've not short field or anything, which would have been a surprise. Here is the Simu 5, number 33, Tristan Iglesias passed a bit of traffic and going to separate himself out from the Marla Racing Team machine as well. Beneficial to say the very least, flicks it to the left, got to avoid too much of the curb on the inside in that Porsche because a lot of these curbs are very raised and you need to know when to use them, when not to use them, especially for example through this final corner, so high off the ground, you're just trying to make sure you clip the apex and then ride that outside curb on the run back towards the start finish line and what is then only about a 150 odd meter dash in towards the next braking zone. Next driver down pit lane, Vasilius Belitsiotis, another driver in before the top of the hour. Uh, another concern as well there, I would say. Anyone who's pitted at this stage in the race is uh, a little bit concerning, but anyone after this is in the green, as far as I'm concerned, for fuel here. So that's a sort concern for Pelletziotis, but he'll be in, possibly to change drivers, and that's going to be a common theme as well throughout the remainder of this uh, pit stop cycle. Lots of different drivers. Yeah, it seems like Lafuente jumping into the number one machine, still waiting, of course, for two red line cars out front identical liveries uh, and so far identical races for the 7 and 20 see where they come out in comparison to the rest so 60 seconds or so left to go before the top of the hour we've been able to complete 57 laps or onto the 58th lap of asking 48 drivers started still got 46 out there and say goodbye to you and o'leary in a moment's time, say hello to Lewis McLeod. Uh, Ewan, closing thoughts, though, before we send you out of the commentary booth. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, pleasantly surprised, actually, by this start to the race. We've got so many cars still on the track, at least. Two cars retired so far, which is uh, a lot smaller of a, an amount than what we've seen in years gone past. We've seen carnage on the opening lap sometimes in this race, but thankfully this time around it's been a lot cleaner. It's been a bit tactical, of course, for the first couple of hours, but uh, it's not been uh, too many, too heavy on the crashes, which uh, I'm very pleasantly surprised by. We're only sending you off to have a break. You'll be back in two <laughs> hours. Don't get too, uh, too dramatic for us because we want to have you back refreshed for those middle four hours. Bye-bye to you and O'Leary with two hours run in the 2024 iRacing Bathurst 12 hours presented by the coach Dave Delta and as pit stops continue to work their way on through Simufi Marla and then BMW M Team BS competition making a slight hash of that pit stop entry. We welcome Lewis McLean into the commentary booth. Lewis, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm enjoying uh, what I'm seeing. I agree with what you were saying earlier about yeah, that the, 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 there's, there's been a lack of crashes, uh, which is great. It's great to see. Um, obviously, not every year do we, we pass with a lack of crashes. Um, so it's uh, obviously showing what Top Split's all about. Interesting difference on the uh, on the fuel strategies, all that kind of stuff. But it's the on-track race. We've not had quite enough, as we kind of expect sometimes from Bathurst. Yeah, it does somewhat lull us into a bit of a false sense of security, and you just hope that at the end... It comes good comes interesting and i think right now we're seeing the driver changes maybe build some intrigue because now you get the second drivers in not sure exactly where their pace is going to lie uh, relative to the first driver iglesia stays in uh it's quorum back out sebastian weldon that takes over denez out reina talvar in and so that's just a handful of the driver changes that have already sequenced on through but already of course pinto and vecchio back around to take the race lead and with a full pit stop sequence last time by lewis you and uh, me and you and having a bit of a confab uh, behind the scenes just before you joined. You were correctly saying that for these two in particular, they are really relying on the warmer track temperatures to help their fuel consumption. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, you know, um, 
uh, as as temperature rises around here. We we're talking about this a little bit um, earlier on. Uh, obviously, no, you, like, like before before I came on this broadcast, I have a little bit of a chat with some various people about it. Uh, temperatures are expected to rise. Obviously, we start very early in the morning where things are very cold and the track is very fast. Right, it's it's, it's really really quick in the morning, um, and and when it is quick, it means that your off throttle time, like over the top of the mountain, is is certainly lower. Uh, and in in doing that, you burn a lot of fuel. Uh, whereas as the two team red light cars at the front of the field do come into the pit lane, um, when it heats up, you kind of you have to blend out the throttle a lot more going over the top. You don't have quite as much grip. It means fuel saving is actually a lot easier once the circuit has warmed up. Natural fuel saving. Some might refer to it as just the uh, natural condition that you have. And uh, yep, as you see the machines into pit lane and look at how they angle themselves just to make sure they get as good a run onto uh, the exit as possible. It's going to be double driver changes and so Coiter in for Labigra, lull them in to that number 20 machine and so uh, now we'll see how they go as they jump back uh, into the cars after watching on from the sidelines to get this race underway. A couple of cars going one lap longer and Lewis this is going to help them going even further past the top of the hour. Yeah, like I said, it's very, it's very interesting to see if anyone's going to try and maybe even like fuel save enough to, to shave pits up a bit. Do they know? Like, how far do they go on the first stint? Do you know? Do they, do they go much past the hour? Uh, well, basically, your leader was in right at the top of the hour right. and left pit lane about 60 seconds in. We had a couple of cars go one lap longer and then one car go a lap, lap longer than that, if I remember correctly. But uh, no one really doing anything too interesting, if I'm being honest. Yeah, no one's quite pulling off the uh, the Sontek strategy that we were seeing back in Fuji uh, at the end of last year, where it was just going ridiculously long. We're still having a hilarious amount of speed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of one of those things that this race is going to really change um, as the day goes on, more so than most um, of the uh, the endurance races that we do on iRacing. You can see Daniel Pagetal there, really muscling this car around. Um, I, d I don't know. I don't know how much fuel save, like how much if if you, if you could already save a lap or two more, like past the hour now. But if you're going to be able to save enough to shave off a pit stop, shaving off a pit stop around here it is quite a big deal. That pit lane is damn slow. And uh, we've mentioned it before. It's a it's a corner you actually have to a sequence of corners you navigate through the pit entry. Uh, Dinez oh, got it. into the grass and uh, Lewis hates it. Uh, I made my fair share of mistakes there as well. One thing to note for Daniel Pastor, uh, he has got his uh, he's got his name on his gloves. I've just picked that out from the webcam really nice touch uh, and I like seeing those little details that drivers have to just personalize their setups at home let's not forget can feel a little bit lonely at times and you're racing just by yourself uh, separated from the rest of your teammates mm. and now they make that difficult blend into pit lane and trying to judge where their box is and when they can get into the slow lane it is a bit lonely. That's why you got to go and uh, yeah go, go go around people's houses or you know, go you know, have, have, have make the event uh, an, an event uh, I know, uh, I don't think they're in the same car because they've been nothing to do with the same team, but I know someone who's in split three, Ronnie Smith, is at Stanley Deslandis' house. Is he uh, really? Racing from there. Absolutely no idea as to why. I didn't ask. I was just like, oh, that's interesting. Fair enough. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, we, we know there's, there's these kind of like events and stuff where they, 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 they do the racing stuff in person, whether it's in a facility like Commander or whatnot, um, or you know, even Redline. Like, uh, obviously, Apex is the most prevalent one on the, on the grid as well. Like, there's there's quite a lot of these kind of things happening. But it is always nice if you're going to do an endurance race to kind of do it like in person because then it doesn't feel quite as lonely um, when it gets boring. I will say, by the way, very quickly on pit entry um, because, as you remember, because I bring it up pretty much every time. You know, what I'm going to say already. Um, when when we did the race around here in 2021 and I got zero instant points with Dan Kell, yes. uh, obviously Max Verstappen and Zimini are the only other car to have done so. Of the 2,901 cars, it's fine, don't worry about it, uh, which is pretty good. It was that pit entry that was the only really, really, really scary part once right. the race got on the way. Because it's the, uh, generally speaking around the circuit, it's pretty much like one of the only places you can actually pick up a 1x, like really easily. Because if you hit the Everyone's wall, it's zero x. Exactly, exactly. It was really stressful. So, so what I've never asked you, by the way, is uh, you, you, zero incident points that race. How many zero X's did you guys have? Oh, I had a, a couple. There you including, go. Including a very large one here where I thought I wrote the car off. 
we, like I, I, I really battered the wall. <laughs> we saw uh, Enzo Benito smack the wall pretty hard coming up through one of those left-handers. So, you know, you can get away with it if you're lucky. You just don't want to, to make a habit of it. I think that is the important thing. Yeah. Manuel Troncoso in the Drago Racing Car, 30 laps on the stint. He'll come into pit lane and give up the lead of the race. What I did notice, though, is on the sequence of pit stops, not sure if it was traffic related, Pinto and Vecchio at one point had a good seven second advantage over the chasing red line pair behind, but suddenly you can fit all of the red line cars into one photo. Yeah, indeed. Very, uh, they're, they're just so strong at the moment. We're kind of seeing this a little bit, you know, with how they were working together back in Daytona. Obviously, we know there was a, a disconnection. I know you brought that up a little bit earlier on. But how strong this red line team are at the moment, it's kind of disgusting. But I, like, I'm, 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 it's, it's very impressive. Uh, it is very, very impressive. Uh, I will say, by the way, I know you were talking about it a little bit beforehand. Speaking of uh, X red line drivers uh it does seem as though that uh the plug has been pulled on Benecas car i know you're talking about patrick holtzman uh and the injury a bit earlier on so uh, very sad but it is now they have pulled the plug that car is now out of the race as far as i'm aware okay so there's the official confirmation from pit lane and what i was told by team manager uh, rene was that this is not the only special event they have plans for so we should expect to see them uh, in the future uh, just have to hope that maybe it's sooner rather than later. We're not far away from Sebring, so hopefully they show up for that. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Like I say, we, we, we know, uh, obviously, Mouse, um, they've, they've had the focus really on ESLR1 and, and Rensport over the last year. Uh, it's good to see them opening up uh, their, their options. Obviously, you no know, reason to take, take part in the Portugal Sports Break at Deutschland. Uh, but nice to see them entering more special events. I know, they, I know Max did um, uh, PESC. Uh, a bit last year, um, the first yeah, but couple of rounds. He, I, technically, he did that in the mouse car. Right. You know, it, it was alongside that ESL responsibility. This feels like mouse is here in iRacing. It, exactly, now. exactly, exactly. This, this is the kind of bit that it's like, we are starting to see, obviously with the partnership with BMW as well, which is um, very cool to see, uh, jumping on that team. I was, trying, I, was, I was with Cam when that got announced, because uh, we obviously were playing golf. We golf, instantly bring here it up. we go. Instantly bring it up. No, um, I mean, we were discussing it, and genuinely, because I, I remember there was there was four teams that were BMW um, backed last last year. Uh -oh. one of it. I can't remember which ones it was. Oh, what's happened to the OT? Yeah, we'll get back to that, because I clicked on the 002, and instantly we ended back in pit lane, so don't uh -oh. think something's gone right there, that's for sure. Uh-oh, what has happened? Oh, is it going to be a bit of assistance here? Obviously, we've seen a couple of issues around it, and I'm not sure if that was just the 002 turning in whilst the Falcon tire car was there, or so, whether that was just going for a gap that wasn't there. <laughs> so in, in, uh, there's been a lot of kerfuffle about, you know, how many moves mm. you can make. That was maybe a couple of moves down the straight, but I will say, Falcon car is not necessarily alongside into the braking zone. No, but where does the contact happen? The contact happens before they actually get into the corner. You'd probably see it from, like, up above. But see, see the... I don't know, that grid and go car looks like it's turning in. Now, the only reason why I say that is that, like, if you're on the inside, yes, you might not be fully there, um, but if the contact happens, like, comfortably before the apex, and it's a car turning in, it's a car turning in. You, if there's a car there, you've still got to give them room. Let's take a look. So what I'll say is the fork and tire car breaks right at the regular braking marker. So it's not gone for an absolutely desperation lunge like you traditionally expect and then makes the corner as well maybe with some yeah. assistance yes but uh, uh can we call that a racing deal uh yeah I'd, I'd lean a little bit more towards the racing side like i think like if if, if i were you know shooting and stuff I'd, I'd maybe like lean a little bit more towards like like the fault of the 002 at which point they've already served their penalty uh, in a sense of visiting the barrier it's a natural uh, penalty yes so it's, it's sort of like yeah do you know what Move on, lads. It, it's self-correcting sometimes, the mountain, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Like, if you're going to go for a, for a silly move like that, then you might pay a price for it. If you're going to defend silly like that, then you're going to pay a price for it. Uh, the two of them, like I say, just, just come into blows. That happens quite a lot around here. It's why, I mean, I remember um, when I was a B-class driver uh, and my uh, friend Oscar Harbick said, uh, no, don't do the Bathurst races. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. Because uh, oh, they were 75 minutes around Bathurst. Okay. Uh, this was 2014, by this the way. This would be the so GT3 cars, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And I was in, uh, I was in Ewan O'Leary's favourite, the Z4. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember... 
I, I didn't qualify because I wanted to, to stay out of the run, which meant that working through the field, always with about 10 minutes to go, I'd have to make a move generally into Griffin's bend. It is terrifying. Like, really terrifying. Um, it took me three races to go from B to A, by the way. Um, what was your I rating gain in the process? Oh, absolutely not. As you found, I, uh, I think starting from the rear of the field, actually, I think I, get, I, I was on the podium in all three of those races. Oh, goodness. Well, one <laughs> grid and go car in the pit lane, and now the virtual coach machine almost in the wall out of the final corner, and it's having to wait an A to try and rejoin safely. I mean, credit where credit's due to not be impatient, not to ruin anyone else's race in the process of rejoining, but oh, that's pain. Yeah, there is, uh, I mean, look, that final corner is really tricky, uh, whether it's most likely assisted, and uh, yes, it is. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a big, big shame. Is that the 99? Uh, was. Certainly was. Oof. Luca Kita elbows out as he tries to work his way through the field. Yeah, getting past uh, Rubelar a little bit aggressively. I mean, if, if there was any yeah. question about the previous incident and to the blame uh i think that was unfortunately a little bit late from the apex racing team machine and there's no oh, smoke. There's smoke oh that's not a good sign is that oh my goodness me i saw a uh, a certain so i'm not going to give any spoilers for v8 supercars because obviously i know some people might uh, uh catch up on that a little bit later on but i did see uh, a couple of cars having a or well really one car having a, it's twice there uh it is a very difficult corner at the cutting but that smoke tells me it might have been even a little bit before that yeah, well, I can't actually see anything on my timing screen that indicates that there was an issue. So we're just going to pretend the, uh, the smoke didn't exist and we're going to go about our merry way. Uh, it didn't take you very long to mention golf, by the way, Thank Lewis. You. So I think that was, what, Thank about you. five minutes? A new record for you. Um, yeah. Uh, look, it got rained off for two days, all right? I'm a little bit... You're I'm, a little I'm, bit I'm frustrated. Exactly. Do you exactly. know if there are any golf courses around Bathurst, though? That was the oh. question I was going to ask you. I am absolutely sure there's got to be. There's got to. There's I mean, like, got, there's got to be. Indianapolis has got four holes inside of it. We learned at Fuji that there's about 15 billion racetracks around there, uh, and you can see most of them on iRacing as well. Uh, there is just something natural, isn't there, about golf and racing that seems to go together? Exactly, and for a lot of people watching, boredom. Um, as I just got pinged on, on, on Teamsweek, I'm assuming it might be you. No, it's David. It's fine. Uh, I, I, I thought it might have been you and being like, oh, here we go again. Uh, he hates golf that. club, though, according to David Haynes. An 18-hole championship course that has played host to the New South Wales Open and regarded as one of Inland's New South Wales' finest courses. We'll be heading there, I believe, one day. I'll do that. Um, now, the question is, are we going there for the 1,000 or for the 12-hour race? We're going there for the golf, mate. Uh, which are you attaching to the holiday as well? <laughs> uh, one day we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I mean, but, if you're um, going to fly all the way over to Australia, you should make a trip of it, right? You should take advantage. And so one of my friends actually went out and watched MotoGP at Phillip Island. Ooh. And then the week after, Bathurst 1000, which uh, sounds great. It was the Bathurst 1000, though, that the heavens absolutely yeah. opened for. And it did look like, let's say, an interesting experience. Look, I mean, I'll say, look, of, of the two races, I would rather watch the Bathurst 1000 because I, I, I do love the 1000. But I will say, with the 12 hour and the fact, of course, that V8 Supercars racing there the week later, right? I, I, I'd almost. I'd almost rather watch the 12-hour and stay here for a couple of weeks and then at least get watched the V8 supercars around here. I know it's sprint racing is not the same as watching the 161 laps. So, uh, But still, it's, you get that taste of I do agree, but isn't this Bathurst like a one-off, like as they get the rest of the schedule Oh, I, I don't remember, because they, they, they've done it for a couple of years. Oh, have they? Okay, I thought this was just like a, a temporary sort of, you know, COVID-era thing, and the goal was to try and... Because they only have limited races at which, you know, weekends that they're allowed to race around Mount Panorama, because public roads, when you're going to block off, yep. you know, access to some of the local residents, it's not ideal, suboptimal, as Lewis might say. It, it certainly would be. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you've got to try and uh, figure that out. Um, you say suboptimal, but, you know, certain places... Uh, Las Vegas, for example, uh, had to find ways because they were racing on the strip. Uh, you know, most times in Formula One, street circuits locked down that area. They had to reopen the track basically every time there weren't cars racing around the facility. Sounds like such a stressful experience trying to manage all of that. 
Yeah, that's like Monaco, isn't it? You know, uh, when when um, the racing or you know when when a live session is done at Monaco, they have to open up the roads. Uh, I don't know if they open it to road cars. Do they open at least... every part of the track, though? I thought it was I only actually, parts. I actually it. do not know. I know, obviously, like, the Raskas and that kind of area does um, get opened up, which is where there's always the whole but stories of drivers going out there on a Saturday morning and finding out, hang on, the track's a little bit stickier than normal, mostly because of beer. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I'd assume it's open to road traffic. I don't know. I've never been. The, the, I mean, uh, I, I was talking to a friend who was not involved in motorsports at all this is someone that i went to college with no interest in motorsports as far as i'm aware but you know went to monaco last year um and i believe one of the things that they did was go to the there's apparently a shake shack in monaco is there really yeah, there's also apparently a steak and shake um which i don't think you know what the steak and shake is no now it's a very american thing at least a shake uh, shack is that, is that sounds great um, it is great um but a time and a place for everything you know yeah but in monaco have you ever been to a Waffle House, Lewis? No. Now, uh, the time and the place to be at the Waffle House is only after midnight. Kind, right. Kind of similar say, to a three cheeky Nando's. Kind of thing. Yeah, like uh, so, kind of similar to a cheeky Nando's, you know? Ah, uh, yeah. We were discussing the other day. I've never had Nando's either. Have you so, not? No. I'm not really bothered by it. A cheeky one. Never even a cheeky no. one. No, no, never. That. I, I was going to say. I don't know if it was from the angle. It almost looked like Nando's was in a, a deck chair. Um, a little bit there, but I think it's just because of the, the supports underneath the chair. It's fine. He looks quite inclined. He's got one of those ultra wide monitors as well. So, no triple screens for uh, Louis Nazar in the number 15 car. Is that a space heater behind? Now, it's not plugged in, but. In I a think it's a fan, isn't it? Okay, I was going to say, in a sim room, no one should ever be needing heaters. You've got PCs for that instead. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes I'll come into this room in the morning and it'll be freezing because obviously uh, well, it's freezing outside. Uh, and you know, how's it gets cold and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll sit down. Normally the radiator is off in this room as well because you just don't need it on uh, ever. Uh, and if it is too cold in this room, I'll just load up uh, and do a lap or something on a on a sim. That's normally more than enough to keep this room toasty. Uh, it's it's fine. It's fine. It, I think sim racing is one of those. It's like it's like one well, of those very few like things you can do like with the computer and stuff just in your own room where you don't need any heating it could be like minus 20 you you do a couple of laps you're sweating yes oh, and, and that's why i was saying earlier i did the 40 minute race at the ai yesterday and i was uh, drenched by the end of it uh drenched in smoke i guess out of turn number one for manuel troncoso in the drago racing 69 car decidedly not nice was that the no, it was the HC car, wasn't it? It had like, the no front end of it earlier on in the race. Yes. Um, it's just a little bit of a tap. Was that a little bit of a tap on the rear end of the semi fi car? I mean, look how close it is from up above to getting the right rear into the wall as well. Uh, yeah, I, I would say well judged. I think there might have been a little bit more luck. Uh, <laughs> just with, a little with, bit. <laughs> with, with that spin. Because obviously when you're inside the car, you've got absolutely no idea where that wall is. I think there might have been a little bit there that we just were like, whoa, just in case. Uh, but... Like this kind of thing is like, it's it's a fairly innocent spin which you know, damages the tires. Fair enough, um, but it could have been some serious damage on the car. So again, very lucky to have escaped with just that. But um, again, the mountain sort of bites, but not really. It's called Hell Corner for a reason, isn't it? Uh, I always say it's called Hell Corner because it's so frustrating to get right. It's cambered uh. in, but like in a frustrating way, like deceptively cambered in. And so when you get it wrong, not if but when. Then you have to do the entire mountain before you get back around to try and do it properly. Uh, and so again, Hell Corner, that's where it comes from for me. Let's go through some of the other drivers, by the way, just sharing us some perspective from behind the scenes, what's going on. Uh, team manager at WSR Esports Butt Kicker. Now, he's not in the car that's got the yellow and gold colors on it, but he's made sure he's come to Bathurst with the background prepared on his webcam. Yeah, that is, uh, that is fight and talk. Uh, Literally. With a, yeah, yeah, literally. No, I, I say, I like it. I like it. Um, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm never on webcam for any of these races, so I don't know what I'd put up in, in the background. What would you put up in the background? Oh, actually, no, I, I don't know you why I've asked. I know, I, I know exactly what you'll put up in the You background. don't want to know the answer to that because uh, it, was, it, it will sound very egotistical. Is it two VCA Simi Awards? It's definitely not. Here's Camille, <laughs> Camille Grabowski with his trophies and helmet behind him in that uh, Williams Esports car. Of course, he's done plenty of kart racing. You see the junior rock uh, name label behind him, which I will say, by the way, Lewis, one of the coolest things out of ESL R1, in my opinion, was some of those nameplates oh. on the rigs that the drivers stole and took back home. 
Yeah, I know uh, Darren McCormack still. I don't know where his is because he's like moved his rig around um, and, and such. But he used to have his like like nameplates effective like above uh, his rig and stuff. I I always like those things. I say if you ever go to like land events and stuff as, as a driver, whatever's there like with your name on it. You've just got to take it. Steal it. You've absolutely got to take it because it's kind of like it's those those are the things that kind of like complete, you know, the your your racing area. You say so you've you you were talking about like you know the the the, the gloves and stuff like we were seeing uh, a little bit earlier on with Pastor. You you've got to have a, as many of the things like with your name on it as is humanly possible. Yes, it is enormously egotistical. Yes, it means that you you. It, it, it makes it a little bit difficult explaining it to people <laughs> at times. Like, why, why are there so many things with your name on it? And you're real. Just, uh, just, uh, look, we're just not talking about it. It's fine. But it, it is important. It's definitely more comfortable than having mirrors in your a room. mirror? Uh, oh, my and I, I've got to say, it I took me a second to go, oh, wow, there's a mirror in that room. Um, yeah. That's an interesting setup for Daniel Lafuente um, as we take a look at him with the triple screens that wrap around. So, you know, he's fully engrossed and immersed in the experience. So uh, great to see the different setups. Now, that is a room that is dedicated to the sim ring. Uh, now, it's not quite Jimmy Broadbent shed levels, but it's Daniel Lafuente cupboard levels, I would say. Yeah, no, I mean, um, there was a, a guy called Risto Caput who probably most people watching this broadcast uh, won't know too much. Um, but I, I, I nicknamed him Risto Closet once because he, you know, if you, you know Harry Potter, yes. where he lives under the stairs. Yeah, right. there was a point. It literally looked like that. Oh um, my goodness. Lafuente, though, I will say, I almost thought this was like Warren esque. That maybe he had like a brother that was in like the same race. Right. But the rig is behind. Uh, but no, no, it is just a mirror. No, it is legitimately a mirror. And for what, if those wondering what uh, Lewis is talking about, uh, Dane Warren, when he used to be based in Australia, used to often race in the same room as his brother Ethan, who would be in the same races as him. So yep. it's one of those things. Where different teams, though. Different teams. Their rigs would be like pointed in opposite directions. So there was like a little bit of difference. So they're not like legitimately sitting next to each other. Uh, but a disconcerting experience, in my opinion. Uh, but they made it work, and they're a lot faster than me. So uh, kudos to them. I couldn't do it. I, I, like I said before, it's, when, I, when I'm racing, it's like, it has to be full focus. I, the only way you could really do it is if you had, like, I don't think you could do it with ultra wides because some of the ultra wides they don't come, like, far enough around, or, yeah, if you, right. even, like, even if it's curved. You'd need to do that on triple screen so that there's at least enough of the screen blocking, like, the peripheral vision looking over that way, just because it would be kind of distracting, um, especially, you know, when they get slightly animated due to an incident, um, which Ooh. is definitely something I would be... Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you get animated, you break your hardware, uh, and then people get upset that you're trying to give it oh, away. Whatever. It's not, uh, <laughs> is that is that is that about Kelly's uh, Jr.? <laughs> apparently, people are very upset that, you know, LAN events are tough on equipment. Like, I've commentated, fortunately, it wasn't live streamed, and it was just a private LAN with highlights being recorded afterwards, but uh, on an event where we had to stop a race because someone's wheel just didn't work and they were on pole position. Uh, and the rule mm. stipulated that we were allowed to swap out the rigs and whatnot. So, like, you know, things happen in these environments. And so, you know, uh, if anyone wants to win a Kevin Ellis Jr. broken wheel, uh, go on social media. There is avenues in which you can do so. Um, it won't work, though. Just be clear. It'll be yeah. a nice mantelpiece. I didn't, I didn't realize it was broken, if I'm perfectly honest. I didn't oh, read you that, wanted that it that much, so because that it worked. Much. Well, no, I, I haven't submitted into it anyway because, um, you know, um, I, I will uh, get a wheel from Kevin Ellis Jr., Personally, obviously, so when you obviously. joined the Apex Racing team, obviously, absolutely, but that one will work. No, I didn't realize it didn't work. That's actually pretty funny. Um, maybe it's a Kevin thing. Maybe they're just no. very harsh on wheels by just like slapping them around. Yeah, yeah, it's the other Kevin, unfortunately. Yeah, never, never get a signed Kevin Siggy wheel. You know it won't work. It's guaranteed. <laughs> I've never, I, honestly, I've, I've, I've commented on sim racing uh, a lot. Uh, in the last 10 years and I've seen a lot of sim racing uh, in, in that time I have never seen anyone br as brutal with a with a wheel as Kevin Ziggy <laughs> yep uh, it was funny on occasion where I think he's he has been asked at LAN events to be nicer to the equipment yeah right <laughs> which you know again if someone else has got to use that after you to the point I made where 
it lands are hard on the equipment. You know, it, it's not an unfair thing, I think, at times to be said, told. Uh, just be nicer to, to the wheel so that when you go to race, hopefully it's not uh, having issues as well. Left side of the screen, by the way, it's jumping between team names and driver names if you want to dial into the race. Two sources for timing. Timing.racebot.tv if you want the basic overview of what's going on. If you really want to dive in and be a bit of an anorak when it comes to data, well, Timing71 has you covered. You can look at all the stint lengths about what's going on, figure out strategies, and I'll probably be smarter than Lewis and myself when oh. it comes to some of those details. Yeah, no, if you, uh, if you do find stuff on the, uh, on the strategy, please drop it into the chat because we are far too stupid um, to have worked it out. So, you know, if you do notice things, you can let us know. Obviously, the, the, the joys of, of modern broadcasting and stuff. There's Twitch chat, there's YouTube chat uh, over on uh, Racebot TV, and uh, there's probably some larger moments. Oh, please don't hit the wall. It's not bad, Ooh. actually. That is not bad. That is from, uh, from someone who's raced Bathurst quite a lot. That's scary. It's not the only moment like that we've had, by the way. Going to take a moment for our uh, replay to cycle back, but just before the 71 was pulled out of pit lane, if Max Benneke can make that mistake, anyone is allowed to make that mistake and not feel bad about themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I've got to say, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a big old moment uh, at the top. Uh, obviously, I think Benneke by that point, that, that, I, they were obviously well aware that car was retiring, so it was probably just pushing uh, to the nth degree, just having a little bit of fun. Um, see, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I actually like quite like that mouse BMW, or if I'm sort of sat there and looking at it, being like, I'm not sure if I do like it. Then part of me's like, I do kind of like it though. I right. do like closer I looks flip -flop. have to be taken. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by. I actually really like it. I. Yeah. I'm trying to think about if there's anything that I don't like. I really like the black elements on the side, the way that it works. The front looks great as well. Like it kind of looks a bit like a mouse. Like, I know it's not actually a mouse, but it just, there's something about it that, that kind of works. Yeah, I, mm. I'm a fan of it. And I'm not just saying that because Lewis, I'm getting a mouse shirt. Oh, I've already got one. I know. You got the white one. Yeah, I'm going to have to see if they can send one. me one with BMW on it now, just to one up you. You see? I see. You're really forcing me to be demanding of poor Rene. I mean, um, I see. I, I've, I've been nice to him, though. Mouse are one of, the, one of the few teams that has their merch available for purchase. So I, 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 I have Lewis also bought a mouse hoodie. You bought a mouse hoodie? I bought a mouse hoodie. What it colors? Is it red? Very, it, yes. It's red. Sure, it's red. It's red. It's very, very red. And very yeah, comfortable. Yeah, it's got to be. Oh, it's already arrived. No, it has not. I'm just assuming. Oh, you just, oh okay. I was going to say, Christ. That's quick. Um, maybe you got like uh, some, some free express shipping. You know, run it. Woo! That I get the Red close. Line Express delivery service. Wow, that was... Uh, a, was that contact with the barrier from the 70? Should, should we go back and look at the replay? Oh, yeah. I oh, will, yeah. I will get it dialed up just for you, Lewis. That was, uh, that was as close as you want to get. I will say there is nothing more satisfying than going up towards McPhillamy and getting, you know... Like, uh, when I say within millimetres of the wall, I mean, like, within a millimetre of the wall. When you're hooking it up that close, you're just about getting onto the top of the curb. You're getting it really close to the barrier. Uh, like, that is unbelievably satisfying. Uh, I've frozen the camera in position. Ooh. I mean, if there's not contact, it's as close as you want to get. I think that's a 0x. I think mean, that is a bare minimum there's been a 0x <laughs> dotted on there. Just, uh, just, just a light one. Obviously, uh, there's, no, there's no damage on the car, uh, so don't worry, Redline fans. But wow, is that close. Okay, super slow-mo. Here we go. Nope. Oh, I mean, he's so almost, he gets closer at the end. <laughs> he almost has the mirror like riding up against the wall. Like that's about as perfect as that was. That honestly, that is uh, like I say, it's poetry in motion. That that's I, I love, I love seeing the cars get that close. It's why I quite like, I, I, I like Monaco. Uh, I always have oh, to like, no. I don't like the race. The race okay, is good, boring. Good. Right. The race is boring. But the, the, the Monaco Grand Prix qualifying. Right, yes. seeing them, okay. especially with the, especially with the changes they made to the swimming pool section was at sixteen when they uh, when they sped up the, the second part of it, right? And uh, how close you get, you all see those super slow mos of them literally grinding up against the wall, like seeing that, that's where you you realise how good, you know, obviously the Formula One drivers are, but like Formula Two, Formula Three, um, but you know, even like laps around Bathurst, where you realise how good of a driver some of these are when they can navigate. 
their way around the circuit for 12 hours, getting that close to the wall almost every single time. I think that's a fair point. And actually, to be honest, Monaco qualifying seems like an experience that everyone should try to be at at least once. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, I've been to the Indy 500 two years in a row now. Uh, this year, I'm trying to make sure I can go for qualifying weekend as well, just because I want to be there to see, like you say, the, the, the commitment, the skill, putting it all together, dancing that close to the wall. And, you know, whether it's sim or virtual, it's very impressive. Um, I still remember, you know, some of the static cams that we've had in some of our coverage of iRacing Indy 500s and open wheel 500 races in the past where, um, you know, you see just uh, out of turn one, in particular in turn three at Indy through the short shoots, just how close to the wall some of the drivers can get. Back over to 17th though, Altitude Esports and uh, Dennis Grabowski under fire from Beckham Jasir and the uh, Williams Esports Academy car, making it nice and obvious to pick them out with a bright yellow front nose. Yeah, exactly. I know uh, I've, I've seen a uh, like the fair shares of support for various teams out there in, uh, in, in, in this race. Did see that Altitude have had uh, their fair share of shout outs uh, during this one thus far. I'm sure Simi Fire have as well. I actually really like the signify livery uh, i've said that before time and time again on the broadcast great to see him doing uh, so strongly here this is going to be a move from the 144. he looks to the inside and forces the yeah. issue on the entro uh, entropic uh, pfbr car does go a little bit deep Whoa. and what a beautifully judged back up and under by martin siratek and now uh, david bosga is gonna have to watch his teammate mark perez sontek racing and sammy matty trogan next car in queue that's not the falcon livery car that's behind them that is lap traffic yeah no i was gonna say that. I, I actually thought the the 12 car the entropic uh, pfbr car i thought it was getting out of the way i thought it was like yep off you go lads uh, i'm just fuel set no 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 i'm gonna go for the up and under obviously brilliantly judged um yeah going through the exit of the chase there it's very well done. I wonder if there might be a move coming in for the Williams Esports Academy car, going very close up towards uh, the top of the hill, up towards Griffin's Bend. There's the look to the inside. Just here, it's going to send one in, and it is going to get past the altitude racing car. It was nicely done. Don't want to be on the outside. We've said it a number of times, and Grabowski gives up the position and tucks back in as they run up towards the cutting. And there'll be a chance now to try and close up to the Drago Racing 169 Ricardo Rico at the wheel. This is the Lamborghini for Sontec Racing, by the way. Um, Sammy Matty Trogan, uh, part of the outfit uh, that won in the Fuji 8-hour affair, not necessarily going their way. And the other thing that hasn't gone their way, I mentioned this with you, and yep. I don't know if he necessarily picked up on it, but boy, right away. however they unloaded the, uh, the wrap for this car, it didn't quite work out. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was, I was looking at it being like, oh, it's a bit dark, isn't it? And then I was like, look, I, I looked at it on my, <laughs> in my own game. I'm like, huh, that logo's upside down. Ha, ah, it's the template, right. I don't know if they've rotated the template and just saved it. So, because uh, surely, surely they've not submitted the template for the wrong, unless they could have submitted the template for the McLaren. This is what I'm going to look at right now. Is I'm, I've opened up. Is it the McLaren? I've opened up Racebot.media. Get your guesses out for which GT3 car they submitted that wasn't a Lamborghini because Lewis is right. The paint's loading because it's in the folder for the Lamborghinis. Um... Yeah, obviously the thing is the thing is with iRacing is that like they're, they're all square templates. Yes, right? they're so all theor identical. Theoretically speaking, you could load up the IndyCar uh, uh, livery on, on one of these. It, it will work. It will look terrible because it's not what the template's designed for. But the actual, like, the, the, the shape is exactly the same size as uh, Simify now finally do work their way past with both cars uh, on the Entropic PFBR car. Yeah, Martin Ziratek, unfortunately, unable to do much. I can tell you that maybe no surprise to hear that they submitted a paint scheme for a Ferrari. A then, Ferrari? But then with the way the BOP ended up working out with the 3% power cut right. that it got, much like Redline did, where Redline had to switch from Ferrari to Lamborghini, my guess is Sontec did the same. And so it does go to show that the iRacing BOP changes, which come as late as Wednesday or Thursday of race week, Lewis, do influence these drivers and influence how much preparation they need to do as well. God, I bet a Sontec Ferrari would have looked really good, actually. I do like, I did like the Sontec livery when we've seen it, um, you know, obviously in, in Sim, uh, at, at Fuji, like it looked really good. Obviously, you know, we know that it's a good livery, generally speaking, but um, yeah, to go back to your, your, your point of preparation and stuff, obviously, uh, it's not as if these drivers start preparing for this race Friday evening. Um, you know, for the race today. Uh, I think most don't. Um, 
when I did when I when I've done it, uh, I d I've done the Bathurst uh, 12 hour twice. Uh, and I did the 1,000 last year as well. And on those occasions, I'm pretty sure the maximum lap count for me was about 30 laps before we went into the race. Um, so, yeah, good sign, good sign, good sign. Cool stuff. Uh, they take it a little bit more seriously in top split. Just a little bit. It's a lot. Um, and so, obviously, their preparation... I, I don't, it's, it's not going to be the same as what it would be for, like, a, like the like PESC or whatever. Um, but... It's still a very high level of preparation that's been uh, pretty much a bare minimum for the last week. So you've been preparing to race in one car, and then you've had that all changed. Right, but pretty much to the last minute. Still a couple of days with these kind of drivers. It is enough time for them to work up the speed. Um, so like, I don't. I, I think it was kind of like it was, it was a little bit of a, a, a backward step for some of the teams, but nothing too major. And I guess you know, much like we often talk about a Daytona drivers have done enough laps at Bathurst yeah. at this point and enough laps in a GT3 car at Bathurst to be more specific so it's uh, small differences between the various manufacturers yes but nothing too different that they're uh, having to deal with and having to, to shift around going back by the way to the, the, the discussion that we were having about events at uh, Mount Panorama Steen Ledger says that the weekend this weekend in the real world where they're racing supercars counts as the same as apparently the the 12 hour it's all just combined into one so that's pretty cool i guess they didn't have to tear down any of the yeah. uh, the stuff although i did notice i'm not sure if you did lewis because i did watch part of the race last night uh, during the 12 hour race the elbow was the bmw m elbow yesterday when i was watching the pizza hut elbow the pizza hut now it is the pizza hut elbow they're very quick at changing Ooh. around the sponsors there yeah, but to be fair, and I know like with sponsorships on race day, because I, I never realized it until I, I went to a racetrack, which is, uh, well, I went to go and watch MotoGP in 2017. Right. And afterwards, yeah, you, 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 we did the whole track invasion. You, I, I went for a walk around service and I had a great time. Um, and the speed, when that race is over, the speed the advertisement is pulled down and sent straight back up again for the next event is crazy. <laughs> like, it is as quick as can, can be. Like, you know, they're, they're on the podium, they're celebrating, they're having a great time. Meanwhile, matey boy's going around like the hangar straight. He's taking down all the signs of it. It's like, oh, right. It, it just doesn't really feel like the race is actually over. So, yeah, you know, a, a week, um, yeah, it's, it's plenty of time to, to, so to take down a little bit. And you say that, it's fine. but how often do we then also change the name of the corner? Like, it, it's explicitly yeah. the BMW M elbow a week ago. It's explicitly the, nah. the pizza elbow this week, you know, in some no. brand of pizza here. No. It's Forest Elbow. Sorry, mate. Yeah, exactly. It's a Forest Elbow. Sorry. Uh, anyway. Sorry. Now we there, get... there, there's there's few circuits that I'll accept sponsorship as as like as changes, and that's only if it doesn't happen if it doesn't change consistently. The only one where we're allowing it to change consistently is a three fourths uh, George Simmons ring. Um, yeah, of course. That, that I'll, one. I'll allow that. I'll and some of the one. corner names I'm not allowed to repeat on this broadcast that came Goodness out of what me. was a wonderful six-hour charity race. So uh, just wanted to give a shout-out as well. Next weekend, I believe it is, or maybe the weekend after, uh, we have a fantastic... Uh, it's a 10-hour event for charity that's going on, I believe. So make sure you try and get involved in that. Some hardware for you to win in terms of prizes as well. Grid and Go correctly jumping in to say that, you know, there are some weird, magical things in the world of... Uh, television broadcasting so it's a lot of sports where you know sponsors are actually added after the fact in a lot of ways so you know the cameras grab the recording there's a bunch of stuff that happens then to produce a world feed and on top of the world feed every different individual country has their own different sponsorship on top of that uh, that is where technology really pays a part uh, in the broadcasting world there's so much that happens behind the scenes Lewis not just in the world of uh, real motorsport and real sport but even in the world of sim racing nowadays to make it happen uh, you can speak to your experiences with the likes of Le Mans virtual yeah exactly it's all uh, it's all it's all very technical it's all very uh, uh complex and stuff behind the scenes so that's uh, it's, uh it's, i don't know it's, it's, it's interesting isn't it I, I, I think like enough people that like you know watch watch broadcast and watch sim racing or watch you know motorsport and stuff i think sometimes i don't really realize how tricky and technical some of the behind the scenes stuff is, and that even comes down to things as as what seems like as glaringly simple as sponsorships and stuff but um it is what it is uh as is this is this i know mean, it's definitely for position but are either of these going short on fuel uh ooh, no can't, i can't remember no, no they're thinking about on the same strategy aren't they yes last pit stop lap pops up on the left side of your screen uh to give you a bit of a sense now of course 
most of the drivers actually pinning around the lap 60 marker yeah. uh, outside of those that didn't short fill. So as the screen flicks through the different names, top 10 pinned as well on the left side, so you can keep an eye. Actually, given that this race has had a low level of attrition, Lewis, it's important for us to see the stories happening through the field, especially knowing that traffic's going to be increasingly playing its part. Yeah, I mean, obviously, for the most part, we are focused on those in sort of like the top 10, top 20, um, just as as things happen uh, in, in races. But everyone that's still in this race, you know, they're, they're still desperate to get to the finish. They're still doing their own race. They're still desperate to get as high as possible. Um, and for some, lose as little eye rating as possible. So, yeah, there is that uh, uh, at play as well. Um, but no, I was only kind of bring up the strategy stuff because I, I was wondering, because obviously those that are on the... Um, uh, on the on the lower fuel at the moment, for example, like Diego Pinto and uh, Giorgio Vecchio, uh, as much as they're on older tyres at the moment, these cars are running faster at the moment than the rest of them because they're they're lighter um, right now. So uh, very interesting. I mean, you can see it there on the on the last lap, a three zero both uh, for the forty four and the seventy, uh, and then you know, point sevens for, for basically everyone else. Those. The 7 of the 20 didn't run particularly quick last lap times compared to the rest of the field, did they? No, and I wonder if there's an element of traffic involved in that. This lap by as well. It's another 203.6, uh, 666 for Pointer. Uh, that's gonna... so that's yeah. a little bit more normal. Uh, Lullum behind pretty, pretty much bang on, in fact, what Gianni Vecchio did. So uh, you're not wrong, though. I, I will just agree with you in that, of you know, over the first two hours we did see consistently the uh, low fuel load at the end of the stint really pay dividends with some quick lap times and so that's going to be a pretty constant ebb and flow that we uh, do end up having to keep in mind and uh, really have to just work our way through uh, especially as you get closer to the temperatures actually starting to rise when we start to really think about strategies it's only only 8 30 in the virtual morning here 24 degrees celsius where our track temperature started and three degrees Celsius might seem like a bit of a jump, but Lewis, when we're expecting it to get to as high as maybe 50, 55 degrees Celsius, we're still waiting for the real ramp up to occur. Yeah, exactly. You'll, uh, what will happen is it'll, it'll be like pretty much like an exponential because I would have expected it to have been higher at this point than it is now. Uh, but once it starts rising, it'll just keep, keep going. Obviously, it will drop off before the end of the race ever so slightly, but not, uh, you know, it, it won't return back down to sort of the. Yeah, the, the, the lower end of the, uh, the, the 20s. I'm not going to lie, I'd love to be 24 degrees out at the moment. Uh, I went for a little walk into town uh, earlier and it was absolutely freezing. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I am a wimp, so it's okay. Don't worry, it's not just you, Lewis. I noticed in the iRacing Esports Network chat that someone said that they can't wait for spring outdoor golf. They are sick of playing indoor golf sim, to which oh. my answer is, you have a golf sim? Well, Very, not you, the person. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I'd, I'd, I'd love a golf sim. Very uh, impressed. I love one. So, no, I, I, unfortunately, I've been, I've been playing Golf Plus a lot on, uh, on VR, which has recently had Bay Hill release onto it, um, which I've not been around yet. You're going to have so, to send uh, me a link to this VR golf title. Because it's, I, I was going to say, we need to play it together. Yeah, it is actually. It's pretty good. There's a VR cricket game which looks very good that I'm I've been that. trying not to get into. No, we're going to get you to play that. Um, cricket not good. That. Don't worry, Lewis. We'll get you into it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no. no, 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 no. I watched. I watched about one minute of cricket. Uh, this on, weekend, I know. On, yeah, it was on Monday or Tuesday evening, um, in in a sports bar, in the Belfry, and um, it ain't for me. It ain't for me. What I'm gonna say is, Lewis, uh, you know how we're commentating right now on endurance racing. Yep. It's a lot of not talking about what's actually happening, right? Right. Yeah, that is cricket commentary to a T. Is it really? Oh, it's amazing. Uh, there is one in particular. Um, uh, uh, it, God, I'm terrible with names when it comes to some of the people that I don't get to watch on broadcasters regularly. Kerry O'Keefe. I mean, I will send you some of the clips of this guy, Lewis. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, also would say a lot of stuff that would get us kicked off air. So let's take a hard left turn away from some of the, 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 the Kerry O'Keefe quotes and instead focus in on some of the drivers on track. No Max Verstappen today, but one driver that I called out as being very curious to see how he was going to run 
Uh, Sebastian Weldon, part, of course, of the BS Plus competition program. Lewis, me and you have actually seen Seb uh, in a handful of the digital Nürburgring Endurance Series races where he's been gaining some experience, of course, racing as part of the development program for Andretti Autosport in the real world, getting experience on the sim as well, and it's great to see. He's running very, very competitive lap times right now and keeping the Marla Racing car up inside of the top 10 and in front of the BMW M Team BS Competition sister car. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, that is, is the really important thing to note here, that um, it's a BS car, the Marla one this time. Um, just to really hammer that one home. Uh, but no, obviously, you know, it's, it's great to see, uh, uh, you know, the world name, you know, Sebastian Weldon. Like, I've, uh, I've, 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 I've seen little bits from um, DNLS. Obviously, I know you've seen a lot more. Haha, <laughs> pal. <laughs> Been confident on it. Uh, at least I hope, I, 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 I hope you have. Uh, I'm sure you get you know, some, some great names and stuff in there. Obviously, you know, we've, we've, we've seen plenty of them, um, you know, building their way up uh, in, in sim racing. It is always good to see some of the younger names, the younger talents and stuff. From the real world of motorsport uh, in sim racing and, and sometimes learning like th their craft like racing wise um in in the world of sim racing because it's kind of like it, it keeps the rust off on that side you hear it from a lot of drivers um in the in the off season they, they do sim racing to keep that rust off um but then also because it's pretty fun uh and if you are fairly new to the world of motorsport it's a great way to kind of like learn racing in a sense you know, even if you don't feel like you need to it's just keeping those skills sharp i obviously saw gianni vecchio into the pit then the number 70 which means the 44 will probably follow it fairly soon maybe two laps based on the last stint grand marjani brings the car in which by the way we have to call Gra uh, gianni grand marjani we have to call chris lull and silly lully silly lully yeah these are just the rules from team redline i don't control them unfortunately uh, who else is get who's the next one to get a nickname then oh uh, the, the team drivers have to tell us that's the thing oh i see yes. i see so we're not allowed to just, like, roll some out. I know these are the official internal uh, nicknames right. for the driver. I'm sure they probably have even more, uh, let's say, uh, interesting nicknames internally <laughs> for them. Yeah, let's, let's, let's make sure that... Let, let, right, Redline, let us know what they are, but make sure you're telling us the uh, appropriate ones. The ones that we can say on broadcast, e yes. Exactly. Uh, um, the ones that we can definitely say on broadcast. I, I because could, what's Max Verstappen's nickname? Come on, what do you think? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I do remember. I do remember once okay. uh, Neil Tussingfeld did. Uh, we did a championship where we were all like racing as as, as various names. I was obviously Rigsby Hufflepuff uh, because why not? Uh, both both names are digs at Oscar Hardwick, so I'm over it. Um, Neil's raced as Min Versplatten, which I thought <laughs> nice. was pretty funny because Max Verstappen uh, uh, again great. So maybe maybe that is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. That no, Diogo... I'm not good with nicknames. No, I'm not either, which is why we let the teams come up with them and we just steal them. Diogo Pinto comes in, interestingly, basically one lap after rather than two laps after. His teammate comes in, and that is a full 11 odd minutes before the top of the hour, even once you factor in the time it's going to take for Pinto to sit stationary and to get the service. So, I mean, as it's trending right now, Koita and Lalum dropped to about five seconds back just before the pit stops got underway. Even with that lighter fuel load allowing the, the gap and the separation to build, I feel like you probably aren't too stressed if you're in either of these two redline machines. It's kind of it's kind of one of those ones you're going for such a, an, an aggressive strategy. Um, as uh, Leo was also into the pit lane in the Altus uh, esports car as well. Um, it, it's one of those ones that. Whatever strategy you're going for, you've just got to commit to it. If you're fuel saving, commit to it. If you're not fuel saving and you're going absolutely to the limit of the racetrack, just commit to it. Going for the half five, like going like now and being like, okay, now we're going to try and fuel save and you know try and gain that time back. It uh, it might work, but realistically speaking, you know, nine times out of ten, it, it won't. You're you're kind of half committing to two strategies. Then. So they are just going to keep pushing. We don't know if it's going to work or not, right? We're, we're three hours into a 12-hour race. Have you noticed the gap between them on pit exit? Though? Yeah, exactly. big time. Almost a full four seconds coming out of the lane. Now, because Pinto didn't get as good a run out of turn one, it's come down to about 3.2 seconds. But that's significant between the two. And did that all come in the pit stop itself? I'm still trying to quite figure out what happened in terms of in-lap and out-lap. But they were only about a second difference from cone to cone. Yeah, I think I think the gap had already started building before they went in. Maybe we just didn't really notice it. I did notice the gap had grown. It had grown more so between those two than it has done between the uh, the, 
the seven and the 20. So maybe it is just like, we just didn't notice the gap um, growing uh, a little bit, but uh, alas, the gap has grown. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing for them. Obviously, they, they they don't have to work together in the same way that the 7 and the 20 do. Right, the 7 and the 20 kind of need to stay close because they need to be, you know, fuel saving a little bit, uh, meet, meeting the numbers, etc., etc. Whereas the other two, they're just going at it. So they don't need each other. They're just pushing as hard as they can. I guess it'll be interesting to see if through traffic they end up closing up to one another. And I guess we can have a, a brief livery watch right now, Lewis, just to clue you into this conversation as well. All the red line cars are basically identical. I'm not sure if you were here for our conversation slightly earlier, but can you tell the difference between the 44 and the 7? There is one small difference. Well, one's, one's got more blue on it, hasn't it? Do you know why it's got more blue? No, actually, I don't. I was going to ask. I thought it was an error, but I was like, mm, no, it doesn't seem like a... Well, maybe it does seem like a red line thing, but um, when it comes to livery submissions. But no, I didn't think it was an error. Why is it blue? So for the record, uh, that's a thing of red line in the past. They've been quite good about their paints as of late. Uh, that's, so, that's true. That's true. That's true. They, Sorry, red line. They, they, they may have forgot a spec map. Oh, so they have failed on the... Uh... They did, yes, unfortunately. Oh, so it is, it, is, it is a classic red line thing. Right, okay. Okay, I didn't know if they were playing... Because obviously, you know, there was that... Um, there was the, the, the 296 that had the red line. Yep. Livery. I wondered if it was going a bit more that route. And it was just like, I oh, know. Oh, to now we're talking them. about the amount of blue. Is this about the amount of orange as well, Lewis? Just admit no. it. Accept it. It was orange. It wasn't orange. It was brown. For those that don't they know. Changed what... it. They changed it. They... Like, it was changed post-event. post, post event. For those, I'm sorry, Williams. For those that don't know what we're talking about, Williams Esports Placey in the 24 Hours of Daytona a couple of, uh, we, almost a month ago now at this point, uh, Lewis and myself, uh, in the first, like, 15 minutes on the way, like, yeah. legitimately, uh, while there's still plenty going on, uh, got into an argument about whether the car was orange or brown. For the record, every single person at Williams, including the management, has messaged me to say yep. it was orange. But uh, Juan, the, the, the mensch over at iLiveries, decided that, you know what, if Lewis can't see color, then what we're going to do is make the color even more orange to make it, it even needed, more obvious. It needed to pop more, and now it does pop more, and now there is no question. Do you know who's just popped into the YouTube chat, Lewis? Oh, no. Juan himself. Oh, so they, it was, it was, it, look, I'm sure that the, the hex code was absolutely an orange. Um, and I'm sure at certain times of day, it was absolutely an orange. But at the exact moment that I brought it up, it was absolutely a little bit brown. These are the commentator excuses that you can sometimes hear on broadcast as well. Uh, Williams Esports, by the way, uh, two of them in a queue. Louis Nazar, uh, Daniel Lafuente, kept up behind Dylan Burris as we take a look behind the scenes uh, of two of their drivers. Must say, big shout out, big thank you to Williams for giving us a bit of the insight behind the scenes to their drivers, especially given they've got one of their team streams going on, uh, featuring a lot of these cameras as well. So uh, big uh, ups for them, sharing the view behind the scenes. And again, Daniel Lafuente is in a cupboard, isn't he? He's in a closet. Yeah, it's just... It's, I, well, it doesn't really matter when you've got a headset on. Although, to be fair, when it comes to communicating, this would cause a problem. It looks like a lot of hard surfaces in that room. It seems like, like I mean, like it just seems as though that's, that's going to echo like crazy. Yes. No. It Which would be fine, but could you imagine just the upshift? Just like, like, that, that's like that, that's definitely going through the mic. Ah, I see what you mean. Well, what I will say is I, of course, had the pleasure of racing as a Porsche All-Star um, oh, while commentating. Know. But the reason I bring it up, Lewis, is because I was worried that my shifter, I've got, you know, big magnetic shifters on my wheel that really do make a, a racket nice. So I was a little bit concerned. Fortunately, no drama. Uh, you can set your mics up nowadays to be quite sensitive. That's a look, by the way, at the Williams Esports team stream. I promise if you go over to twitch.tv forward slash Williams Esports, it won't be as blurry as that, and you can actually read some of the stuff that's going on, including the fact there's just been a change at the front, and Chris Lullum's taken over the lead from Sam Coiter. Interesting. Uh, obviously, maybe they're feeling like uh, they need to do a little bit of fuel saving in the number seven, uh, and so Coiter uh, will drop behind. Obviously, that would have just been up at the Griffins Bend, so uh, no major worries there, but the 20 now at the head of the field. 
uh, as we can see a few of the cars coming into pit lane, including the uh, grid and go, as well as uh, one of the BMWs. Is that one of the uh, BS competitions, certainly is? I think it's BS Turner, isn't it? Uh, no, it wasn't. That was Nathan Lewis uh, that we take a look at now. It was Ruben Bonga on the drums, leaving pit lane. A gleam of the sunshine got me mixed up between the asymmetric uh, asymmetric liveries. Juan Sanchez, the genius at our liveries, by the way, has just said, don't worry further about Williams' colors in the future. He cannot say more for now. Lewis, I think that's just a shot at you for saying that you're colorblind. No, I don't think it is. Yes. I think I think that's that's a sign that um, that, that that there are adjustments being made in future liveries to make sure that those colors do in fact pop. Tomato tomato? No. No. It just means that by my comments on a broadcast, I have brought change and prosperity. We are to... quite good at bringing change in some ways, aren't we? Yeah, most of it's negative change, though. Um, like, I don't know, I've been kicked off broadcasts. That's not happened yet. Not yet, um, not here on Racebot TV. No, it has been three years, though. Yeah, so... soon, soon. No, it's been three years already. No, oh, soon... you mean soon we're getting kicked off. Oh, soon right, you're getting it's... kicked off. Yeah, it's, yeah, so, yeah, it's, no, already, no. it's already past, uh, it's already past that time. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going nowhere. Uh, not anytime soon, unfortunately for me. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> our Juno Kenki party, Lewis McLeod, as we get ready to finish three hours in this uh, Bathos 12 hours, powered by Coach Dave Academy. want to give them a big thank you for coming on board. And uh, as they continue to make waves in the world of sim racing, Dave Perel, alongside his entire team at Coach Dave, I can only imagine how proud they are to now be officially sponsoring not just this special event, but plenty of the R Racing official series as well, including some of the Porsche Cup series as Daniel Lafuente into the box and nice and tidily up onto the jacks as well. Because let's not forget, fuel and tires done at the same time in these GT3 machines. Oh, you had to bring it up just to annoy me. Ah, so annoying. No, it's, uh, look, in future, I want fuel and tires to go. Well, actually, no, even if you did fuel and tires at the same time, limited tire sets. Done. Yes. Ooh, can you imagine? Done. You get eight tire sets for the Bathurst 12 hour. Done. Figure it out. Too many. Give them four. Give them four. Whoa, that's, that's not very many. I want oh, punctures is what I want. <laughs> Hot damn. No, I mean, I just, I, I've always said, like, when they when they brought in the uh, the limited tire sets, obviously I did, like, um, a lot, not a, a lot, a lot, but I used to do, like, a fair few of the um, uh, NASCAR I racing series races. And I remember when the tyre sets, the, the blow, when, when, like some of the rounds where you do get like quite limited tyre sets and stuff, it, it makes it so much more interesting. Because I remember doing like uh, the Xfinity race, obviously even back then it was, it was nationwide. Um, I remember uh, Dover, you just pit every time, just change tyres, every time, every single time. And uh, it, it was like at, at that point, because of how that race was, it was just, just, just change um, right side tyres, it was fine. When you get the limited tyres, you have to really strategize because you want a tyre set for left for the end of the race. So you want to prepare yourself for all this, that, and the other. It's really difficult. I would like to see a special event with limited tyre sets. Can I be honest? Bathurst in particular, because it is the one. Very much so. With out, okay, Watkins Glen has got warm temperatures, but it's basically warm for the entirety of the six hours, whereas here you get the you know cold at the start, very hot in the middle, and then cool at the end when you do start to see the drop off. So, you know, factoring all of that in is going to be quite interesting and unpredictable as to how that's going to play out as we've got more takers now down to the pit lane. Although still not up front, your top two red line contenders in their Lamborghinis continuing to set the tempo. And is Tristan Iglesias going to finally get out of the semi-fine number 33? Lewis, he's done a remarkable job three hours into this race and kept the car at the front and relatively clean. Yes, uh, again, it's still not the uh, the most impressive solo performance that we've seen in a top split eye racing special event, um, which still, Iglesias, by the way, stand by the wheel. Uh, it, it still is, and I, to be honest, I don't believe it will ever, ever really it? change, no. which was, uh, which year was it? Was it 22? Ooh. Uh, now, which year 20... did we did the start together? Was that 21 with the rain delay? There was 21, yeah, yeah. So then it would have been 22, yes. Okay, which is Govan Keen, who did 10 and a quarter hours um, at the start of uh, the race in one go. And um, in all of that time, kept that car in contention, which is ridiculous. Got out of the car for two hours, got back in the car and then binned it. But we're not going to talk about that bit. We only focus on the important bit, which was the entire, that very impressive first in the race. But still, Govan doing really well. 
in a certain sense, this track maybe requires more, uh, well, a, a fair amount more concentration than Daytona, uh, which is obviously you know, a, a, a fair cop. But I think there's a lot more rhythm around here, right? So you kind of, like over the top, you kind of just a little bit of autopilot. Yep, no, I, I think I agree with you. And that's why, again, I was saying earlier, you want to put your, once you get into a rhythm, leave the driver in as long as possible before their focus starts to slip. Uh, Daniel Lapuente has just taken warmer tires to pass uh, Reina Talbar in the BMW MT BS Plus competition. A slight undercut giving him the legs, the opportunity to make that happen. And the next target is going to be closing in on the Marla Racing Team car. Sebastian Weldon getting checked up behind the uh, WSR Esports butt kicker machine on his run out of the pit lane, just waiting for that number 23 to make its way into the box. The fact, though, that we've gotten beyond the top of the hour and we're still yet to see Mullum and Coiter, and in fact, a handful of those sitting behind, Apex, Door, two Williams Esports cars, and then plenty more yet to come down the lane. Goes back to the point, Lewis, where uh, Pinto and Vecchio in the other two red line cars came in 12 minutes before the top of the hour. They are at a real disadvantage. Yeah, things are starting to maybe be a little bit more concerning for the 44 and the 70. Um, obviously, those that will take over the race lead once this pit stop sequence is completed because uh, of how much faster and lighter they're running um, than the others. Obviously, they pick up a load of positions there, fair enough. But, you know, is this, kind of, is this the right strategy? It's one of those ones that we'll know in, uh, in nine hours' time whether it is or not. Right now, it doesn't look like it is. It doesn't feel like it is. I remember, you know, like strategically and stuff around here uh, we got told by a race engineer to save uh, one to maybe two laps of fuel if we could uh, per stint by by reaching a certain number which was very possible uh, and me and my teammate Dan uh, ignored that because we didn't want to do 12 hours of fuel saving and then we worked out at the end of the race that we would have saved a minute and 20 seconds wow from doing so that's not a small amount of time no and and, and and when you do so when you put it like that you're like okay so if you are going to go guns blazing that is the amount of time that you have to make up by pushing to the absolute limit now don't get me wrong we can tell that those two red light cars the, the you know the 44 and the 70 are going fast the rest of the field but even like coming into this uh, into this pit stop sequence for them as finally uh, sam coita comes into the pit lane from the race lead handing it back to chris lullan for another lap um the other two red line cars, though, they've gained, what, six or seven seconds in the opening three hours? That doesn't sound like you're gaining a, you know, a, a minute over the race. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the times recently in terms of uh, low fuel for the 20 and the 7, high fuel and uh, fresh tires for the 44 and the 70 in the red line camp. And last couple of laps, it's been six tenths of a second that the leaders have been able to claw back in. So you know, swings and roundabouts, we were talking about how at the end of the stint for uh, Vecchio and Pinto, they were going a bit quicker, extending that margin out. Let's see how it plays out. Now, there is a driver change taking place in that number seven machine. And so after only one stint, Sam Coitert's handing over to Ollie Steinbratt. And that's an interesting call there. Yeah, I don't, I don't fully understand that one, if I'm honest. Ooh. Goodness gracious me, Sontek had a spin and the Falcon car flying through on pit entry. Ooh. Is that car quite broken? I d that, the paint scheme it's is for sure. No, it doesn't look like it's tracking straight to me. Maybe it was just like a little bit of wobble coming in, but it didn't look like it was looking particularly comfortable um, on the way in there. So I wonder if there's been a little bit more to it. It could have been just a spin. Oh, no, it's not just a spin. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Instantly, I was like, oh, that trajectory ain't good. And then watch this. Oh, goodness me. I mean, okay, so let's take one more look at the incident. And then as the incident wraps up, we'll go on board with Luca Wanch for the Falcon Sim Racing team. Yeah, so obviously he just takes a little bit too much curb uh, over on the left-hand side, which throws it a car too far over to the right, uh, loses a little bit of grip. Uh, Wanch coming through. At this point, you're like, oh, my God. Uh, to be fair, that's fine. Uh, I, I will say the Bathurst pit entry itself like the actual you know, where it is pit entry and exit is absolutely fine but that pit entry is terrible um it's it's kind of it's a chicane which you do obviously scrum on speakers it's quite slow uh, on the pit because of it being a, a road uh, a street circuit fair enough um but that chicane it, it's it's very much like the singapore sling yeah, yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that. Literally, we were—I was talking about someone 
uh, with someone about how we needed to add a complex like the Singapore Sling. More in joke than anything else. Uh, pit stops underway. Did seem as though, by the way, the Williams Esports uh, uh, machine that went into, uh, that stayed out rather, Louis Nager, got a bit of an advantage because Dylan Burst got checked up behind a lapped car that came down to pit lane. So, Ben Q, the Fanatec cars for Williams Esports, going that lap longer. There's Lullum just waiting now to be released. Pinto Vecchio find themselves back out in front of Steinbratt, and no surprise to hear that. It'll be the margins, Lewis, that we have to watch off and away from the lane. Yeah, also uh, driver swap again for the number 99. Alex Dunn uh, getting back behind the wheel of the Apex Racing team car. Obviously, Luke Keaton did the last two stints. Alex Dunn had a very impressive opening uh, stint to the race. I did notice that. Uh, he gained like five five or six positions in that first, it might be five, uh, positions in that first stint. It's actually very impressive. It is really quite tricky to, uh, to make up positions, especially when everyone's just in one big train around here. It. It's just the, the big slipstream. Uh, everyone, everyone's uh, you know, pulling the next car off and the next car and the next car and the next car, uh, and it just goes all the way down the field. Um, uh, and so, you know, for Dunn to have worked his way through the order there is, is very, uh, it was very impressive, so we'll see what he could do behind the wheel now of uh, the Apex Race team car, but really the focus of attention is definitely on Team Red Bull, because now, well, they're, a bit, they're a bit too good, aren't they, at the moment? Now, this is not um, a double Red Line sandwich. Again, pedantic about our sandwich terminology here. This is the Red Line bread. breaded sandwich, so it's double breaded uh, with the Drago Racing filling in the middle. Margin between fourth and eighth, if you do the math and tot it all up, is going on around five, six seconds, so a gap between the, the, the two groupings effectively, relatively unchanged. The main sequence uh, that's changed, or rather the main change in the sequence that we've just seen is uh, Vecchio and Pinto getting slightly separated from one another. And that number 70 machine now flashing the lights and trying to get past some lap traffic. Nazar's come into pit lane, expect Roboski to dive off in as well. Ricardo Rico will probably pit, if not this lap, the next lap by. And Maybe the 69 Emmanuel Troncoso as well. I am amazed though, Lewis, that there are some cars that are being able to go almost 10 minutes beyond the top of the hour. I say fuel saving around here is, is, is fairly possible. They're just trying to shrink that, uh, that final um, stop of the race, of course, because realistically at this kind of pace, they're not going to be uh, shaving a pit stop off. Uh, that said, as we've brought up before, the, 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 the hotter the race gets, the easier it will be to fuel save around here. Um, but uh, we, we've not been going up in the uh, in, in that in that sort of the, in, in the temperature rate that we would kind of require um, for that. It's up to 28 degrees tractive. The last time we checked, which was a fair while ago, fair enough, it was, it was 27 degrees. So we've gone up a single degree track temperature. The ambient temperature has not gone up a single bit um, in that time. It was about half an hour ago when we last took a look. So it's not going up. I'd say it's almost it's not going up as fast as some of the teams would have expected. And I wonder if that's going to play a little bit into uh, into some of their strategies. Yep. I think we're probably going to be in the situation when, when we reach 11, 11 a.m. virtual standard time. That's when the temperature is going to be hovering at around just under 40 degrees. Uh, and then right around 1, is, 1 p.m is when you expect the, the peak of the temperature uh, to really end up being as they continue just to roll around traffic well and truly now has uh, mixed itself on through. There's only 36 cars left on the lead lap uh, of 44 that are out there and still running. You talk about manufacturers as well, still a little bit uh, mixed up, of course, in terms of sequences as we wait for one driver uh, and team to make their way down to pit lane from the podium spots. But uh, outside of the Lamborghini dominance from Red Line, you then have Porsche, uh, Mercedes and BMW all represented in the top 10. So it's good to see that, you know, I know the Ferrari Lewis got its 3% power cut, maybe a bit more than some teams thought was uh, maybe appropriate for it. But for the most part, we've got a healthy mix of the manufacturers. Yeah, the, the, the Ferrari maybe got too much of a hit, but, um, you know, Fair enough. Uh, Got to say, though, the uh, the BOP looking certainly a lot more balanced uh, around here than it was at Daytona, um, which is always a, a great sign. Uh, I know there is the, the, the discussions that it's because this circuit gives 
um, a lot more positives and negatives. So it's not just a, you know basically what's your top speed and how do you get to it, um, which is kind of what it is at Daytona. You know, yeah, sure, you might have the fastest car on a straight line, but it might be pretty bad over the top. You might have cars that are faster going up the hill, uh, but they're not quite as fast and that that down bit. Um, you know, run through through Skyline and. Uh, the different that lot. There are some cars that might just take that really, really nicely, and that's kind of where the the, you know, the balance is a, a lot greater around here. Obviously, if you take a quick look at that, you know, and ignoring the team names, you'll think, well, Lamborghini is very clearly the best car around here. But I would argue it's probably a little bit more on Team Redline. That one, Drago Racing, getting sent by the Apex Racing Academy car. Whoops. That seemed like the intimidation factor more than anything. Just uh, I'm sure there was contact. Was there? Okay, well, jump on board with Mini. That's not Mini Gear, excuse me. There's so many different cars in this field. I'm trying to figure out who they are on my Terrible timing broadcast screen. Direction. Terrible broadcast director behind the scene. So that was a lapped car then, if I remember correctly. Oh, so if no. there was contact, just makes it that a little bit worse. Oh no, I'm, I'm just because of how the 969 reacted, I'm pretty sure there was contact. So we'll go on to the break. Am I mean, you're right? No, oh, no you're you right. <laughs> no, no, I, I like, there's, there's miles between them. Like, no, I, I will say one thing. Um, because of where the Drago race, they were a little bit further off the line, which meant they had to scrub off more speed to bring it down to the apex. Um, by just turning in a little bit too late, maybe it's cold tyres, etc. That might have been a little bit unpredictable for the Academy car because you saw how much speed. Like, I don't feel, had there not been the Drago Racing car there, I don't feel the Apex Racing Academy car would have missed the Apex. So I don't feel it's them missing the braking point that it's more the Drago Racing car scrubbing off a little bit more speed than was expected. But that doesn't mean it's not the Academy car's fault, right? It's just kind of like, I'm just trying to explain the reason as to um, uh, as, as, as to why that might have happened. Because I don't, I, don't I, th I think they would have hit the Apex part. I'm going to make a really terrible joke right now. Don't. Um. Don't do it. I, I, I kind of, I, I feel I know where you're going to go. Oh! Before okay, you, distract no, me. No, Come you, on, let's no, go. No, 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 make the joke, make the joke. No, 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 distract me before I go somewhere okay. really bad. Okay, Apex Racing 99's into the pit lane. Good, I'm uh, glad again. you spotted that too. I'm not sure what's happened to Alex Dunn, but straight back in, and there's a black flag associated with this one. Building in pit lane, clearly. Uh, well, yeah, it would be. Yeah, would, and on exit, stop yeah. 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 So I know sometimes like, if you if you jump behind the wheel, maybe the pit limiter doesn't activate and it doesn't take very long to get up to, the, to, to, to pit road speed here. That is a huge hit for the Apex Racing Team number 99. Alex Dunn obviously going to be a Formula 3 driver uh, this year for the MP team. We'll leave the pit lane now, but that's, uh, that's a big shame for them. Let's see if we can go back and take a look at the replay of the pit exit to see where, in fact, that uh, speeding penalty was uh, incurred. And yeah, I'll go ahead and make the joke. Uh, yeah, you've got to. You've got, you can't tease everyone. No, like uh, you could say that uh, DC Moore needs a little bit of uh, coaching to get to the Apex. Also very good. <sighs> He's in the academy for a reason. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this, that's terrible. Uh, I know, but that is that is, right that is poor. Right that there. is poor. To be fair, uh, I'm saying that, but I'm I, I'm assuming that, that I'm, I'm doing a broadcast as well between uh, now and then the end of this race, doing another one uh, where there's a driver in it called Gaspar Mish. Uh, oh. You can kind yeah every time. It's like oh he's missed the apex. Oh he's had a bit of a mishy. Things like that. So, we're well riding on board with Alex Dunn. Oh, my. Did he just press it too early? So, he's not got the limiter activated, and legitimately, he's got too greedy with his right foot. Alex, you silly boy. He's gone and done it. I mean, can you see it? You could... That, it's so tight, that but looks yes, like a so silly. legitimate case of uh, if the transponder was placed in the car slightly differently, he might be okay. Oh, Alex, mate. Transponder discussions on a sim racing broadcast. Can you believe? God, it's not the first time we've had that this year. Well, I'm not sorry, this year it will be, but um, <laughs> we, had it, we, had, we, had, we had it a few times last year. I know. Uh, let's go with that. And it wasn't frustrating at all. No. Nope. Not even a little bit. Nope. I didn't nearly pull my hair out. No, it's, it, it, like I say, silly, silly there from, uh, from, from Dunn, but again, I guess, uh, I guess an easy mistake. We've all uh, spent well, done it. It feels like such a harsh crime, though, because probably would have gone maybe a couple of kilometers an hour over the actual speed limit and then had to come in and do a stop and go. Absolutely brutal. And it's a 16 second, 16 second stationary as well. I mean, total uh, time lost close to 40 seconds, not factoring in the. Uh
pit entry that you've got to navigate your way through. And it goes to show again, if someone like Dunn can make that mistake, anyone can. It's so easy to do. And uh, it's, the, it's the risk that you take when you run without a limiter and you're trying to be aggressive as well on trying to uh, get off the, off, the, off, the, off the pit lane. But why? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's the whole thing like, why wouldn't you run with a pit limiter? And you go, well, it's because, you know, the pit limiter will take you to 59 kilometers an hour, whereas, you know, if you're not running with it, then you can go to 60 or you, you need to sneak past to 61. Uh, and you're just kind of like, that, it's just, it's not enough time. It's not enough time over the entire, like, you might gain maybe a second over the entire race in every pit stop you come in. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it just, to you and me. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not worth it in... in, in <laughs> Look how much it just cost you! Oh, no, I agree. Just press the button, mate. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate, and it yeah. really hurts. It really it, does. It just... It, it, it's the kind of stuff that just will not make a difference. So... Even at this level. Here's where, you know... One thing just to remember is a lot of the, the, the time people forget our racing's roots of, are, of course, with NASCAR 2003. Yes. Such a legendary game. And so a lot of the systems are, are centered around oval racing. I don't want to say they're built for oval racing, but, you know, that's where a lot of the focus initially was in developing. And so as the years have gone on and some of those systems have been uh, evolved and made more dynamic, the pit road limit is still an average speed limit so like they, they measure certain zones in the lane if you're as long as you're below the average you're totally fine that's of course because in nascar you don't have a limiter and so you're you're, you're relying on rev lights effectively to judge your speed and how close to the limit you are out on, on pit lane in the real world of gt racing though lewis as far as i'm aware speed speed limits are pretty black or white you're either below the limit or you're penalized for it Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's the same with pretty much every bit of road course. Uh, if, if you, so say for example, you know, if, if, if you're not fully aware of this, um, but let's say for example, you speed on the way into pit lane here, right? And uh, you're over by 10 kilometers an hour. If you slow down enough in that opening portion, you will potentially avoid a, a speeding in the pit lane penalty. Right, but you have to you have to do it, you have to react pretty quickly, uh, and you see that in NASCAR a lot where like, they'll come into pit lane and they'll slow down, they'll go below the speed limit and then accelerate back up to it, um, uh, and like th th this is this is fairly common because of the, the segment the system they do the average speeds over. Uh, like I say, in, in real life, if you're speeding on the way into pit lane, it doesn't matter how much slower you go after that point. If you've been speeding on the way into pit lane you've been speeding i know with the segmented system as well there's there's that whole thing of like because you've been stationary in your box for a longer period if you accelerate you've got a small section where you can get above the speed limit yes. if you drop it back down again straight afterwards uh and so the gamesmanship is real when it comes oh to, yeah to some it's of all these, calculated exactly some of these elements that uh, teams spend so much time trying to figure it out we uh, glimpse uh, camille grabowski off into the grass and gravel Hi. I got to say, good job to hold on to it, avoid making that any worse than it could have been. Nicholas Mateo says, thank you very much. That position's mine. They did, I think they both brushed the... No, I can't believe they didn't. I thought they did brush the wall a little bit before they got into the filament, but no, they were okay. Um, easy mistake to make over the top. Even drivers as cool as Scott McLaughlin did it, although they did grab pole positions, that's fine. Um... You know, dip, dipping a wheel or two up, up at that point in the track, it's fun. It's exciting. It's, uh, All four is probably not great. No, yeah. Once you get too far into the gravel as well, let's not forget the way the iRacing gravel model has been updated. It slows you down a lot more, uh, which is great in a lot of ways, right? It's good realism, uh, as Luca Wanch uh, gets passed by Manuel Troncoso. The thing that's maybe bad about that change, let's be honest, Lewis, is a tradition at the end of these races is now gone. Yeah. Luca Wanch, Manuel Troncoso, they might be fighting in eight hours and 40 minutes time on the checkered flag lap. Uh, but at the end of the race, they won't get to take the traditional Bathurst jump. Yeah, which uh, a friend of mine didn't believe me that that's, uh, that's the case. Because I couldn't remember if the... Um, I, I, part of me for a second, I, I, I was doing a race around here and I remember, that you, I, I remember that you couldn't do the jump, but I couldn't remember as to why. And I didn't know if they just like removed, like they, they just flattened out the bump where the, where the jump was. As soon as I went to the ground, I was like, oh yeah, they slowed it down. I remember that. Uh, it is disappointing because I, th I feel that we are robbing the, the future generations. The, 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 the future, yeah, exactly. These newcomers to the world of iRacing, racing, we are robbing them the opportunity of the most horrendous post-race crash that money can buy. Um, so iRacing, racing, 
I think we need to have um, a, a vote to the community that all the gravel tracks fine, fair enough. We're slowing them all down, makes sense. I don't want to roll that back because it works in a positive way uh, in so many places. But we need to make that gravel trap faster. At least the dead straight line. I, I don't know how you'll do it. I, I'm not a coder. I'm not a genius. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't deal with that. But there needs to be at least a portion where you don't scrub off speed, so you can still do the jump. So I am both. Just a, saying. I am both a coder and therefore a genius. So that's how it works in the software nope. engineering world. Um, <laughs> how hard would that be to do? How hard it would be to no, like that even, area? I've got an even better idea for you. Perfect. Instead of doing that, rocket boosters. Oh, that is a great idea, actually. But no, even simpler. Once the checkered flag has flown and every uh, car has crossed the line, yeah. let's just turn off the thing that makes the gravel slow you down. See, now that's, that is why you do the whole coding stuff. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Genius, right? Yeah, yeah. top tier genius. No, I'm like, Lewis again. Lewis McLean has just admitted I'm a genius. There we go. I know. Uh, no, I, uh, no I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Anything to make the, to, to bring the jump. Hashtag bring the jump back. Okay. Hashtag make the jump great again. Make the jump great again. I mean, come on. I, I will be honest. Uh, I, I have won this. It's one of the few special events that I've actually won before. I love it. It's oh. great. But okay. you know it's what like I love come, more than... Come the breaks, big man. I've won it once. I've not won it multiple times. Come <laughs> on. I won seven <laughs> split as well. I'm not hyping myself up. Uh, but the point being, I, as much as I loved winning the race, you know what I loved even more? The jump. Yeah, the jump afterwards, after 12 yeah. hours. Yeah, I don't think me and Dan did it in, uh, in 2021 out of pure fear. Because of the zero X and you didn't want because to ruin it. it. Exactly. Just in case. A Even zero X effort at Bathurst. Was, I know you got plenty of zero X car contacts with the wall, but again, yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah. give you your credit. That's not a. That's a pretty good effort. It's, it was. Uh, it was tough. Um, but no, look, like at that point, it is just sort of like, even though the entire race is finished, and I'm pretty sure if you get an instant after the race, it doesn't matter because it doesn't get put on your license. I don't remember. Um, but we were so like, absolutely not. Not a chance. I'm pretty sure we came out of turn one, pulled straight off, and then hit escape. Just to, 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 to cancel out any risk. I mean, at least you share something now in common with Max Verstappen, right? That is true. You, that is true. You both completed the Bathurst 12 hours. You both won the Bathurst 12 hours. We didn't win it. Oh, you didn't win it? No. But, okay. You both finished again, it with zero, zero X. Again. There you go. There was 2,901 teams across all time splits. Now, some people will be like, oh, we completed without zero X, but they did other time splits and got instance of those and then just tried again. So it doesn't count. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, but there was 2,901 teams entered into the 2021 Bathurst uh, 12 hour and just two had zero instant points. So um, I will take that stat to my grave. I don't care that it was three years ago. Uh, don't worry, I still mention all the time that, you know, 2020, I racing Sebring 12 hours. I once qualified one second off of Josh Rogers, you know, in top split. Which is, which, which is impressive. Oh, which I'm just going to say. very impressive. We, we were talking about limited practice. Uh, that was very limited practice. I will genuinely, uh, that was, I think, my best qualifying lap ever. And I've had some decent qualifying laps, but that was my best one ever. And it happened on about 60 minutes of practice. So if you put some work in, maybe you'd have been faster than Josh. No, Rogers. I would have been worse. That's what we. Oh, oh I see. No, I, I, I've had this. I've had this. This thing. Like uh, we talk about, like limiting practice and stuff for various champs. And stuff, and stuff. I am all for it. If that, that it, it's almost impossible, and yeah, for various reasons in sim racing, it is, it is basically impossible. Um, but I am all for the idea of reducing or limiting practice as much as possible because uh, I do actually think it makes you a better driver by limiting practice you're you're more adaptable if you can limit your practice um it, it, we've we've had you, we've all seen it in races and stuff where like a car has gone through a corner um, and then the car snaps and they bin it into the barrier and always they're like huh it never did that in practice you've practiced too much then because you're not ready for the car to basically do anything at any point right yeah. whereas when you haven't done enough practice you're kind of ready for the car to kill you at any point when you've done too much practice and you think you've done everything, that's the real danger. When you're not yeah. ready, right? If you do practice and you know that, oh, still, 
new things might happen. You're in an okay spot, but dangerous to assume Ooh. that you understand everything. Dangerous to assume as well that through the chase and on the run into the heavy braking zone that on the curb, you're not going to get squirrely. Sven Haase does a decent job not to lose the back end of that car as it wiggles on the curbs. Eduardo Leo through to 13th spot in the Lamborghini as they fight their way through. That virtual coach machine, of course, trying to fight its way back on forward. And behind the wheel is one of the drivers with Lewis. I've got to mention it. 11,000 die rating. Who's got 11,000 die rating? Sven Haase. Oh, does he really? 11,413 I ratings. Is it that high now? <sighs> oh my goodness. Who's the, who's is it? Who's the highest? These I have days? to go and look. I will do my research. I will do the needful. Yeah. I did. I I, I, I was talking uh, to to a couple of people over the last uh, you know, couple of weeks and stuff, uh, and we were discussing about um, you know I rating and, and all that. And we were discussing you know how many drivers are over 10k I rating, and they were like, oh yeah, isn't it something like um, like 12, 15 hours? I was like, oh no, it's well above 30. Couldn't they, they, uh, they couldn't believe me. It's getting up there, isn't it? It's scary. Yep. Um, give me. Uh, I'm just waiting for the correct page to load. Oh, nice. Yeah, the iRacing the iRacing website. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm, I'm going, going to the, I'm going the iRacing racing website to do this because I know where it is. There, I don't know where it is. In the I don't. New think, yeah, I, I don't think you can do it in the new UI. Can you not? I, but this is this is where like the whole thing of the the, the reason why the website's still there, isn't it? because it's, yeah, it's, it's much easier to go through. Well, yeah. It, it's it's. I think it's far easier on the website to go through like old race statistics and all that kind of stuff. Like it's just. But maybe that is just because I'm an old man and know where it is. <laughs> Um, more change. likely that is the case. Yeah, what is change? Okay. Exactly. Two questions for you then, Lewis. How many cool. drivers are there with more than 10,000 I rating? That's question one. 30. Um, go ahead. 36. Ooh, you're not far off. 38. 38. Woo. Second question. How many have 11? Uh, so I didn't realize Sven Haas was above it. So I feel like I would have said beforehand, I thought it was two. Uh, I'm going to go with four. How? I mean, you're right on the money. Aaron Vasquez, Sven Haase, Gustavo Ariel, and Cam Eben, who, if you don't know who Cam oh, right. Eben is, he spends a lot of time doing MX-5 sort of racing, uh, both in the real world and virtual worlds as well. So uh, you may not know him. You may in the future. Yeah, no, I didn't I didn't realize uh, that Cam was going to be the other one. I thought, like, obviously, you know, we knew Gustavo Ariel was, was number one in Bathurst. Is he still number one uh, in, in Daytona? Is he still number one now? No, that's Aaron Vasquez. He has got oh, sorry, yeah, there was Aaron a grand Vasquez. total right. of 11,424 I ratings. Uh, Gustavo Ariel only has 11,118. Only. Right, only, only, only. So now we're at the point where, you know, who's going to be the first driver to get 12K? Uh, obviously, the first driver to have got 11K no longer has it um, because of nicknames. Um, Max Bennett although did a favor to the world when he dropped back from 11 to 10K. 10k Benike makes sense, even though you have to say his name wrong. To do yeah, it. It, 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 it makes sense. Um, oh, but then, but then back then we were saying Benike rather than Benike. No but that's fine. Um, before my time. Fine. Look, look, we can. We, look, we're all we're all able to uh, to correct it. Was not before your time. It was, not, it was definitely um, not before my time. Uh, <laughs> that, I, I wonder though if uh, if Max now. Woo, that was a bit wide for Marcel. Just uh, a bit. I wonder, I wonder if um, Benneke, though, is going to go back above 11k if he's going to start refocusing on iRacing now. Good point, a actually. If we do see him, you know, could end up uh, getting a couple more drivers up to that 11k threshold. I would assume that 12k probably down to Vasquez, Hassel, or Ariel. Uh, just knowing, you know, volume of races is one thing. Uh, then there's the results that you get within those races. And Never say never. Cam Eben could be the one, couldn't he? He could. Could he, be. He could just sneak through in his MX-5. Honestly, he snuck to 11, uh, so you never know. There's that moment. Such a big one from Hazard over the top. It doesn't look like much. It really doesn't look like much from the onboard. It just kind of looks like a, a normal racing line. From the offboard, you kind of really get it. And I'm sure from Sven Haas' uh, inside his brain, that is a big moment. It's when you get high-sided on the curb where things get dangerous. You basically lose directional control of the car on occasion. And good hands, good uh, reactions to bring it back uh, underneath him. And as we get ready to close out another 30 minutes of this race, it's still red line one, two, three, and four, but increasingly with the separations 
uh, starting to open up. Let's give you a bit of a race recap then uh, in between some pit stop cycles and with 100 laps officially in the books of this iRacing Bathos 12 hours presented by the coach Dave Delta. Redline and Pinto currently sit on top and then Redline and Vecchio, Redline and Lullum, Redline and Steinbrat. And yes, it has been domination from them in their Lamborghini so far. Simufi have been the team that really taken the charge most to them in some ways after getting up past the virtual coach grid and go machine they have been able to try and close onto the back of Steinbrat and only sitting six seconds adrift and slowly pulling away from some of those behind including including the chasing pack of the likes of Louis Nazar in the Williams Esports Ben Q car and the Mahler Racing Team Machine Sebastian Weldon who this year is going to be off racing in USF Juniors on the road to Indy under some pressure as Williams Esports Shield Blast and the BMW M Team BS plus competition entries start to put the pressure on final car in the top 10 it's the dory sports lamborghini and of the 48 that started 43 still out there and running of whom 33 still on the leading lap arjuna kanki party lewis mcclade walking you through the action right now and lewis it's that time in an endurance race where we often spend a lot of time talking about anything but the race itself but it's also because the drivers are doing anything but fighting on track they're settling into their rhythms and trying to stay out of trouble have we been talking about anything about the race over the last 90 minutes? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, because I mean, we, we, we've already spoken about cricket and golf. We've already bored off the audience to death, so uh, Only that's the golf fine. part of that conversation was boring. The cricket part was the crawling. Cr cricket is a terrible sport. Although, sorry, I shouldn't really say that because it's Australia. Sorry. Uh, cricket is a great sport. Um, uh, look, we'll, we'll talk about Bathurst and how it's the number one uh, circuit on planet Earth. Is it? Do you really think it's your favourite track of the, in the world? Yeah. Not a bad shout, I'll say. The thing is, like, I still maintain it's my it's my number one, but it's kind of like, it's not, I, I, I've made this like my top five. Okay. And I know the top five in order, but it's kind of like, uh, they're all different. So it's kind of like, they're, they're all like they're on the list for a different reason. So it's fine. Do you, do you want to know why the way, why cricket is so great, especially here today? Oh, don't. No, no, no. You want to know why? why? <laughs> Go you know, on then. Do you know who that is? This very happy chappy over here. No, no, I do not. No, you don't. No, nope. it's Mark Tubby Taylor, Australian cricket legend. I've been saving that one for quite a while. I'll be completely uh, honest. Uh, I, you know, I've already seen you highlight him, and I have no idea who it is. Uh, so should I double highlight him? Yeah, go for that it. That was a really bad highlight. That's <laughs> terrible. That is terrible. What's your, okay, everyone in chat, what's your top five uh, circus on planet Earth? Uh, yes. Arjuna, what, what's yours? Do you, do you, before, actually, because I, I guess not many people I know immediately. Do you know what your top five circuits are? Okay, so, I mean... Okay. I know like okay. I know a few of them. <laughs> this is where, genuinely, I have to actually say, I think I have a different list. Because there's right. track... Lewis will appreciate this as well. There was a three-week stretch... <laughs> Back in, oh, actually, a full month, effectively. The month of July in 2021. Uh, where, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't do a broadcast. We couldn't commentate on a race that wasn't GT3 cars at Spa. Yep. And so, quite honestly, as much as I, I love Spa, the, the three-way moment, Mika Hacken and Michael Schumacher and Ricardo Zonta, is what I think made me fall in love with Formula One because I had the Formula One 2001 video game. It came with a season review of F1 2000. And so I just watched that DVD on repeat, especially the race at Spa. Love it. Before right. you were born. <laughs> Good point. Uh, but if you ask me, is it on my top five list? I will say absolutely not. Mainly because I am so, I am so bored of commentating at Spa, which is crazy to think because it is one of the most special tracks in the world. And I recognize that every time I watch a real race there. Yeah, no, I mean, look, look Spa is, uh, is an amazing track. It certainly isn't in my top five, um, but it does race a lot better than any of the circuits in my top five. <laughs> Come so, on, give it to us, give it to us. Okay, uh, number one, we're here, Bathurst. Bathurst okay. Uh, number two, I, I want to see, can you guess number two? Obviously you should be able to. Should I? Yeah, it's Norge Lifer. Oh, okay. Uh, number three is Road Atlanta. Okay. And number four, is the Snake from Mountain Circuit, obviously the TT. Gotcha. Because it's absolutely ridiculous and bonkers. Uh, and number five, and I'm really sorry, uh, is Monaco. 
Oh, yeah, you should now, be sorry about that one. No, 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 the, you should the be The reason, sorry. there is a reason, right? Uh, of those five circuits, they're all giving you something which you cannot find at any other track on planet Earth. Okay. Right? Now, yeah, to, to, and, and all five of them, when you're hooking up a lap, when you're actually getting a lap right around the circuit, it is a feeling unlike any other circuit. If you get a lap right around Spa, it's like, yeah, cool. I've, okay, right. cool. Okay. But a lap right around Monaco, a lap right around here, nah, that hits different. Fair. I, I, I think that is a very worthy list. And I am going to be, I'll, I'll be clear here. I know sometimes on broadcast we play characters, Yes, characters in which, you know, we pretend to be very staunchly against X, Y, or Z. So the re reality is, both Lewis and myself, we enjoy basically anything motorsports related. We just enjoy having an argument as well, just as much as we enjoy motorsports. Um, we love an argument. We do love a good argument. Um, so my top two, I think that's pretty obvious. I know a lot of people will know Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the North yep. Life. There is nothing, genuinely, not been to the North Life yet, top of my bucket list. But I've been now to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway like five times in the last three years or something. Uh, there is nothing quite like it, genuinely. Yeah. The, the feeling you get when you walk into the, 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 the pagoda. And then the museum is its own little special place. I'm so sad it's closed this year. It's part of the you know thing that you have to do every year when you go. Uh, it'll be, be open back up in a couple of years' time and even bigger and better. So IMS Norschleife are top two. Three for me. Road Atlanta. Road Atlanta. Yeah. So exactly. So so far we're actually pretty aligned. One, two, and three. I, you know, Bathurst. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't believe India up there, but yeah, no, I'm with you. No, Bathurst. Swap it for Indy. You know, I, I think. Yeah, exactly. It's fair enough. It, you know, different thing. From there, I get, I find it very difficult actually. I've been to Daytona yeah. now. A lot of people have Daytona at the top of the list. <laughs> no, exactly. I hate it as a racetrack. I, 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 I say it during the 24-hour races. I'm glad that we go there once a year for the 24 and exactly. never again. Um, exactly. What I will say is watching races there, though, Lewis, fantastic. You just go up to the top of the grandstands and you can see everything. It's a great place to watch. And so I have, I would recommend people go there to watch a race. It's just not on my top five. Yeah. Once I think about the top five, I'm going to get some stick, I think, for some of them. Okay? Yeah. So number nice. four. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to guess what it is? It's in America. I'll make it obvious. Um... Oh, what would be number four? Would be up there in a, a, another circuit? Was, look, surely not looking to say, her. No, definitely not. I was going to say, sure, surely not that crazy. No, I know even though I'm would in the Bay Area, there. I'm not that so, biased. I don't know, something like uh, like uh, Atlanta Motorsports Park or Barber or something, I don't know. Atlanta Motorsports Park actually genuinely is one of the best tracks. I The layout uh, is remarkable. Yeah, gr great track. Uh, but I don't think I'd put that as number one because I don't think you right. could have a gr great race around there in, in, in many bigger cars. Uh, yeah. So number four. You weren't. Number five for me is actually Barber. So you were kind of close there. Okay. Number four is Road America. Really interesting. Very. I think, it's a, I think it's a good race track. I, I think what what confuses what what gets people down on Road America is they look at it and they go it's a bunch of ninety degree corners. Yeah. Which I agree. I, I, I recognise that there is a lot of boxiness to the turns. But every single one of those turns is different, right? In the way the undulation works, camber in a lot of ways, and you know, once you set a car up to be fast in a straight line, it's scary through some of the, the kink and, you know, the, the hurry downs, for example. I think it's a great track. Old school track as well in terms of track limits and, you know, runoff that you're given. Honestly, America's National Park of Speed, the sim has made me fall in love with it. Yeah, I mean, look, I've always, I think... It might have been had a little conversation with Peter Mackay. It might have been before we were going into the Daytona. It might have been on the broadcast, be honest. Um, but the Friday night prime time before we went into the Daytona 24 hour. Uh, and we were discussing um, circuits. We, I, I don't like rovals. There is, there is genuinely no roval on planet Earth that I like. Uh, I can just about tolerate Daytona. Once a year. Just. Uh, exactly. Uh, Homestead's all right. Uh, but it's not really used very much, and so, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, I hate Indy Road. I, I, I really can't stand it. Uh, but it it's just, I, I don't like it. And part of the reason is that, um, for me, like, I love a racetrack that goes on a journey. Like, you're, you, you know, one side of the circuit is completely different to the other. Um, and we actually used Road America as an example, because there is something like, you know, when you're going down into Canada Corner, you're under the trees. It's completely different. 
than the uh, the, yeah, the the run out of turn three. Come on, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, no, um, I, I don't like corner numbers at Road America. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, but it, like, like there is that whole kind of thing, you know, with 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 the journey that you go on and around at a racetrack, and um, you know, obviously, you know, you'll know with like Nordschleife and stuff like that. Like, there is that journey. I I can understand that, like, why Indy will be up there for you, like, because I, 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 like I think it's I think it's, it's the best oval. I can't put it on there because I don't think you do go on that journey, but it is still, you know, very... Okay, um, oh, okay. Are we talking uh, about journeys here? No, 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 no. Do we, we really are, we, want we to are, talk about the journey of the Indy 500 itself? No, no, I'm not, we're, not, we're not talking about that. Okay. We're talking about the journey you go on on the track. Okay, well, yes, the, the reason I say that is because the... A lap of the track of the fi of Indy, the oval in particular, I agree. You know, not not particularly uh. intriguing. But when you talk about what it's like to race at Indy for 500 miles, you know, you're dialing in your tool, dealing with dirty air, pit stops. I mean, we've seen it where you know cars. It, yeah. For me, that's where a lot right. of the stuff for Indy comes in. So I I totally respect what you're saying. This is again where, to be clear, we play characters sometimes on the broadcast. We want to know what you say, what your opinions are. I racing esports network. A couple of people say Circuit of the Americas, and I also agree, Lewis. That's up there for me. It's a great track. I don't like it that much, Ooh. but 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 I will agree, and I did see it in chat. Uh, it gets a lot of hate, and I don't fully understand why it gets so much hate. Do you have a because single screen at home, Lewis? Uh, I do. Yes. Yeah, that's why you hate it. Th this is my. No, I did. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I get that. That double hairpin sequence. Can yes, exactly. Be um, but I think the rest of the circuits, like, fine, um, whatever. Uh, did, uh, before, before I go and read some more of the other comments as to, to who suggested what, uh, did you see in our little TeamSpeak chat what Ewan said? Yes. He said, not enjoying the lack of Le Mans in this discussion. Le Mans, as an event, is is right up there with the very best, you know, obviously, in the world of motorsport. It's on every, you know, it's on, it's on bucket lists. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I, I, I can't wait to go one day, blah, 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 blah. As a track, yeah. Um, there's there sections is, of it. There is about thirty seconds of an absolutely unbelievable racetrack, and then there is two and a half minutes of pure boredom. <laughs> so, uh, or you, no. or you race at the Porsche All Stars and you just get incessantly bugged as a co-commentator, in which case Le Mans becomes it's a lot fine. more intriguing. But yeah, I agree with you. I remember the last Le Mans race that I did, uh, 24 hours, of course. I did two four-hour stints um, <laughs> in that affair, just because Le Mans, you know, so you spend so long just sitting there in a straight line that you can put yourself through some of those longest hits. Whereas you do four hours at the Nürburgring, Nordschleife, and you can do that, a lot of people do, but you leave them mentally and physically drained and thinking, I don't want to get back into that car anymore. In Le Mans, it's like, all right, when am I back in that car? Let me go out and get a couple of seconds of rest. Ewan's also saying, by the way, that if Indy is there for the quality of racing, then Le Mans is too. Uh, I'm gonna disagree yeah. there slightly, personally, personally. I don't know. I don't know when it comes, if, if you're putting like Indy on there for like the journey Not the of the Indy event. road course, just to be clear. No, no, no. Indy yeah, Oval. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you're if you're doing like for the, for the journey of the event and all that kind of stuff, then then yes, uh, I think you would kind of have to like leave those. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It, it's different. It's different. Uh, I will say I've just seen Dane. Oh, I'm just I'm now I'm now looking at chat. By the way, so if you have posted anything, I'm I'm going to look at it now. Dane, Dane Baird, Le Mans number one. Absolutely wrong. Get in the bin. We've just had that discussion. Yep. Um, Lords is number two. Uh, and then three, four, five is kind of a mashup between Road Atlanta, Indian Sebring. Fair enough. Uh, Vince Cusi, no bag ring, number one. Cool. Uh, Le Mans number two. Yeah. Uh, Road Atlanta, Sebring, and then Spa. I'm surprised to see quite a bit of Sebring love. I will be quite honest. Yeah, same. I mean, look, we all know that... Um, you and O'Leary doesn't like it. No, no, it's his favourite circuit, actually. It's his number one. He's just trying to put everyone onto the, the wrong path that, you know, oh, I, no, no, I, I hate it. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, oh, it should be repaved. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I he see. He absolutely okay. loves the circuit. Absolutely loves it. I think, I, I think it's his absolute number one. Um, so there is that. It's uh, reverse psychology is what's happening. Exactly. That, that was all the chats uh, in the RaceBot TV YouTube, by the way, in the iRacing Esports Network. Johan Hoth, I just want to say this.
But if a Frenchman himself has come into the chat to say <laughs> that Le Mans is the worst French track in existence, then I think case has been closed. Uh, and we can leave that one as is. I saw a couple of other comments that were pretty cool. Uh, someone said Norschleifer, Lime Rock, Willow Springs, and Mosport Top 4. Those wow. are some interesting tracks alongside the Norschleifer. Wow. Yeah, that is... Uh... There's, that's that's an interesting one. That is an interesting one. I'm trying to think of like other uh, other good French tracks now. Uh, uh, Not Manny Court. Court. No, sorry. No, I, I I like Manny Court to drive. Um, Do you like to, the chickens to, there? To, to, to exactly to race. God no, absolutely not. You can do nothing. Um, Led on actually, I I argue is actually pretty good. Okay. Um, Poe's kind of fun, but it's almost impossible. Like, I think there's, 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 it's very hard to find in sim racing. So, like, I think there's, like, some really, yeah, obviously, uh, it was in, I think it was Race 07 or something like that. Um, and, yeah, obviously, it's, they, they then got ported into, uh, uh, sorry, when I say ported, let's use the big air quotes here, ported uh, into RF1. Um, and uh, to say it's dated would be an understatement. That's a lot of smoke there. Uh, popping off that BMW going into the final corner. I'm going to assume there has been a spin. How did you deduce that, my dear Watson? Let's take a look at the replay. Ooh, weird. And it's going to be so Too much cab? No, too much no. speed. <laughs> Zero out of ten. Too much ambition as well. Does he have a traction control off button mapped? Might actually have done because he spun that around relatively well. Not, not, not the full unicorns of love uh, the experience there. No. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, no, it wasn't Feather. Who no, it? it was Mitchy Tauscher. Oh, goodness. Mitchy Tauscher. Yeah, no. I, I, it's why I was, I was, I was going for a different unicorns of love. I was like, I can't remember which one it was though. Yes, Mitchy Tauscher. Um, whoops. Uh, oopsie, oopsie daisy. Uh, I see PS competition in our Racebot TV YouTube chat saying Zebring is the best track in the world. Uh, no bias, of course, there. Yeah, right. Absolutely not. Oh, look, Zebring's not, it, it, it's definitely not in my top five. It's certainly not somewhere that I dislike uh, racing at, and it is one that arguably provides better racing than most of the ones that I put in the top five. It's kind of like, like I say, it's, it's a completely subjective thing, and it's what you're looking for. In a, um, in a in a in a best racetrack on on the planet, right? Uh, I'm I'm looking for like the, the driving experience and the flow, which don't generally go hand in hand with great racing. Yes. Like for example, the Nordschleife, which right. Yes, there's a lot of straights and stuff, and you know all there is opportunity for overtaking. Let's be honest, your overtaking opportunities are being incredibly brave going down into Schweden Kreutz which is all very exciting because Johnny Vecchio Grandma Vecchio uh, down into the uh, into the pit lane uh, or just wait until the dying her every time right you say that though we have had Lewis I'm, I'm not kidding when I say some of the best races in the digital Nürburgring Endurance Series this season that uh, I've no ever doubt. commentated on like legitimately it's been last lap drama and last lap changes across multiple classes and uh, yeah, uh, you've I, seen a lot of that as well, haven't you, on the broadcasts? Yeah, we've seen all of it. Seen all of it. Um, never miss a beat. J uh, Johnny Vecchio <laughs> out of the car. <laughs> Enzo Benito is going to take over. So you know, two hours in, two hours out. That seems to be the routine, the uh, rotation that those drivers are going to be going through in that number seventy. Should see Pinto probably in uh, this lap, if not the le next lap, by if things go as expected. See a couple of comments, by the way, that people are surprised that we don't like Watkins Glen. Uh, the less that I say about Watkins then, the better. All I'm going to say is that the bus stop chicane, as we run it in sim racing, is an abomination that does not need to exist. Yeah, I, I've got to say that. Like, I've, I, I mean, I've raced Watkins obviously a fair amount, um, as there is uh, Enzo Burrito leaving the pit lane. Um, I've, but like, most of the races that I've done around there, I have enjoyed doing. Right, but. I, I don't know, I, I couldn't put it anywhere near a list of top five racetracks on the planet. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't know, it's, it's like uh, new. I remember, like I say, I remember when the um, uh, the MP430 was, was brand new. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it was the first um, week, the first, first official week of the MP430 was at Watkins Glen. It right. was with the boot without the bus stop. Um, and it was so good. Uh, mostly because it was ridiculously fast. The week after that was um, at Indy, mm -hmm. 
and I'm pretty sure Bullock Bassey absolutely detonated me at one point. We had a bit of an argument, and then we didn't speak until game is eight. Uh, mostly because I don't think he has any memory of who I am. I remembered it, clear as day. Uh, but I remember it being really tedious and boring. Like, Walk Walkins is great. It is good. What a track. I mean, that is great. Uh, someone said Portimao on the iRacing Esports Network. Looking forward to that being available on iRacing for people to get a sense for how that drives in sim as well. That should be uh, interesting and fun. Benito, by the way, works past uh, some lap traffic in the number 91 machine. So uh, that is the Sable Esports car that is two laps down. No drama for him as Pinto just continues to stay out there and uh, extend this run. Um, BS Competition, by the way, going back to the DNLS just for a second, Lewis. Have you ever seen BS Competition not in a BMW? Oh, you're having to think hard here. I know. I swear, no, I'm pretty sure I have seen them not in a. Well, no, obviously we have done like with like. Right, no, no, no. Uh, but in like GT3 things, but in, in GT3 stuff. racing, yeah, no, it's like. I, I feel like I have. Yeah. But it's, it's rare. It's very, it's very weird commentating on a BS competition Mercedes. Is all I'm going to say. Can I just, can I just drop in one of the more bizarre top five circuits that I okay, see? Okay, go for it. Uh, Amrit for Strala, Silverstone. Okay, Hockenheim. Okay, Inter Lagos. Scuba. Scuba. Snetterton. St <laughs> who, who said Snetterton? I love the diversity. Someone said Blisterberg. I mean, we're getting tracks from all over Bill, the world right now. Look, I will say, okay, so obviously, you know, we have this uh, this whole thing of, like, Tilka drones, okay? Uh, the Bilsterberg is the one circuit where I'm kind of like, okay, I think that's the one that shows that it is more FIA and Formula 1 regulations that are making the, the race circuits the way they are, rather than it being Herman Tilke. Because that was built back in 2014, maybe 15, maybe 16. Great flow to it. Really, really good. I love the diversity in tracks that we're seeing in our chat. Some well-educated viewers, clearly, are helping to uh, educate uh, those around the world as well as some of the more unusual tracks. I know Zach Sweeney probably I was going to literally about to say, we need Zach Sweeney in here now. Because he'll have absolutely no idea of any of the tracks that we're racing at. Driver change underway. It's going to be Pinto out. Gustavo Ariel back into the car. The 44 now sits and waiting. We watch as the uh, number 70 machine, Enzo Benito, already back in, makes his way down to the chase. Yeah, absolutely. Whilst we're all having this discussion, don't get me wrong, the race is still well underway. Uh, red lines pitting, as as always, as expected. Uh, comfortably early, uh, going for this very aggressive strategy. Although that stint, by my eye, that stint, I think, was an hour, wasn't it? I wonder if they're trying to switch back on now. Like, if, if they're trying to go longer again to try and bring them back onto an 11 stint uh, strategy. They are, like, trying to play the, the half and half, basically. So out of pit lane, it's uh, going to be just waiting for the gap to stabilize. It's holding at two seconds now, so probably down to 1.5 with the draft and the momentum on the side of uh, Benito on the run up into turn two. So that should be closing in slightly and the gap back to where it was just before the pit stop sequence. So we go back to Smet. I was going to say, we've got about seven and a half minutes before Lewis and myself have to say goodbye. So let's wrap up this conversation. Let's, let's uh, close the thread for the time being. Uh, some people saying Suzuka. Uh, again, some people saying Snetterson. I can't quite believe it. Look, look, okay, I'm just going to say the, the main reason why I can't put Snetterton anywhere near my list is because I've had to work at that racetrack three times. Uh, and all three occasions, it shows how much of a pain that circuit can be. Because uh, this is like real, like real me problems. So that's fine. I'm sure it's great for racing weather. But like, it, it, it's this, this, this level of, of hatred that's been built up inside. The commentary, sir, the commentary booth is on the, if you imagine not the start finish straight, it's on the left hand side, right? And the paddock is on the right hand side because that's where the pit lane is. So you would ask the question, well, how, how do you get from the commentary booth to the paddock area in a, uh, in a timely manner as Williams uh, worked their way into pit lane? Um, well, Arjuna, what I have to do is I'd have to get in my car, I have to drive all the way around the outside of the circuit, then cross the bridge, then drive all the way around to the pit. Like, it's basically, it's like a two mile drive for something which is literally 50 meters away from me. It is so so annoying and for that reason alone i'm like no no so it's, not, no. it's not actually related to the track itself absolutely well not. it is it kind is purely of purely my own experience oh heavens 
uh, La Fuente into pit lane as again drivers come in just before the top of the hour. Should see some of these guys go as long as maybe about 10 minutes past the top, so 7.50 or so left on that clock. Have to get a bit of a sense. Uh, Where are your conditions sitting now, though, Lewis? They've started to climb. Ooh, up to 32 degrees. That's up four degrees track temperature-wise uh, in the uh, in the last sort of half hour, 45 minutes uh, since we last checked. The ambient up by one degree. Rennie Gilbert's just put in Alton Park. It's the worst track in the UK. Ban the man. Ban him. Get him out of here. Unacceptable opinion. Sorry. Uh, what, okay, ooh, is that a move up in towards the cutting? Vlad Kimicev passes Kamil Grabowski as a bit of elbows out racing behind Haasa. Uh, nice little box pass there from a car that had lost its front end, uh, what was it, about an hour into this race. Uh, what is your worst track in the world, Lewis? I have to ask you now. Ooh. Worst track in the world. Wow. Um probably in Miami Grand Prix. <laughs> That's up there. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. I, don't, I, I tend to kind of like forget them as soon as I've stopped driving them. Ah, it's okay. That's, so, that's, 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 that's interesting, though. That's, that's, uh, that is a more poignant discussion. I'll definitely bring that back in for the final two hours. Again, remember, Lewis and myself, we will be back at the end of the race, so we still got a long way to go. Going to have uh, uninterrupted coverage moving forward from this, so uh, don't go anywhere. It will be you and O'Leary alongside Cam Roger to bring you through the next two hours or so. Uh, and Lewis and myself will stop talking about racetracks, at least for the time being. Yeah, I'm always curious what people don't like in racetracks as well. Some people saying uh, <laughs> Vegas, Sebring, Miami, Paul Ricard. I think Paul Ricard's going to get a, a fair few votes, isn't it? Um, yeah, but see, this is where I've, I've had uh, I've had arguments with Dara McCormack about Paul Ricard because he actually he likes it. it. He likes it. Now, Dara. I will say, no, I will say, okay, on the Mistral Straight, if you... Uh, detonate that chicane, so it's literally the, the run down towards uh, scene, right? Yeah, the, the, so you got that really straight. And in GT3 racing, generally speaking, the racing around there is actually really good, right? So, from that point of view, you can almost kind of understand. But it is still an abomination, mostly because of the runoff, um, but also because France, but no, um, it's, it's, well, no, so I, I'm, I'm just checking if, if Johan's, just, just, just checking if Johan's still about, no, I, I don't know, no, it's, it's just, it feels very uninspired when you drive around it, but it does race quite well, um, but it would definitely be in my list of, of first tracks on planet Earth, but it does race quite well, so yeah, fair enough. Yeah, uh, I will also say Singapore with the Singapore sling, I mean, that's got to be top mm. of everyone's list at the end of the day. Mm. It's, it, it's definitely, it's definitely not top, I got, okay, I got controversial opinion Okay, for go. You. Oh, come really on, come bad. on! The Valencia Street Circuit was good. Was was better? Is better than Singapore? Oh, uh, ha, I, uh, that's not controversial in my opinion. That's uh, good. It's controversial to a lot of people. I, I will say Singapore has made better races than Valencia did. Valencia only right. produced one good race, which is 2012, uh, and Singapore has produced a lot better ones. But I think for a flow of a circuit, uh, Valencia was way better. Now, there are fictional street circuits that do exist in sim racing. Uh, Lewis and I just commentated on one that was based in Singapore, and I think we were both on the agreement that that was a better track yep. than the Formula 1 track, weren't we? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I think the Singapore street circuit, the uh, Marina Bay street circuit, it's just, it's, it's just really boring. It's, just, it's, it's, it's 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. I mean, you cool. go over a bridge, that's cool. Yeah. You like, got lights, it's, that's cool. It's, it's fine. It's exactly. It's it, the, the the big selling point is the fact that it's under the lights. And which now at the end of the, the day, only one anymore. Ex exactly. At the end of the day, is kind of a gimmick. Yeah. You know how in I'm saying this just to irritate you, just to be clear. But you know how in Daytona they turn the lights down to twenty percent. Oh, here we go. Daytona twenty. Do they? Do they really? Just to make sure that drivers you know? are reliant on the headlights. In Singapore, it's like the opposite. Do you know? I've actually done a race around here. I got. I did the twelve hour race. I did. Uh, I got zero instant points. Did you know that? I <laughs> uh, haven't mentioned that yet today. Uh, someone oh, says that they don't like Gas Marina very much. I agree. Uh, I'm also I, not a huge fan of that. It's better since they've changed it. Is it really? Yeah, it does. Don't get me wrong. I still don't think it's that, that good. Uh, but the removal of, what is it, the, the 4 5 chicane uh, and the one round the back um, of, of, of the circuit, where, where they've now made it just one like smooth radius corner, it is better. 
I still understand why people don't like it. Albert Park in the bin now, since they've changed it. I get yep. why they changed Fair. it, but in the in the bin. Yeah. What is the best track in, in Australia, actually? That is a very good question. What do you think it is? I mean, okay, let's let's take Mount Panorama out of the equation. Phillip Island. I agree, actually. Is there any uh, other track like that is that good? Because there's a lot of street circuits. There's the Bend. There's a few other, you know, but there's not the many dedicated. The, the, the Benz, in, in my opinion, is great. You've got um, Sydney Motorsports Park, Eastern Creek. I think that's a great track. Um, you know, f for me, like even the street circuits, Townsville, Adelaide. Uh, obviously, you've got Newcastle. Like, there's some quality circuits in Australia. I wish we had more in iRacing. Uh, unfortunately, we've like we've got Bathurst, great. Phillip Island, great. We've got Sandown, which no one uses, which arguably isn't that bad. Right. Uh, I, I quite like it, but no one uses it. And so. Winton's now becoming part of the free base content on iRacing, so hopefully there's some more people I that get familiar with that. Was on exactly, right? Uh, we've got pit stops underway. It's time, though, for Lewis and myself to step aside for a few hours. We are now officially about four hours into this great race. 12 hours up and down the mountain being challenged by everything Mount Panora uh, Panorama has to give to you. Don't go anywhere. Uninterrupted coverage of the iRacing Bathurst 12 hours powered by the coach Dave Delta continues here on RaceBot TV. Thanks very much, Arjuna. Thanks very much, Lewis McGlade as well for the last couple of hours. We'll be with you for all 12 uninterrupted here on Racebot TV on our racing and it's uh, great to be with you for this one on the mountain again here for another year my name is Ian O'Leary alongside Cam Roger for the next couple of hours we're taking you through the middle part of the race um, hopefully speaking less rubbish than Arjuna and Lewis <laughs> <laughs> sorry but um, but uh, that's going to be difficult um, it's good to be back, Cam. Good to be back on the mountain. I, I, I said this on Twitter quite a lot, actually, over, over the course of the week. I really enjoyed the real-life event uh, that we saw uh, last weekend. And I, I'm really enjoying this uh, Bathurst as well at the moment. It's a bit disrupted in what we're seeing at the moment. That leader on the left-hand side doesn't make a lot of sense because we're in the middle of a pit-stop cycle. But the first thing you said to me, Cam, is that it's close. And that's all you can hope for at this stage. Oh yeah, especially when you come into a, a longer race, sort of four hours into it now, you expect the um, yeah the gaps to be quite a bit spread out. But the top twelve all inside a minute, and uh, even going to, down to the top fourteen inside a minute, so it's actually looking pretty good from that point of view. Uh, of course, the red line cars do have a little bit of a gap towards the front, but overall, it's staying pretty pretty close, and that is really what we like to see because it, what it means is if any of these uh, drivers hit the wall, as we know that is very easy to do around here. It just means other teams in behind are there uh, to capitalise as we Again, another couple of pit stops with uh, the Williams and uh, BS competition cars coming in. Uh, so, as I say, still a lot of pit stops to happen yet at the front of the field. So we'll do a proper look at where everybody is in the field uh, when we get there. But uh, Chris Lullum leading the way for Team Redline. That much is uh, certain for now. And these guys have made it in terms of uh, where they need to be with fuel. They are more than safe at this stage. Where the others are, like Gustavo Aero, Lenzo Benito, the others red line cars, are they safe or not? Well, that's to be figured out over the course of the remaining eight hours. Uh, Vince Cousy says that, uh, Cousy says that uh, everyone's got to be careful praising Sebring now. That's true. Um, but uh, that's still to come in the R-Racing special event schedule. In March, of course, we'll be bringing that one to you live as well for the entire 12 hours. So uh, make sure you join us for that too, even if it's not my uh, favorite place in the world to, uh, to, watch, uh, to watch a race. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that when we get uh, to that race. Uh, meanwhile, out on the circuit, Apex Racing Team and Williams and in fact, loads of other teams are in a real group right now just uh, settling into their stint or getting to the end of their stint I should say more accurately Alex Dunn in the middle of this probably the most demotivated of them I would hesitate to say because he got a pit lane uh, speeding penalty through the last time through pit lane and that is uh, really going to kill him in this race he's nearly a minute off the lead and, and most of that margin has come down to the uh, pit stop phase unfortunately 
Yeah, as we've been mentioning, the field being so close together, any little mistake has a big, big effect, a big consequence. And unfortunately, as you say, having a drive through um, when the cars are literally bumper to bumper in uh, many parts of the track, you've got to be losing a lot, a lot of time. And that's one thing actually that surprised me a little bit about this track is actually how close the teams have been able to stay. Of course, with Daytona uh, about a month ago now, we saw uh, the, <laughs> the Apex cars, the uh, Redline cars, bump drafting all the way for 24 hours. So it is certainly possible around Daytona, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it uh, to be so close around uh, Bathurst. So generally, as you come over the top of the mountain, there's gaps spread out, but uh, seemingly we are at such high level here, such consistency between these drivers that they're able to stay close. As there is the uh, Team Redline number seven and Abiga in the car at the moment, uh, just getting a fresh set of tires. Yeah, and we never really got a resolution as to how they were ever going to sort that, that, that out. You mentioned that they were bump drafting each other the entire way around, and, and that is that was the case. But they never had to settle things at the end of the race because the uh, car not containing Max Verstappen, the other one, got disconnected from the race, and so they never really had to work out who was going to win. But I do fear for them here that they're in the top four positions, and that means that they're going to have to decide someone to win. And I'm not sure whether they're going to battle that out on track. Are they going to battle that out in a voice chat amongst themselves? I'm not sure how they're going to resolve that problem. Uh, I think a bit of egos might sort, of sort that one out because obviously they all want to win the race. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not going to crash out the team, are you? Um, so they just need to make sure that they're getting the one, two, three. And hopefully the, uh, for them, the one, two, three, four, um, especially. So I think it will be a bit of a battle. But naturally, uh, I think one of the cars or maybe two of the cars will be leading um, as we get there. Of course, still eight hours to go. And the gaps, even if they spread out you know, by five seconds or so between the cars, um, extra over the course of the uh, the re remainder of the race, and uh, that will probably be enough to uh, to set it. But you're right. Um, at some point, they surely will start uh, batting as the 20 car now comes down pit road. So definitely is the uh, pit stop cycle. And you know, we're seeing earlier a lot of them pitting well before the hour, but they've stretched it out now. So um, uh, yeah, we're definitely looking to see if that uh, 11 stop uh, strategy is going to work for these guys. Yes, yeah, especially the other the red line guys that uh, I'm uh, more concerned about. The number 44 car, the number 70 car, currently being driven by Gustavo Ariel here, and then just that car in the background there as well, uh, Avenzo Benito, the slightly bluer red line car for whatever reason, someone's done something wrong, um, so, someone messaged Arjuna earlier that uh, someone's made a mistake somewhere along the line, and uh, the livery is slightly, uh, just look at that, slightly, you can actually see it a lot better in this light, me and Arjuna were really had our noses on the screen earlier trying to figure out what was going on um, because it was a bit dark, but it's a lot easier now. You can certainly see the uh, the lighter shade to the main body of that car uh, as they come over the line and gain a few more places. Still three to come in. And the problem still persisting for Redline, I suppose, as well, in that in the, they're running so long. It's the fact that they keep bumping into traffic and, or running into traffic on the circuit, which is uh, becoming a problem. Um, so they'll have to figure that out and they'll have to try and mitigate the time loss in that respect. But unfortunately, the bottom line is they have been losing time. Florian Labiga now is only three seconds in front of uh, Tristan Iglesias, who's sort of leading the charge of drivers behind, trying to catch the red line drivers. Yeah, it's getting a little bit close. They're not completely running away with it, uh, which is quite a, an interesting one. When I tuned in, uh, it's about half an hour or so into the race, and it was a clear one, two, three, four, with sort of 10, 15 seconds behind. And it's starting to look quite ominous. But as you say, with just about a three second gap, this could very easily turn around and is looking good for the 33 machine um, so far. But of course, it's never easy to get the uh, overtakes done, but you definitely need to catch down that. Uh, that car up ahead and it's good that we are seeing um, a bit of a, a challenge here from the from the Simify team and of course uh, Williams uh, not too far behind after dominating so many of the special events over the last couple of years a little bit um, slightly disappointing to not see them up there challenging with Redline but they are coming in the background as well so I do think through this middle sort of four hours of the race that we're just getting into I do think we're going to see some of these gaps change around a bit uh, you'd imagine so uh, for the next part of the race. There is uh, Tristan Iglesias right behind one of the BS competition cars. And I think this is Ruben Bonga, who's four laps down in this race, and he's just uh, pulling off to the right-hand side there. The other BS competition car is uh, Phil Dinez 
in uh, 11th position at the moment. I say the other one, there's a BS Turner car in 25th, but they're not a lap down. Um, so it will be Ruben Bonga who's going laps down on the leaders at the moment. And I've got to say, I, I do commend them more than anyone for staying in the race because they had issues in the first uh, 45 minutes. It was actually the first incident that we had all race long in terms of a car on car incident. They spun around at the chase trying to overtake someone and then got hit by an Apex Academy car. At least we thought it was in the sunrise. They got rear suspension damage. They came down pit lane, but Ruben Bonga still it persisting in the race and four laps down. And unfortunately, we don't see so much persisting in the race anymore with the amount of uh, competitiveness that you see at the front of the field. I think it's, it's fair to say. It's very difficult to catch those gaps back up again. And so lots of drivers just give up. Lots of teams just give up, but thankfully they haven't and they're still in the race. Yeah, that's the, uh, the spirit that we like. And of course, BS Competition being such an important member of the, uh, the eSports uh, community now. And uh, yeah, with the news that they are obviously continuing um, with BMW M over the course of this year as well. It's great to see. And uh, but I do wonder if it's because obviously as much as this is you know, a special event, it's still an event in the um, in the iRacing uh, system in terms of the iRacing safety rating, etc. So you also don't always want a DNF from the races because you can lose some extra ranking from that as well. So there's incentive from that side of things to keep going uh, to obviously keep yourself inside the top split. Um, when we get to the next races later on in the year. Still many endurance races to go indeed in this uh, racing calendar, so uh, make sure you tune in for them. Drago Racing and Williams Esports still yet to come in here, by the way. Drago Racing and both of their cars, uh, that is. And the Mercedes of Williams Esports yet to make a stop. The other two Williams cars, though, have Esports BenQ and, and Chillblast have uh, already come into the pit lane. They're ninth and 12th for Williams Esports at the moment, but that will now be rectified as so they both come into pit lane. And Gustavo Ariel makes his way around in the lead once again here by 1.4 seconds ahead of Enzo Benito. So uh, that's where we are in the race. Uh, Luke Bennett is in third place, and then Florian Lebega will get up to fourth uh, for the Team Redline car. Then of those who've pitted, it's Tristan Iglesias, who will become the fifth running driver, although Manuel Troncoso is still out there at the moment in the number 69 car. Then it's Daniel Pastor, another quite a few seconds behind. You can see him just in the background by about seven seconds or so. And if you look a bit further back, Phil Dines just comes around the corner in the BMW trailing. Him is Felix Quirnback in the Marla Racing Team BMW, who are get only getting stronger as this race goes on. For so there's Spencer Otis. Finishing inside the, or running inside the top 10. There he goes over the top of the hill. And Damon Woods will remain inside the top 10 very soon as well. All within 30 seconds of the lead. So, might well be fair to say that we've got maybe 10 in contention for the lead. Although, some of the cynics among you may well think that it's only Redline who can really win this race from here. I don't think it's quite as simple as that just yet. Oh, definitely not. It's way, way too difficult uh, of a race to be uh, to be saying that. It's not a simple track by any means, uh, especially that middle part of the track, as you say, over the top of the mountain. Just look at the elevation change. We always say that uh, camera angles don't do it justice, but this track has so much elevation change, and it's really quite uh, extreme that even on the camera, you can just see there, especially coming down the last few bits there uh, through the elbow, it really is a massive change. And as you go through those parts of the track, the car's moving around a little bit more, uh, the weight transfer is getting uh, a bit out of hand and you have to have the, the control of that. And so far, that's what Redline are doing very well. But the biggest issue you and I would be mentioning is uh, P1, P2. They've done 9 and 11 laps, uh, whereas their two teammates are behind, the 20 and the 7, have only done 2 and 3. So that's quite a big difference. I mean, at the most extreme, that's 9 laps difference between the 70 and the 20. And the 70 needs to find that over the course of the next 7 and 3 quarter hours. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, and, and I thought early on that they were just going to run in, in tandem, actually, and just save fuel that way, um, trying to make those laps back again. But clearly they're not doing that anymore. None of them, in fact, are running nose to tail anymore. They don't seem to have the upper hand in terms of speed over the rest of the field either uh, at the moment. Gustavo Aero did a 2 minute 3.7 last time around. Florian Labiga, 2 minute 3.8. And now Tristan Iglesias only just matched him on that lap, but... Phil Dinesk was quicker than those two on that lap, for example, albeit by only a tenth of a second. This is not the Lamborghini Redline walkover it was at once uh, fearing to be. 
And as I said earlier on, the Lamborghinis don't enjoy the particular higher temperatures around here and their pace certainly has gone down and you can see that the, in fact the pace of the whole race has gone down hasn't it really we're about a second and a bit away from the fastest lap of the race so far currently set by the number 20 team redline car that's a two minute 2.4 i can't see us getting that low ever again actually with the temperatures we're going to see this race will end at quarter to six uh, in sim <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a, a weird one starting so early in the morning, as uh, you guys were mentioning earlier. It's, um, yeah, the complete opposite to what we normally have. And it is weird that if that potentially is a trait of the car, that they decided to do that. But because it is so extreme, starting, as you say, before six o'clock in the morning, uh, therefore, even the first four, you know, what we're getting into now, about the first four hours of the race or so, is in those cooler conditions so uh, they definitely made it work they got that gap but now they need to hold on to that as maybe some other cars come back to them and it's always that ebb and flow it's just a few tents here a few tents there but over the course of hours that of course snowballs very very quickly and we do know that they are looking very strong but i think what's the best for them at this moment in time is that this 44 car they've got three teammates in behind so anything that happens um you know simify start coming at them it's going to take them a long time to work through all of the teammates before they get into P1. It's uh, a long, long way to go, but there's a long race to go, of course, as well. So uh, thank you very much for joining us here on this uh, afternoon here in Europe. It's about uh, five o'clock now in uh, in England, so uh, probably a bit later for, m for most of you listening to this. But um, welcome along to everybody. Just seen a bit of uh, support actually coming in for Simi Fire Esports. We've just been uh, talking there. Tristan Iglesias is currently uh, driving for them. Uh, and somebody asking where they can find timing, by the way. It's at timing.racepot.tv where you can uh, see all of the numbers from today's race so far. The number that's interested me most, Cam, is the amount of drivers and teams still in the race. Only five retirements after more than four hours is uh, some sort of record, I think. Uh, I would expect so as well. And... I know Lewis was banging on about the fact that he did 0x at this uh, track a few years ago, but it's such a difficult track. The It's so fast, you've got the walls right next to you as well, and it's really almost a mixture of a street circuit um, up at the top. It's very, very interesting. So I am very surprised by that, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see that staying over 40 cars remaining in the race for a long, long time. So uh, again, I think it just comes down to the, um, the high level of racing that we have now in these special events. So many of these uh, drivers have been doing it for so long, the experience is there. And now the uh, the quality is showing out as well, so it's uh, it's great. And then also the fact that, as you say, with uh, the Ruben Bonga uh, number 16 BS competition car, you know they're staying in the race as well. They're not just quitting, and uh, that's you know another way that the um, that the team stay in the race. Uh, I'll give you an idea of how many cars were were still running after we're on lap 123 of this race this afternoon by the way the amount of drivers and teams that were still in the race by this lap one year ago was 35 and 49 started the race that day i know for only 48 started here but it's not much of a difference uh, but we've got more than 10 uh, more cars it's still in the race which is a fantastic thing uh, on that day by the way 27 cars officially crossed the line at the end of the race although the last of those was 68 laps down so I clearly had uh, quite terrible problems throughout the race but that just gives you an idea of how many you'd normally expect to see getting to the end of a race like this and, and on this occasion we're seeing a lot more uh, stay in which is fantastic but hopefully uh, we can uh, stay away from any curses for the uh, for the next few moments uh, a good morning i suppose to dave chin in youtube who's S uh, said it's 4 a.m in sydney where he's watching from and i know he's been watching throughout the race so far so uh, a good morning to him and uh, thanks for your commitment uh, for, to watching this over the course of the morning. I hope that uh, some of us in Europe repaid by watching uh, watching Bathurst through the night because I know the Australians do it for <laughs> Europeans almost all year round. We've got to repay the favour for at least one day a year. Um, so uh, so I hope that we can uh, we can do that on the annual trip to Bathurst for the 12 hour uh, last weekend. Uh, someone throwing Bruno into the ring for best circuit in the world. Arjuna and Lewis were talking about, well, I'm not sure whether that was actually for best or worst circuit. They threw both out there, actually. Um, someone's thrown Bruno up there. I don't mind Bruno, but uh, it's... Bike track. It's, it is a bit of a bike track, that is true. It's a bit too flowy for most. Uh, it'd probably be good in a downforce car. Yeah, I have driven it um, on other racing simulators, um, and 
in a high downforce car and it, it does become a little bit too easy because the corners are just so long and the straights are quite short um, around that track so it really is just designed for bikes and uh, as a biker boy myself <laughs> I wouldn't mind that uh, but for, for GT cars I don't think it would be necessarily the uh, the place to, to do a race um, but it's certainly an interesting one, actually, with these or the elevation changes. It's got some quite tricky braking zones as well. Um, but yeah, I don't think that is really the uh, the one for the best circuit award. Right, well, uh, everyone's got different preferences, haven't they? Um, so, someone put. I, I did like the uh, the list that, that someone gave. There's a bit a bit a little bit left field of uh, not very many sort of of the big race tracks that hold the big endurance or or, or even big motorsport events, but uh, how have had ones like Snetterton on there and stuff like that. Where was it? I, I can't find it. Snetterton, Sakuba was there. Uh, Hockenheim. Some little bit left field ones, but I, I don't mm. mind. A bit of personal opinion is good. Um, although I, I really wouldn't be able to narrow my favourite tracks down to five, to be honest. I, I, that would take me a week. Uh, well, it depends what you mean by favourite as well. Like to, uh, to yeah, drive, true. like on a quali lap, or to, uh, to race. Well, it's your favourite, isn't it? So you make the parameters. Yeah, exactly, because I do, I genuinely quite like Silverstone, although it is quite overplayed in sim racing. Like, some of the races can be a little bit boring sometimes, but I actually just find that track really fun to drive. So, uh, yeah, I guess it depends, uh, <laughs> it depends what you mean um, by by the best uh, in that regard. Snetson's an interesting one, though, because I, I do find it with this, it's, it's on that club track level. So it's a little bit like smaller, narrower, like the facilities aren't quite as good, etc. Um, so I don't know if you could ever say it's the best in that regard, but I guess for BTCC and, and that sort of stuff, it's uh, quite good. Yeah, it's uh, very subjective, fair to say. Uh, looking over the shoulder now of uh, Felix Quirnbach in the Marla Racing Team BMW. A couple of teams on your screen at the moment who have really been having a rise through the field as the temperatures have risen also two best BMWs in the field at the moment in 7th and 8th place but it's worth noting that they qualified in 10th and 11th so uh, that, that tells you all you need to know that this car not a great qualifying car but as we learned Cam it's a very stable car and so uh, it's one you'd want to drive for 12 hours anyway really but especially at Bathurst yeah, that's basically the only reason why we uh, we chose it. Uh, for those who don't know, me, you and Lewis and our friend Enzo, we did the uh, the Spa 24 uh, last summer, and we chose this car pretty much because it was the only one that I could drive. Because um, yeah, some of the other cars uh, they they're quite tail happy as such. This is a lot more planted, um, so it was good fun. And then we chose a very balanced setup as well that I know Enzo wasn't too happy with because uh, it was a little bit slower, but it's uh, it's certainly a nice car. And I would expect it to be very good around here, especially through these really long corners, actually, that we have um, at this track. There aren't many tight corners, even um, you know, the chase into the uh, into the chicane, um, it's not really that tight of a chicane. It's still like third gear. So they're all pretty long radius corners and certainly that should suit this car and be quite fun to drive. Yeah, um, it meant to be stable anyway, but just ask Lewis about how stable it was. The on only the one to do on. Um, only one, uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't like to mention it, by the way. <laughs> it's only just come up on every single broadcast I've ever done since, um, but, uh, but, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just milking it because I know that next time, if, if there is a next time that, that I drive with with any of you, like it's going to be, uh, it's going to be me crushing, and I'm going to be. We need the one. to get you back in the car. I know. Like, I, I, you I is to, such a uh, prolific commentator now, and he's uh, he's really getting up there in the world of commentating, and I absolutely love that. Do love my boy Wan, but we need to get him to be a driver as well because you is actually pretty fast considering he spends. You know, way more time talking about it than driving. <laughs> you know, so I, I actually had had this uh, theory when I was driving because I was when I started out doing sim racing, I was doing a little bit of driving, a little bit of commentary, uh, and not very much of either. But I had a theory that because I, I I've watched so much uh, sim racing and, and real racing uh, over my years at the time, and also talked about it for so long that it actually gave me a little bit of an, an advantage in a sense that is that if there is a point where you can watch enough to sort of learn from by not even being in the car if you see what i mean you can you can sort of see what to expect rather than actually obviously you can't substitute experience but i think there is a point to be made for watching uh racing and, and getting better at it because if, if you're trying to do something better 
then watching someone who is better than you is, is surely a, a good way to go about it. Oh, definitely. That's how you improve in anything in life is by, um, you know, learning off people who are better than you, <laughs> to be honest. So, um, of course, especially in all these special events, we focus on the top split. Um, there will be so many splits and there'll be thousands of drivers right now doing their own splits. But of course, we uh, focus on the top split and this is where the best drivers come. And especially nowadays with the drivers, as we've been mentioning, they're so close together. That is the is the little details, the little bit of strategy, the little bit of driving style, maybe a little bit of fuel saving and things like that. Maybe traffic management in the multi-class races, and that's what you need to learn um, to get to to get right up to the uh, to the top. As talking of the top, we are actually closing in ever so slightly for the race lead. It's now under uh, one second, but I do wonder if they're actually going to battle, if they're just going to stay behind like we've seen the uh, the BS competition cars do right now. Yeah, that's been the story of the day so far and it may well uh, remain to be the case at the front of the field as well, but it is noticeable. I, I wonder whether it's sort of manufactured that way as well, that Ariel is just maybe taking a couple attempts out of his pace at the moment just to allow Benito to catch up and then save a bit of fuel, because don't forget that Benito is two laps uh, older on this stint already, and he really needs fuel here, just Enzo Benito in the, in the number 70 car. I'm not sure how close it's going to be for Redline, but I don't think it's the most comfortable situation they've ever been in in the lead of this race at the moment. And so I think by Ariel just taking a couple of attempts out of his pace at the moment, he can let Benito catch up. And now that he's in the slipstream, Benito can start to save that fuel that he really does need. Yeah, that is, uh, that is a good point as well. The fuel saving games, it's not as... Um, yeah, as extreme as we were mentioning in Daytona, where it's literally bump drafting, uh, but still being so close and uh, being within that sort of second or so, getting that proper draft is enough to save those, you know, few um, bits of fuel that, of course, will add up to laps over the course of the race. And the less time you spend in the pit lane, really, realistically, the faster you are going to go as we take a look up to the front, because it's now about half a second behind uh, for the number 70 machine with uh, Benito at the wheel and closing down his teammate. But uh, as they come uh, through uh, up towards the mountain once more, uh, they just need to close in that little bit more if they want to fight for the lead. And uh, it's very difficult to see them properly fighting uh, as of right now uh, anyway. The amount of cars on the lead lap, by the way, is down to 31 now. And the reason I mentioned that, you can just see the uh, Team PGZ 124 car of Kalen Chin, who is at the wheel of that one at the moment. I'm going to assume, or, well, no, I'm not going to assume, actually, uh, <laughs> actually um, but uh, but he is definitely Australian, is Kalen Chin. And so at very best, in Perth at the moment, it might be 1 a.m. And I, I think David Haynes is listening. Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, but it can't be maybe 2 a.m. But it's uh, it's pretty late anyway, at, at very best. If he's uh, over towards the east side of Australia, Kalen Chin, then uh, it really could be a very late night for him. I did hear from uh, Dave Chin earlier on that uh, Kalen Chin's only going to be doing uh, on driving in the first half of this race, which does make a bit of sense. But uh, nevertheless, whichever way you could it for an Australian, ironically, the Bathurst 12 hour is uh, one of the most difficult to take part in. Yes, yeah, a really weird one with time zones. Uh, <laughs> and of course, you focus on the, sort of the, the European based time zone as such. Um, for this one, but then when you get the uh, the Aussies uh, involved, it's certainly quite uh, an interesting one timing-wise. And often, um, especially when we do have the 24-hour races, it's actually quite a benefit uh, being a European team or even American team uh, to have an, an Aussie in your team. Just because of how the time zones work, you can all be driving in your own daytime as such. Uh, you don't have to do those overnight stints. Um, with, from where you're racing from. But here, it actually is a little bit uh, tricky uh, with that one because, of course, our um, 12 hours is going to go well into the evening here in the European time zone, and it starts and drives right through the night for the Aussies. So it's actually a little bit awkward uh, for all intended, and maybe that's why um, this race is just so difficult as well. It is uh, such a difficult race. So uh, Team Redline remain one to four and uh, continue to lead here at Bathurst. Half a second between the two leaders uh, just for now. And they uh, yeah, stay ahead of PGZ and, and Kalen Chin, who's just behind. Next on the list will be the German simracing.de car of uh, Nick schultz Wissmann in the uh, Lamborghini back there. He's uh, just on the lead lap 
by a couple of seconds or so. But this is now that, and there he is actually in the rather famous German sim racing livery of the sort of lime green and black, getting as close to the walls as possible out of Forest Elbow. But this is going to become a theme of the race now. Traffic's going to be a pretty big talking point, and it always is at Bathurst, but it's, uh, it's going to be quite something to contend with for the remainder uh, of this race. I would argue that anybody who's, you know, a minute or more off the lead la uh, at the moment is going to be lapped. So we could even see the top 10 staying on the lead lap and that's it, or maybe even less than that by the end of this race. Yes, potentially. Of course, it's just over a two-minute lap, about two minute threes, two minute fours is the average pace across the field uh, right now. So that is, therefore, a decent amount of time that you have to uh, you have to get, of course. Um, but the thing that I'm thinking about here with the traffic is, of course, we have single class. We do have sometimes GT4s in the, in, uh, real, in real life. We've had the, the cup cars in this uh, competition, in this special event. Um, I think about three years ago now we stopped doing that. Um, but uh, sometimes we have that, but not today. It's just single class. So that makes the traffic management that a little bit more difficult because it's not like you can just absolutely slide past them uh, by virtue of being a fast car. You do have to work for it a little bit and maybe just lose a little bit of time while they uh, try and find some space for it. This is, uh, there's not very much space out uh, here either, where Ultra Sea Sports are in Carlos Feniosa in the uh, 27th position at the moment. That's quite a long way down from where they qualified and, and certainly down from the top 10 that they were having a little bit earlier on. There's uh, seemingly plenty of battles going on out there at the circuit at the moment. This is Altitude Esports trying to hold on from Team PGZ and Samuel Ward, who's squeezing to the outside now, going towards the chase into the right hander they go he gets pretty close to the grass but altitude in the end break a little bit earlier and let Sammy Ward have the position so uh, there is a change down the hill and through goes Ward but uh, this is at the moment a, a fantastic run from Altitude Esports who were not one of the top sim racing teams by any means but they are up there with the very best right now and, and doing very well in the Shiva One car they're now 22nd in top split, just behind this battle where Falcon Sim Racing Team are trying to get past Drago Racing. It just seemed that some battles have started to liven up in the last couple of moments. They certainly have this Nikos Laubisch on the right-hand side, and he's going to get the run, and that's going to be a nice, easy position there. Uh, no questions asked coming up towards uh, turn two, and in the background, it's turned into a 3-0 battle now as well as the 12 machine um, has got on the back. So this could be another position lost for altitude in the uh, in the triple one as they come around the track for another rotation up the inside of the cutting. Don't always see that, but altitude, you have to back out of that one because you do not want to be uh, on the outside, as we uh, saw from the uh, 32 BMW you last weekend not the place that you want to be and altitude go down two places in about two kilometers yeah uh, and this is the uh, the continuing battle further back although a lot of lap cars involved here well i'll say a lot one of the cars involved is the entropic uh, pfbr car that's not a lap car indeed this is martin kadlicic who's through in the bmw and uh, they're passing the lamborghini again as well so it does seem that BMW getting faster at this stage in the race. Lamborghini certainly not, and that's what we heard at the start of the race, that Lamborghini was going to struggle with higher temperatures. The time now will be, what are we, four and a half hours into this race? Probably be just past 10 a.m., so it's not even at the hottest it will be all day long. As I said earlier, take some recalibrating of your brain this, uh, this race, that the hot, hotter temperatures aren't really reached until after the middle of the race. And it's uh, it is a weird one with the um, with the car selection. Of course, many times we've seen red line go in the uh, in the BMWs as well. Um, so it's interesting that they thought the Lamborghini was the one for the race, and maybe they tested a few of the different conditions. They thought on average that was the best one, but then some other teams, quite a few of the teams, are also thinking that the BMW was the best. It's certainly a very interesting one with the uh, with the selection. Uh, maybe sometimes it's just a little bit of preference as well. Maybe the balance um, of the car. Of course, we have a bit of a difference. So also the the Porsche being up there. So we have front, rear, <laughs> and mid-engine cars uh, all uh, on offer. So definitely some. Uh, some big differences in how the cars feel and uh, you've got to be comfortable with your car because at the end of the day that will gain the last couple of tenths of a second as well so definitely uh, an important choice that you need to make for a 12-hour race but it looks like it's uh, working out quite nicely for redline they just need to hold on to that gap and actually Inglesius, um in that fifth position in the 33 he's dropped off ever so slightly by a couple of seconds from aerial uh, since that previous pit stop 
And the gap growing actually from uh, fifth to first, the gap is growing to one of the biggest that we've had outside of a pit stop phase. The previous biggest, uh, I think, after monitoring the gap so far for the race has been at 20 seconds. That was in the second stint when the 44 on the 70 were using the lower fuel to really push out an advantage at the start of this race. And it seems that the advantage is, is going out to a sort of similar region to what we saw earlier on. So that is not good news at all for everybody else. But you can just see the way that some of the other manufacturers are starting to creep up the order a little bit. We've got BMW 7th and 8th. We've got an AMG inside the 12th position now. And once again, Alex Dunn's going to be kicking himself for the pit lane speeding earlier on because they'd be right in the mix without it. There is Alex Dunn. Just in 12th position at the moment as the best of the Mercedes. And only gaining positions at this stage in the race. Only moving further forward as this one goes on. And there he is uh, celebrating a win, clearly, in his uh, real-world outfit. He's putting that uh, real-world experience to good use, hopefully, uh, here this afternoon to lead Apex to a good finish. But still a long way to go to, uh, before that. And still a lot of recovering to do for the Apex Racing team, who only have uh, one of their full-time cars, if you like, in the field. Two academy cars, but one mainstream team in the race, which is a fairly light way, I suppose, to defend your title, of, of which this is a race, of course. They won here last year. Yeah, definitely, and uh, the pace is looking very good, but also talking of the pace, it is incredibly close. Uh, six, seven, eight, ninth, 10th and 11th positions all did a 2 minute 3.8 last time. So all of those cars within one tenth of a second of each other, just showing you how close it is. And of course, they're only separated uh, by about, what's that, about 10 seconds or so on the track. So they are very close and they're all doing similar lap times. So that is the point of the race that we are at. Uh, there's no one sort of really streaking away and they're just being very, very consistent. And only up towards the front do we see sometimes a little bit faster, the top two. Of course, they are on less fuel they're on about uh, nine, 10 laps less fuel, uh, but they are a few tenths of a second uh, faster than this mid pack. So it's definitely staying very, very close, but I just can't get over the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the closeness uh, of these laptops. Yeah, remarkable. And, and the entire top 10 there covered between a two minute 3.5 and a 3.8 on that lap there. Really remarkable uh, stuff. They're coming over the line again now. So some slipping into the nines, like of Iglesias, Pastor, uh, Phil Dinez and Quirin back a 204 from Damon Woods in the 10th position. And so the, uh, the the amount of difference in the lap time slightly increases and goes slightly all over the place as a result. But uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's difficult to maintain that level of consistency for, uh, for quite so long. So battle for the lead going on, although they're only really just driving together. Gustavo Ariel and Enzo Benito. Same goes for Phil Dinez and Felix Kronbach in the battle for seventh position. We've got Virtual Coach by GNG, uh, GNG the Sven Hasser driven car just ahead of Parker White for 14th place. Then Simi Fire ahead of Williams Esports Academy just behind them in the battle for 16th position. There's another one for 21st, although that one is uh, PGZ and Entropic who both just passed the altitude esports car then there's a four car train with two wsr esports book kicker cars going on for 25th position there's still plenty going on out there on the circuit still plenty of, of gaps less than a second and i think the the notable one there for 25th is because the leaders are not too far away from them only 10 12 seconds behind is the 44 car and this is not going to be a nice group to uh, to work work through Yes, definitely not. The uh, the leaders have lapped up to P30 now. Uh, Apex Racing Academy, Alex Girl, uh, is in the car. That is the uh, the last car to be lapped. And you can actually just see them up the road there. Just a few more seconds. And then Redline will get into the top 30 uh, in terms of lapping, uh, lapping cars. Pretty uh, crazy indeed. But we also still have uh, 43 uh, left out on track. And we've just those five DNFs, as you were mentioning a little bit earlier. So that is not doing too bad. But I wonder, is there... <clears throat> Is there any incentive uh, for these drivers to try and stay on the lead lap at this point? Um, you know, I mean, obviously they're going to be pushing as hard as they, hard as they can, but um, or is there? Is it just one of those things where you just have to let them through and uh, try and maybe follow them through the uh, the cars up ahead? It's uh, easier said than done at times. 
We'll uh, wait and see when they get there. But so far, it's just been imperious consistency. I was I was actually getting pretty um, uh, pretty excited on behalf of Simify Esports just in the hour preceding our stint here because they really were catching Team Redline. But in the end, it's not really come to anything, has it really? Simify are losing time hand over fist now. And it's becoming difficult to gain that back again. And so the battles for the lead may well just be uh, confined to those among redline drivers. This is the battle for 21st, though, as Entropy uh, PFBR try and find their way past Team PTZ, who have been maybe a little bit below par today compared to what you'd normally expect from PTZ, but it's a very competitive field. In, in fact, that one of the biggest GT3 fields that you're going to get in an iRacing special event outside of the Spa 24 hours. Oh, yeah, we had, what was it? Uh, no, it's a bit more than that. It was something like 13, I think, GT3s you had back at Daytona. And now we have 50, uh, sorry, 48. Uh, so plenty of opportunities for these uh, drivers to get up there. Of course, less classes to split out the drivers, but still, um, as you say, one of the bigger ones uh, being the single class of GT3s. And what you get uh, with that is these close battles still a bit further down because they're still top-level drivers, um, even though they're battling um, over places a bit low down than they would have wanted for 21st, 22nd place, um, as that is uh, Samuel Ward trying to hold on in his Porsche over the top of the mountain. And it's a difficult uh, part of the track, obviously, to overtake, even though uh, the Mercedes is getting close. You don't necessarily overtake here, but what you do is you put pressure on the car ahead. You try and force them into some sort of mistake, maybe tap the wall, miss an apex, and then that opens up the door. But uh, most of the drivers now able to hold on to that pressure. And then this is the important one, the elbow coming onto the back straight. And uh, this is where, of course, the slipstream comes into effect. It certainly does, although it doesn't look like there'll be a pass uh, this time around. You mentioned that it's uh, a, a single class event here, just GT3 is available, and that will be the case at Spa as well, of course. But uh, do you think we should reintroduce the Porsche Cup class or, or another slower Ooh. class to this race? Because we did have it for three years in this, uh, the first three years, in fact, of this uh, of this race. And Moritz Lerner, who's in the race today, I'm not sure whether he's driving right now, but uh, he is in the race today. Uh, no, it's Yuri Kazdorp who's driving the 25 at the moment, but uh, Kazdorp sharing with Moritz Lerner, who is a, a Porsche Cup winner around here. Williams Esports have won that mm. category, as has Max Benneker and Gianni uh, Vecchio, who, who ha ha either have or are in this race today. Unfortunately, Benneker is out of this one for Maus, but... Um, do you think we should reintroduce a slower class to bring it back into re line with the real world, which of course did have uh, nearly nearly 30% or so of the field of, made up of slower cars? Uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be against it. Uh, I definitely like seeing something else. We'll get that in a second because maybe a move up the inside there. No, I was able to um, hold on uh, from the uh, from the 12 machine. Um, I. Yeah, I would like to see a, uh, a slower class. I think it just adds that extra little bit. Even if, um, so we've got 48. So even if there was maybe 10 or 12 just on the track as well, not too many uh, to make it sort of half and half, but uh, enough just to add that little bit of extra traffic management into it, I think that would definitely be quite interesting. Yeah, I think so. Although the Porsche Cup cars maybe wouldn't work so well anymore because I, I believe in 2020 we still had the older older car, didn't we? The older it, Porsche Cup it car. It would be in 2020, which was, yeah. Which was a bit slower. It was quite quick on the straights, but nowhere near as, as good through the corners as it is these days. Uh, and even in a six-hour race on the Nordschleife for now, if you started the Porsche Cup cars right behind the GT3s, they wouldn't catch them, even in a six-hour race. So think about that for the Nürburgring 24 when we get there. The, those Porsche Cup cars will be napped th two or three times. They're, they're really, in my opinion, too fast. So I maybe wouldn't add them anymore, but maybe GT4s, which there were four of in the uh, in the real-world event, but obviously having a four-car class would be a bit demoralizing for those involved in it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I don't think you need to add any more than that, but just enough um, yeah, to be uh, a bit of a challenge, because that is what we like uh, for these guys. Of course, we do have um, weather coming, um, which is going to be a very important factor to these um, special events, but I do always like adding in just that extra little bit of, uh, of difficulty. Um, for the uh, for the teams, because uh, sometimes, especially in a race like this, even though it's 12 hours, uh, all the teams see it as is 12 single stints to the end. Um, so if you add in those extra bits that could play a bit a bit more of a part of that, there's just some extra variables for the teams to take into consideration. 
Yeah, and uh, I'm sure there'll be some complaints about it too, but um, that's normal. Uh, Thibaut Prevost is uh, in the 77 Williams Esports Academy car uh, at the moment, currently trailing uh, Lucas Perez in the 144 of uh, of Simify Esports. They're about five seconds down on the on the uh, group in front, but Prevost has actually caught up in recent times to this Porsche, which I said would uh, qualify a bit better than it will race, but that's proven a little bit wrong so far because it's still racing quite well inside the top five. And everyone said before in years gone past that the McLaren would be too fast to control and it would never win one of these races. Uh, well, it uh, has won these, this race plenty of times. In fact, the last two years on the bounce, the McLaren has, uh, has won here. So um, just shows you it's, uh, it's not always as simple as that. But Lucas Perez hangs on from Thibaut Perot at the moment as they make their way back down Conrad Strait here again. Perot might be able to find his way through soon though because he has, uh, has caught up pretty quickly to the back of this Porsche in front. Yeah, just to quickly finish on that McLaren point, one reason also why it won was not just because obviously Redline were very, very fast, um, especially a couple of years ago. Um, but if I remember, it was, a, it was a McLaren train. Basically, everyone was driving it. So the chances of it winning were, uh, were quite high. That was certainly a, an entertaining race. I think actually this was my first ever race spot, uh, broadcast a couple of years ago. Um, when uh, when it was the yeah. McLaren train, that was certainly uh, quite something to uh, to walk into with the flames. Yes, uh, still my second favourite car in our racing, anyway, behind the uh, behind the Z4. Look, looks wise or just like personality wise? Uh, just both. I've never driven it. I don't know. I don't, well, I have. I've, I've not driven it on iRacing, racing. I should say. <laughs> um, I've driven it elsewhere, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I just really enjoy it. And, and the sound, the, the flames. I mean, there's not much to not like about the McLaren, to be honest, but um, Arjuna doesn't agree with me. He, th he thinks the McLaren and Porsche, uh, um, Ford should be gone from this field. Yeah, which I heard with. that. heard that earlier. Um, I guess it is just one of those things that they're just outdated um, at, at this point. They're obviously not, um, not in the current... Uh, set of cars that we have in, in the real world, so I guess that does make some sense. But then they're still on the on the service, so I guess we might as well potentially uh, see them at some point. Um, but then also, I think one thing that's against it as well is when we have the multi-class um, multi-class races, and then we have a GT3 class. Sometimes there's only three or four options, and it's always. You know, maybe the Porsche or the BMW, the Mercedes, like some of those. So I think teams lean towards those cars naturally anyway, so that when you get, um, you know, another race where, where you have all of the GT3s like today, um, you kind of need to, yeah, I don't know, step away into a car that's a little bit more unknown. So maybe that is a bit of a hindrance. For uh, by the way, we were just looking at uh, Thibaut Prevost there. According to uh, Williams Esports on Twitter from earlier on, the only name I can see next to that car is Thibaut Prevost. So I'm not sure whether he's actually driving this race entirely on his own or whether that is just incorrect. But, I mean, he'll be uh, DQ'd. Well, that is true end. as well. But, uh, but it's but, certainly a, a good effort. <laughs> yeah, plenty of people do this, uh, all the races, in fact, uh, with no teammates um, or, or, or on their own. I just put more accurately, there is the Williams Esports Academy car. I say, I don't have anybody entered next to his name according to social media, so uh, he apparently is uh, on his own. I'll dig into that a little bit more as to whether that is incorrect or whether uh, that is not the case. But Is it just um, uh, experience or something like that? Maybe not, there wasn't enough drivers to go around, so like, oh, well, you might as well go out for a few hours, see how it is. Okay. I, I'm not sure because about, uh, when will that have been? About, about 10 o'clock this morning, which was before... Uh, the tweet that I was reading earlier was put out. He said he's sharing the car with Beckham Jassir, who recently joined the Williams Esports Academy. Now, has that changed since 10 o'clock this morning from midday, when, of course, we started this race at UK time, or, or, or just quite a lot? Yeah, you, it'd be unusual to see a single car effort, and especially in a team like that, it would be unusual as well. According to uh, our good friend Vince, he says that uh, uh, Beckham's already done a couple of stints. Oh, nice. Okay. I missed that. And Dane says it too. So uh, I'm not sure why the... Because the graphic I was reading came from Williams Esports. I'll just clear that up. <laughs> Williams Esports decided. wrote it themselves. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not going to take any responsibility for that, other than the fact I said it out loud. So um, 
Uh, maybe shouldn't have. But anyway, Beckham just uh, is uh, is with him today. So thanks to those of you who are uh, more attentive than me, which isn't very difficult. So uh, so there he is. That's, no, that's that give credit up. to yourself, Ewan. Research and um, I guess journalism. That is your that's your specialty, and that is how you, I, in my opinion, stand out as a commentator. So. Well, I, uh, I I failed to do it there. So. Uh, well, you did your research, but the re the the info was a little bit. Yeah, okay, that's, that's true. I mean, that's because you wouldn't have said the wrong thing if you didn't read it in the first place. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, but anyway, I, yeah, I I, 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 I thought I could trust the Williams Esports account, but maybe not. <laughs> so uh, so uh, you can on most things, but uh, uh, but there you go. Um, that's. Uh, that's fine. He's trying to chase down uh, Lucas Perez at the moment for uh, 16th position and still trying to do so. While we've been chattering along about him and, and saying the wrong things, um, he's just been sat behind him at the moment. Not sure whether that's a case of can't pass or, or don't want to pass. Um, it's uh, it, it's one of the stages of the race where you probably don't really want to pass at this stage. Provo will take the extra amount of fuel and, uh, and, and that's fine with him. Not really eager to get through at the moment. Yeah, and I mean, we've gone about an hour now without incident, so it's kind of time uh, for something to happen as we see the 70 come into the pit lane, still 10 minutes shy um, of the hour. So over the next seven, if they want to do it with still seven stints remaining, uh, they need to do um, yeah just over a minute or so extra uh, each of those stints to make that work. So definitely... Uh, interesting one as we're seeing there's the uh, the Apex Academy car that we mentioned earlier that 30th car uh, be overtaken and it's now into the uh, top 29 who are now uh, on the lead lap uh, yes 10 minutes shy so we, we, so that's five laps or so there's seven stints to go I mean surely it's possible to save five laps in seven yeah. stints definitely definitely um, it it's just, I guess, how is that compared to everyone else who maybe doesn't have to do that uh, amount? Yeah, but th they've already bought themselves 20 seconds uh, uh, over other cars who are not redline cars. So that's uh, that's the problem. And, and also, I t that will leave them with only three laps to save and seven hours to do it. So that puts them in a bit of a stronger position than even the 70 cars. So while they were nose to tail there, I would argue the 44 car is probably slightly ahead in the in the stakes at the moment. Yeah, a couple of laps is a couple of laps. Um, and it's generally uh, obviously a good thing. Um, any um, advantage that you have will surely be just that little bit more of a benefit. And especially when you get these extra couple of laps, um, doing the sort of overcut strategy. You're basically doing a quality lap when your rival is going to be on full fuel. Um, of course, there's older tires versus newer tires, but generally the fuel outweighs that. So I wouldn't be surprised um, if there is just an extra couple of tents um, over the course of the pit cycle as well that go their way. So it is looking very good at this point. And as you say, it has um, spread out by 20 seconds now to Iglesias. So they lost, I think it's about eight seconds or so over the course of this stint. So the pace is still looking good for these Lamborghinis, even though you're mentioning it might have been dropping off. Uh, absolutely. So we're uh, looking very good for uh, Team Redline so far. Gustavo Ariel uh, leading the way. Uh, Luke Bennett has won this race before, don't forget. He uh, is second at the moment. And uh, yeah, he's uh, pleased to be back, uh, or, or pleased to see him back, I should say, on our racing uh, all over again. It's it's good that uh, Redline are putting so much effort into a special event like this, and, and it's clearly paying off for them at the moment as well. The gap now 20 seconds from Iglesias to Ariel. So this stint has really shown that Redline do still have a little bit more pace to give and they're willing to use it as well just to get away from the rest of the field. As I mentioned before, the hour before we came to air was a really good one for Simify Esports. They closed in a little bit, but that seems to have gone out the window now and it's all Redline again here. They're one through four and it's uh, surely not too long until we're starting to search through the record books for a special event dominated by one team quite so heavily. Yeah, that's true. We've seen this. I mean, you mentioned it earlier as well with the, uh, we used to see the colors, you know, team red line red, red line orange, etc. cetera, um, that we have lost. And I think that's also because teams are putting in less entries. Back in the day, we, you know, three, four was 
you know, every team was doing that all the time. I do think we're seeing slightly less now for quite a lot of the teams, but today, the fact that we've had all four of these cars up the front, and they're basically in P1, 2, 3, 4 as well, um, that is definitely something that we haven't seen for a very, very long time, and especially in a team event. You know, sometimes in these single driver events, you can see it, um, but when it comes to a team event, and, you know, there's two, three drivers per car, you're looking at a lot of drivers uh, that you have and a lot of variables uh, to keep it up towards the front. As here comes the 44 um, from the lead uh, in that uh, in that strategy of pitting slightly early. They only need six minutes extra to go, so they should be definitely fine to the end of this. You say that there's less entries from per team these days, but I'm not so sure I, I would go along with that, to be honest. We've got four red line cars in this race. We've got... Uh, Five Williams cars, if you count the academies as well, which I'm going to. We've got four BS competition cars uh, with Marla Racing Team as well, which is a, effectively the same thing. We've got two Drago cars, three Apex cars. You know, that's quite a lot under the same banner um, these days. And, and that's even without Coanda, who on a normal day would surely bring two cars at least to a special event as they did at Daytona. Yeah, that is, uh, that is very true. Actually, especially I did forget about the likes of Williams, who signed up a lot of drivers over the last couple of years and have really started uh, pushing out. So maybe you're right uh, in uh, in that regard. But I, I definitely seem to remember just a lot more multiple teams, if that makes sense, back in the day. But maybe that's just a bit of uh, nostalgia uh, coming into it with uh, some of the different teams swapping around. It's possible. Um, we do often uh, look back on things, maybe slightly inaccurately, but um, anyway. It's, uh, it, it may well be true at the oh same time. Now, here's the problem again for Redline. They're in traffic now, and, and it clearly isn't holding these two back who are doing early stops very much, but just look at how busy this is from eighth place right the way down. There's uh, not very many big gaps in the midfield, and that's exactly where Redline come out, every single pit stop window at the moment. And that's scary as well, because you're not necessarily the fastest on the, on the first lap or two. I um, managed to come out of the pit lane and then you come into some drivers who are having battles themselves. There's only a couple of seconds between, between them and they have four positions and pretty high positions as well, you know, lower parts of the top 10. So they're fighting for it. Now all of a sudden you get a couple of the uh, the red line cars getting in the middle of all that. It's certainly a, a awkward and tricky situation for the drivers to, to work out because they're on different strategies at different times. And especially with how long we've seen some drivers go past the hour now, it's going to be a good, um, a good few laps by the time we see them come in. So it's not like it's just one lap and you can sort of get away with it. It's multiple laps that they're going to be there. So that was the Drago car just uh, clipping the wall a little bit on the exit of the elbow, but just uh, nothing more than a bit of dust. Yep. They can uh, get away with that. Uh, someone asking what the lap times are at this stage in the race. Uh, 2 minute 3.3 from Luke Bennett on the last time around. He's leading. There he is in the number 20 car. Florian Labigra did 2 minute 3.6, although that car has been slightly slower than the other red lines, and I mean very slightly. But uh, they have been running fourth of the four for quite some time now. And there are the rest of the lap times. No need to read them out for me anymore. Uh, there's the lap times on the left-hand side of your screen. So there you go. Um, win the mid tail threes. But it's safe to say, Cam, that that is not the peak pace of the race. 2.02.4 is the fastest lap of the race so far. Um, but that was under darkness when these uh, tyres and engines were enjoying life a little bit more. It's getting a bit too warm for them now. Yeah, most cars inside the top 11 or so that i mean yeah two fours two fives uh, etc as they're you know some two sixes as well as their fastest laps of the race so we are at that point uh, of being yeah best part of a second off the pace but of course as we get a little bit later in the race it will start to go down ever so slightly but we are still in that ramp up uh, of the temperatures and every sort of a uh, you know few degrees that it goes up it just becomes that little bit um more difficult for the drivers to keep that pace going but of course it's the same for everyone and the pace drop off is r roughly the same for everyone uh with how they uh how they'll handle with that um but it's definitely it is a bit of a challenge it's not like you can just drive the car and then get back into it three hours later and try and do the exact same uh the exact same braking the exact same speed through the corners although it is at the same time it is also quite a natural feeling uh, now, here's a question that you might get different answers out of, depending on uh, who you ask. As uh, Bennett carries on for a lap, I'll, I'll continue this discussion point. Somebody asking in the uh, Twitch chat, which can, you can join us on iRacing, of course, uh, does the car you drive affect speed, or is it all driver skill? Now, that is a controversial question Oof. in some ways, Camp. Uh, and depending on who you ask, you get a different answer. But what's your, what's your view 
on it. it. I mean, it's surely a combination, isn't it? Yeah, there's two parts of the answer. Like one, of course, one car could be faster than the other at the end of the day. Um, just, just simply, it could have more power, more downforce, you know, better tire life, etc. So therefore, it could just be faster in some regard. But when you get to the absolute limit and you're talking about half a tenth here, half a tenth there, and like we see in these top level competitions where they're trying to get the BOP absolutely sorted, the balance of the car, in my opinion, is more important than the actual speed. Because if you're a driver who likes you know, a bit of a floaty rear end or you're a driver who likes um, a really solid a little bit of time, if you're able to drive the car in the way that it wants to be driven and you're able to exploit um, the bit of the car that makes it fast, then therefore, Obviously, that is um, yeah, a bit down to the car, but then a bit down to your driving style. So there are sort of two parts of that, and it all happens in unison. Um, with the drivers being so close together now, they and being so good um, with all these professional drivers that we have, they work around the car a little bit more. Um, but I myself, personally, I am very sensitive to the car. So um, any little bit of movement on the rear end makes it sort of a bit uncomfortable for me. So I need a car that's a little bit more stable on the rear, but therefore it might be quite understeery over the course of a stint. So those are the things that you have to balance up. They are. And don't you think it's part of a, of, of a skill set of a modern driver as well, especially for if you're a driver at a team that's not signed to a manufacturer, say you're away from the likes of BS Competition maybe, who are uh, of course signed to BMW or Maus now, who are also uh, with BMW. It's part of it being a professional driver as well, isn't it? When you're at a team like Redline and you've got free reign of the cars, it's... Oh, oh no! It's oh, big spin here on the mountain! As on the run down the hill through the dip of Gustavo Ariel is now going backwards. How is he going to res resolve this now? Because this is an... Oh, that's an... Oh, but he's clipped by someone too. Now he's in the middle of the road. He's got to get spun around quickly and he does. He was clipped, we believe, by Thibaut Prevot in the Williams Esports Academy car. Now Gustavo Ariel gets back going again, but the first blip for Team Redline in an otherwise perfect race has hit them with five hours complete. That was out of nowhere. They had the race under control, but as we're mentioning, with this strategy, they go back a little bit into the pack, into the traffic, and then you can get caught up behind other cars. Of course, he was a lot faster. Um, behind the the cars in front of him uh, trying to get through but I didn't see if there was a little bit of a, w a wiggle maybe for that car but just uh, is enough to slow them down there's pressure on the front end and the 44 went around and the issue was they're at the narrowest part of the track also he would have had to find the TC uh, controls turn that off to be able to uh, spin the car around otherwise he would just bogged it and gone straight into the wall so a lot of things were happening there and that is why it took him a couple of seconds and unfortunately as we saw the uh, Williams car coming in and making contact but that is a big big change to the race and that leaves the 20 leading the way but of course the 70 is down there on pit cycle too. It just shows you once again anything can happen on the mountain we'll get a replay as quickly as we can for that one but I believe it was was it the Mercedes of Alex Dunn who was just up in front there on the way down the dipper I think it was although I can't be sure I think it we'll might just be yeah looking at the uh at where the 70 car is on the track as well yeah. it might have just been that 99 and uh I mean obviously probably nothing that they did wrong um, necessarily, but it's when you get some difference of speed, some difference of um, yeah, lines maybe coming out that part of the track, but it was, it was weird to see the car go around that easily because obviously it was front to rear contact, but obviously there was just enough uh, sideways momentum in the car. Um, let's see it, and yeah, I think it was that 99 machine. So down the hill, Gustavo's got a... Oh, ah, so Dunn seems to get a little wiggle himself. And Errol just goes straight into the back of him, not expecting it. This is a look from on board. This will tell a bit more of the story. So he's just got a lot nicer line through here as Errol. And then Dunn gets slightly stuck up on the curb there and spins around. And the ATRS car just behind, along with uh, Enzo Benito, did a very good job of... Oh, Errol ran a blind corner there, flat out. 
Oh, yeah, and that is such a hard part of the track yourself. You saw coming through a, a chicane almost into the breaking zone of the elbow. Um, walls either side of you, they wouldn't really have seen that coming. Of course, there would have been yellow flags and relative um, uh, menus to look at, but still very, very difficult situation for the drivers. And I'm glad that it wasn't an absolutely race-ending crash that that could have been. But um, yeah, Dunn just got slightly offline through the dipper here, had to slow down on this uh, the final part of that through the right-hander, just couldn't get on the power because he was so tight on the inside. And uh, just enough m momentum there for the 44. But as soon as there was that contact, the car just went around. It was a little bit unlucky there, I think. Yeah. Pretty unlucky for everybody involved, really. Now, where is he? It's still in the pit lane, is, uh, is Eru. And of course, he's, he's not long been signed to Team Redline, of course, as well. Big move for him. And it's a bit of a shame, to be honest, to see him caught up in, in that one in the end and uh, well how, how is he going to be feeling at the moment is is surely going to be especially just short i mean anyone in that situation would be in a actual lead of the race and i actually believe they were in a stronger position than, than the 70 car by the way but aside from that you're just signed to a new team and you've taken that car out of what is effectively the race lead of the race uh, after more than five hours in here, it's uh, it's a pretty gut wrenching feeling for him, I'm sure. But is that the uh, the negative of their strategy of always going back into the traffic? And yes, maybe it got them the lead and it got them those extra seconds ahead of their teammates, but they put them in uh, in tricky situations. We're going to see a replay here. And oh, look how close they were. That was the 70, uh, Benito at the wheel, and just able to avoid. Of course, he had the, the vision blocked of the, uh, of the car ahead of him as well, but he was able to uh, just navigate that one enough. I think it is exactly the, the danger of, of being in the traffic. And Enzo Benito now is right in that uh, traffic again. He's got Drago Racing just up in front, although admittedly the advantage now is that they're at a point where there's only actually two of those cars in front of them. Here's Thibaut Pereira and what he could have seen. I'd imagine we're not going to see a whole lot of, uh, of this incident. It's going to be absolutely unsighted and uh, that was very close to avoiding entirely actually, but it's just not possible for him to avoid that. Yeah, I mean, what he did was exactly what I was expecting uh, to see. Of course, there was that slight uh, hesitation, not exactly known, just trying to work out exactly what the car is doing. Is it moving? Is it stopped? And it was just enough that he uh, didn't completely smash into the 44, and they're both still going out on the track, but that could have very easily uh, been an airborne crash uh, at full speed coming down the hill. But we continue on. And for now, but the 44 is uh, down pit road as well, of course, with the damage that they're going to have to repair, along with quite a few other uh, teams who are coming through their pit stop cycle. And they're going to go all the way to the back. Let's see what they can do in the remaining uh, just under seven hours. But of course, they're not going to be winning this race. No, they'll be out of contention. They're already two laps back. So uh, that's the end of their day in terms of uh, contention for the race win. Speaking of uh, race leaders, Team Red Light come into the pit lane with uh, Luke Bennett now. So this will sort of set the field right again in some ways, but uh, not entirely. We've still got a little bit of sorting to do. There's Luke Bennett up on the jacks again with uh, another tyre change. And so he'll be making his way back out onto the circuit again in a few moments' time. Um, I wonder what the mood in the red line camp is going to be like now, though. They've lost one of their four bullets in the gun, but they're still in one of the strongest positions we've ever seen a team in uh, at this stage of a special event. Yes, uh, it's... <clears throat> Well, yeah, it's been quite stunning uh, to what we've seen on the track so far um, this race. And I'm sure that will uh, continue for now. But they need to uh, just make sure that they're keeping chill over the course of this uh, next little bit. We've seen the uh, the pit stops there. There's the uh, 20 coming out behind the 70, which is now, of course, the effective... Uh, P1, P2 in this race. And the 20 is actually looking very close and maybe a little bit closer actually than what we saw before. So I think this is actually working out quite well. Maybe the uh, traffic just slowing the 70 down a bit in those uh, opening uh, few laps. So the 20 is uh, looking pretty strong this race because they're going to have a much shorter stop and less fuel saving to the end. Yeah, clearly 
Bonito has been slowed up by this by uh, some distance. So it's uh, not good news. And, and once again, it comes back to what you were saying earlier about coming out in the traffic. Is it really a good idea? Well, probably not at this stage. It's uh, proved not to be the case. I mean, the amount they'll be worried about it, though, is sort of limited because semi fight are still a long way behind them at this stage in the race. So there is Gabby Montoro. About 10 seconds, that's it, but ahead of his nearest rival. So he is looking strong now in what will become fourth position, but still seven seconds behind Redline. So the, the amount that this will uh, worry them surely diminished g given the uh, gap back to Montoro. But this is still a strong performance, though. To be seven seconds behind a fairly dominant red line that we're seeing, of course, multiple time winners. Um, a couple of a couple of years ago, they had a, a bit of a run. Um, I, I mean, this is still a good job, and I don't think that they'll be uh, they'll be too uh, displeased with that uh, with this one so far. And as you see, he's on the Conrad straight. And here are the. Uh, uh, the red line cars, so really not too far behind. And if we see more of these issues for red line in, the, in this traffic, you never know. That 33 might be on the top step in uh, 6 hours and 50 minutes. So still plenty uh, to go for. And I think they're doing a really good job. Yeah, I've um, uh, been impressed with Simi fight so far as well. There's Parker White in the number five in fifth place. Just uh, driving for the Williams Esports Fanatec team at the moment in their Mercedes. Now he's gone maybe 30 laps into this one. Unfortunately, I think the amount of fuel saving you'd have to do to make this work on a 10-stop uh, strategy by cutting out a stop entirely would be very difficult to achieve. And he needs to go for another further 15 minutes, which is not going to happen, unfortunately. And so the, the lack of... With the red line team of uh, Enzo Benito now actually gaining the amount of time that, or gaining the amount of fuel, sorry, that he's needed to get to the end of the race. I think the, the fuel and strategy games that are going on in the field at the moment are quite limited, unfortunately. I guess that is just the the way that we have, as we've mentioned, the uh, the tyre rules as well. Also just um, uh, close off a little bit of a door there, but what it seems like is everyone, they try something slightly different in the first couple of stints and then they sort of start working out what actually is the uh, is the best route. And at the end of the day, if there is a, if there's a best formula, a quickest formula over the course of the race and the teams will work that out and they'll go down that path, they're all looking uh, for the same goal. They're <laughs> potentially just trying to find a bit of a different way of doing it. But I said, if, if one's quicker, then they're all going to be uh, going down that way. That's why sometimes as well, when we see with the uh, the BOP of cars, if one chassis is slightly faster, just ever so slight, doesn't matter um, how um, fast or how close it is, they're going to end up choosing that one because um, it is the fastest route to the to the end of the race. And uh, that's the reason why we've got the situation we have at the moment with uh, with this race, with uh, Red Eye leading the way, one, two, and three now with the. Lamborghini very much out front. Alex Dunn brings the car in. wonder how he'll be feeling after that stint. Well, well, I wonder if he'll feel at, at fault for that incident, maybe, with Gustavo Aero, even though I think we've uh, acquitted him fairly quickly of any responsibility there. I, as the driver ahead, I don't think he should or could feel any responsibility. I mean, he was just driving. Of course, he slightly missed Four the apex, but... Too. Yeah, uh, that, that is very true. Full position. Um, but, I mean, he was just driving, and he was, yeah... Missed an apex at a very difficult corner on a very difficult track. I mean, it's it's not his fault uh, by any means, and I don't think he'll be uh, looking back on that one. It's just uh, part of racing, and uh, it, yeah, it's always um, it's always the car behind's not uh, fault's the wrong word. Uh, what's the word? Responsibility to um, to be looking out for these sorts of things, and sometimes you just get tangled up. Um, but yeah, done definitely not. Fault for yeah, the reason I mentioned it's four position, by the way, is because do you think that would have changed if Dunn was a lap down? Is he at fault if that, if he's a lap down there, or is it still Ariel's fault? But well, not his mm. fault, but it's you know what I mean. His responsibility. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I guess obviously if you're a lap down, um, you should really obviously let them by. But at that part of the track, no, I don't think so. I, you can't jump out of the way. Uh, maybe at this point through the the first. And the first few corners um, as you come up through Reed Park, etc. But once you get through Skyline down the S's, you can't uh, do anything um, in terms of letting them through. So in that situation as well, I think it's just, um, yeah, just a, a bit unlucky for the 44. It certainly is. 
but that's why Redline have got so many cars in the race. Meanwhile, Daniel Pastor has uh, been closed up by Felix Quernbach and Phil Dines. So they're continuing to fight for seventh position. And Daniel Pastor has to be the most misplaced geographical uh, driver in the history of sim racing. Because, uh, everyone seems to think he's Hungarian and uh, he's not. So, uh, so there you go. I, I actually asked him about it when, uh, uh, when I saw him in the summer. Uh, he said, apparently that's the most Hungarian name ever. It's his words, not mine. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so that's why. Uh, and that's Slovakian. interesting because um, Hungarian is a very like, unique language yeah. um, in many ways compared to some others. So it's funny how names get sort of, I guess, passed around different countries. Yeah, he's uh, not, from, not, admittedly not from far away, just like here, but still very different um, from uh, from there. Oh, got to, I felt uh, felt a bit sorry for him <laughs> in, in that uh, on that day, but anyway, we'll uh, we'll leave that. That was uh, that was the past. Uh, Parker White and Ricardo Rico make their way into pit lane, as you've just seen. So the field is now sorted out, if you like. Uh, Gabby Montoro now 17 seconds behind, so once again closed in a little bit, but. Not, uh, not overly, and it's becoming more and more difficult to close in on the Team Redline drivers. Now, it's worth mentioning that at the end of the first in, in this race, the top two Team Redline cars, so the 20 car and the number seven, had about 10 seconds over pretty much the rest of the field. And I wonder what that has done to the rest of this race, because if you take 10 seconds off the cap that everyone's got at the moment to those cars, then all of a sudden this is a lot closer of a race. And so it, the, the longer this race goes on, the more you start to realise that this first hour is actually vital. Oh, definitely. The the gaps really have not changed um, dramatically in the past three hours. So it's definitely um, still a very, very close race. And I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we see it close up even more by the time we get to the end of the race. Of course, Simified, they've been around that sort of 16 to 20 second gap uh, to the leaders for quite a while now. Basically, the whole time uh, uh, you and me, you and have been in the commentary box. But uh, this group in behind as well that we see in this three-way battle, 25 seconds off the lead. That could so easily change around. Uh, we're still over half the race to go. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's... Uh, uh, yeah, it will be Pastor who's been closed in on by the uh, by the two BMWs, won't it, here? Quernback and Dines. Yeah. Um, Who have swapped around as well. They have. I guess Quernback will have saved a bit of fuel, won't he? And uh, taken some time for his pit stop. He was half a second quicker on that stop, and he was uh, pitting in on the same lap. So I guess that's what happened there. They'll reverse the roles this time around. But uh, the question remains, how far can the BMWs get through this field? I mean, a top five is certainly on the cards because they're uh, on the fringe of it right now. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's actually, I think, turning into a bit of a nice race as we get uh, towards the halfway mark. And I do think there are some very, very interesting battles that will be coming your way. So don't you worry about some of the, uh, the battles that have been a little bit more um, quiet over the last hour or so. And this might be the uh, the first one with the number 10 trying to chase down uh, the number 15 winning C-Sports BenQ up towards the second corner. Not necessarily the best overtaking uh, because it is literally just one line on the apex there. You go a bit wide and you go off into that wall. Um, so maybe not this time around, but definitely starting to put the pressure on. Let's see what um, they can do to uh, to hold on for Pashtor. Yeah, I, I wonder again. It's got to say some, uh, some very big teams in the world of sim rating up towards the front of the moment inside the top 10. Redline, Williams, BS Competition all represented, but there are some other names in there who we really like to see mixing it up with some of the uh, bigger names with bigger budgets and, and bigger teams just in terms of numbers. You mentioned Williams Esports earlier, Cam. They've got five cars in this race at a minimum of two drivers a car. I think they've got three in the in one of their academy cars in the number 88. Admittedly, I've only really seen Jersey Glack actually driving it, but um, he's got two teammates apparently to help him along. And so that's 11 drivers just in this race alone. Like, goodness knows that's how many insane. else they've got uh, <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah, that is insane, especially as, you know, some of these teams out. I mean, they're, you know, professional, semi-professional drivers. Uh, when you think about the amount, uh, but I guess that in a second, because down the inside goes the Marla Racing entry. Uh, very late on the brakes, Pastor not able to hold on to that one. Uh, one of the easy overtakes you'll see. And this is actually going to open the door for the 89 to follow through down in towards the final corner. Pastor's going to have to defend right to that inside line as the 87, uh, 89, I should say, backs out of that one. Uh, but certainly, this is potentially the time for these BMWs to start working their way up the field. 
you'd think so. Uh, and uh, so I hope so. And A4 and 2. Out of Hell Corner they go now. And BS Competition may well want to follow on. Phil Dinez, is he going to be as aggressive with Pasteur as Kronbach was in some ways? A little bit more assertive than maybe some other drivers have been in the past uh, in this race. Uh, no is the answer to that. And so uh, he won't go through into turn two, but it's always very difficult to make moves at turn two anyway, because basically the car on the inside always prevails, or nearly always prevails anyway. Um, it's very rare you see a move prevailing on the outside there, so uh, it's better to wait, and that's what Denis has done. So he will uh, trail Pasteur for a trip across the mountain, and what a camera shot this is going to be. Oh, yeah, this is absolutely awesome. Three-car train over the top of the mountain through all of the undulations and these fast left-handed corners. It's uh, amazing to see uh, just how much the car sort of move around as well. The steering wheel is having all these micro-corrections as they try and balance the car, and then you come down the hill through Skyline. You can never fully go on the brakes there because the rear end is so light. Then there's through the dipper where uh, Dunn had a little bit of an issue that caught up with the 44, and then down through that sort of chicane sequence in towards the braking zone where, once again, you can never fully go on the brakes because it's all downhill and then you work your way onto the Conrad straight and I just was having a look back uh, back on the stream an hour and a half ago um, Simi 5 was 17 seconds off the lead they are 17 seconds the uh, the 15 uh, Williams was 22 seconds off the lead roughly the same the 89 was 26 seconds off the lead roughly the same so the gaps and the pace consistency between all of these teams out there is really really good as uh, these drivers are now trying to swap around these positions maybe it's just Pazdor out of those that I mentioned who's just lost a couple of seconds yeah, maybe Let's see as Dines looks to the right, looks to the left. Oh, pastoral defence from him as well. Here goes Phil Dines on the outside. Bit of weaving about going on here. And Pastor to has to defend on the inside line. It's a better run from Phil Dines, who's now got alongside on the way down the home straight. Into Hell Corner he'll go now and into sixth place he will go as well. Phil Dines gets fierce competition into sixth position and the first of the... Uh, Williams Esports Porsche begins to slip down. Daniel Pastor down to seventh. I think this is the time of the race for the BMWs because I was also looking. Another car I didn't quite mention is the number one machine. They were in the battle, but they've dropped off. Um, off the back of this with Belaziotis, 33 seconds off. So about five seconds behind these guys as the uh, the two BS competition cars, obviously Marla as well. Um, they are, they're working their way forward. So maybe the BMWs coming back the way. The two Porsches of Williams dropping down just ever so slightly. It's only by a couple of seconds here and there, but they are some very important positions as we now see the two BMWs fifth and sixth in this race. So uh, still continue to rise through the field, but with nearly half a minute to catch up to the lead, have they got enough time remaining in this race to get there again? Uh, here's the other BS competition car, by the way. Uh, one of our juniors' favourite liveries of all time, the BS Turner car, oh. uh, uh, Elias okay. Reicher, in the uh, 23rd position behind Traeger Racing and out of Sports. Were you going to say something about the livery there? No, I said I agree. I, I really, really like this livery as well. And the fact yeah. that they've had it, obviously, on the uh, the GT4 in real life as well is uh, something that you, uh, it's always good because sometimes sim liveries don't work in real life, but this one certainly does, and it's a really unique uh, way. Is he going to be getting a move, though? Up the inside there for 22nd position. That is not necessarily a place to overtake, but they might do it. They've got the inside line. Of course, the Porsche on the outside won't quite have the speed as you come up the hill as BS Turner gain a place there. It's come through the cutting as well. In the background, we're seeing side-by-side -side action. The Fulton car, uh, Fulton car on the outside, not quite making it work and deciding to back out of that well the reason for my surprise is because that's Jonas Rutten and he's a lap down now that's quite an aggressive move to be making around the outside of the cutting if you are a lap down and so uh, Jonas Rutten there maybe putting his nose in where it was uh, unwelcomed but uh, uh, Tom Reiher there was able to give enough room and gave enough room to uh, Elias Riker as well to make that move but Rutten's in an awkward position now of wanting to overtake but also being a lap down on a battle is not a great place to be for making overtakes. Yeah, first of all, unlapping yourself is hard enough, but then unlapping yourself against a driver who's in a battle with themselves, as you say, is the worst position to be in because you want to get past, but you also don't want to ruin their race necessarily. Um, but it does look like that BS Turner car is way, way faster, the triple one there. 
um, with Ryan not uh, able to keep up uh, with Riker at this moment in time. And there's going to be a bit of a, uh, a, uh, a difference in the speed at this time. And look how much actually it's opened up. I mean, that is massive already. Let's see a replay of this. So the Beast Turner car goes up and then the 111 not able to get on the power. And as you come up towards the cutting, they were thinking about it on the outside line there uh, by just choosing to back out of that because it's, yeah, it's a bit too much risk through the just slight uh, lift uh, at the left kick. And they're still stuck behind. Russian's still stuck behind, and, and this is going to be the problem for him, unfortunately. So uh, he'll be uh, staying there, I would imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a an, an action zone at this circuit. There's no doubt about that. But some of the biggest crashes come through the cutting as well. Some of the biggest pile-ups in time. I know we had a fairly what's going to become a pretty famous big crash from last weekend with the BMW one or seven days ago. Uh, you've also seen big pile-ups there in in years gone past as well, so I'm surprised that uh, anyone would even try the cutting up to at this point, but it can be done. I don't know if it can be done through the apex, though. You kind of got to get it done beforehand, really, and then get the driver uh, on the outside to back out. I wouldn't want to go side by side through there. Such a tricky corner, and really, it's um, so ironically, it's actually probably one of the hardest parts of the track to try and get that right to then also get the apex uh, as well through the for the next left hand is really not an easy one um, and of course all uphill so um, definitely a bit of a tricky one for the uh, for the drivers but they managed to uh, work out that one at least and <laughs> not have an accident uh, that time around we have uh, another battle there obviously working um, pretty close as Anginus has got in the 99 machine uh, trying to chase down uh, for P10 um, they are quite away, about 20 seconds off Belitziotis, so uh, not too much uh, to focus up ahead for them. Uh, we've got the uh, Australian cricket cars, as Arjuna was uh, dubbing them earlier on, in uh, 26th and 27th, we're running together at the moment. WSR Esports, Put Kicker and Brabham Esports. Um, ask Arjuna about it later, it'll make sense. Um, they've just been passed by the overall race leader. And, and look at the gap between the first two as well. I think that's probably a legacy of the traffic. Bonito has gained some time over Bennett to the tune of a second and a half. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, he's on eight laps, um, obviously longer stint, so have a bit less fuel in the car. But um, actually, last lap was seven tenths of a second. Uh, so the pace has really gone down. Everyone is into the 204s now. So earlier, we mentioned about mid threes, that sort of stuff. Everyone is in the 204s. Of course, they are on slightly heavier fuel at this point, you know, only sort of a third of the way into the stint. We'll see if that gets a little bit faster, but maybe the track getting even slower. Uh, but either way, it was seven tenths of a second gap. Uh, Benito a 4.1 and Bennett a 4.8. Uh, so that was uh, one of the bigger reasons for that gap. Let's see how that one progresses. So plenty of... Uh Gaps that are the close together. Apex Racing Academy, a nice gal just behind this BMW battle as well, by the way. A few cars that are really coming into their own, actually. The BMW and the Mercedes. Uh, and then the first of the Ferraris, actually, in 29th position for ATRS Esports, already a lap down. And they were very close to the Gustavo aerial spin that we saw over the top of the mountain not so long ago as we have a look to the inside here nothing doing there so uh, what a difference a few weeks makes the ferrari was pretty strong at daytona and uh, well fancy car as it was introduced to our racing but hit with the biggest power reduction of any car around here and unfortunately uh, that has uh, slightly done for that car here and it's uh, made it pretty unfancied uh, in this race now not very popular and that's why you got to keep on top of the BRP. Um, as all of the uh, all of the teams do, they work out what the uh, the best car is, and it's sort of part of your homework that you have to do. We do have a lot of special events out there, though. <laughs> um, fortunately for some of these uh, chassis, they are a little bit more um, spread out. I guess it's not like we have them every single week. And some of the other special events that we do have on the iRacing special event calendar are in completely different uh, formulas of cars and styles of racing, which is what we absolutely love. But for the teams in this category, the GT, the endurance style. Uh, definitely part of it that you have to work out what your uh, your best way of getting to the end of the race uh, is. We come back to the BS competition cars, fifth and sixth place, eight seconds off Simify ahead, slightly pulling away from Pajador as they're really <laughs> grinding the walls there, pushing it to the limit. And I do wonder if they are going to be able to close uh, the gap to that Simify car. They are um, pretty 
equal on pace, but let's see how that one um, works out because the, uh, the BS uh, competition car was three tenths faster, uh, but of course now being held up by the team. They're all losing time to Team Redline. The gap now over 20 seconds for the lead of this race as we actually approach the halfway mark in this one. Getting uh, quite close to the point now. Where we've got less time to go than we have gone in this race uh, as of today so far. So uh, thanks for, for being along with us here on Racebot TV or the iRacing channels here this afternoon. It's myself, Ian O'Leary, and Cam Roger with you for another couple of... Uh, well, I'll be with you for another couple of hours. Cam here for another half until uh, we say goodbye to him. But it's been uh, an engaging race so far. Certainly an interesting uh, start to this one. A bit of follow the leader to start with, but then a bit of strategy. A bit of a brainwave, you've got saved for Team Redland. I'm not sure who saw the short fill coming. I mean, Arjuna uh, did float the idea in the first stint that there might be a short fill, but I've got to say I didn't believe it and, and I think a few others didn't really believe that it would be possible either, but clearly Redline is showing that it was possible, it is possible and it may well be the fastest strategy as of right now because the 70 car uh, is lighter on fuel during most parts of the race and that's one of the big advantages that they've gained themselves throughout the entirety of this one so far. Yeah, so the reason why it's worked is because in, obviously, the, the first pit stop or two, they would take less fuel, so they would have gained time from that. Then they would have been on less fuel in the second stint, so they would have gained more time from that, and that would have uh, what's opened up the gap. But they did, then if they basically, it's one of those things where you can't have your, you know, you can't take every single stint, because if they did that all the time, then eventually they would have to make an extra pit stop, or they would then be so far offset that they would actually start losing time. So they do it a couple of times at the beginning of the race to get the gap, and then they still leave themselves enough margin to save those laps to the end of the race whilst they already have the uh, track position. So they've obviously done the maths, they've worked it out, and uh, it's seemingly uh, the best way because that gap, they've got the gap, the extra sort of 10, 20 seconds to the field, and it's just stayed there. So it is clearly the best strategy. They know they got the pace. They know they got the fuel saving ability. So when everyone saw them pitting early at the beginning of the race, they probably thought, oh, this, what, you know, what's this strategy going to be? But it's actually not because they couldn't save fuel that they had to pit early. It was actually because they could. So they used up or they gave themselves extra laps to save, but for the track position. And uh, it's got them the lead as of right now. So team red line one, two and three. As you can see, all covered within 10 seconds of one another. Luke Bennett, according to Vince, because he was uh, held up behind the Lucas Prada battle. We were just uh, uh, checking in on that a couple of moments ago. WSR Esports book kicker. He has now been overtaken, though, by da uh, David Sobrero in the 62 Brabham Esports car. So there has been a change there outside the top 20. The 26th position, in fact, uh, between those two BMWs. So... The green and gold goes through uh, for Sobrero there. G Gabriel Erdley actually of ATRAC Sports right there with them. Now two in the midfield. Well, that's probably our biggest group in the uh, in the race as of right now. It is also a, sort of a testament to the stage of this race, uh, really, because we're probably at the stage now where this field is the most spread out that it will be throughout the, rema the remainder of this one because when we hit the halfway mark effectively the strategies are as spread out as they can be but then eventually you get uh, the strategies starting to work themselves out and everything gets a bit closer again but whether anyone will get closer to redline again is uh, uh, really a bit of a mystery and one that I, I think a lot of people are not very hopeful that anyone's going to get close again to be honest on pure pace I think it's going to be difficult purely because Redline have three cars in there as well. So even if they catch the first one um, of uh, the number seven, Labiga at the wheel at the moment, they still have another 10 seconds uh, to catch Benito, including overtaking Bennett. So it's definitely a bit of a, a, a difficult part of the race for those drivers. But the pace is looking so good. I mean, those BS cars that we we're talking about, I mean, they're doing four ones. And uh, guess what the leader just did last time? Four one. So it's not like... Um, the, uh, the pace isn't there. These, these are fast times coming in from them behind. They just need to find a way of getting that time back. The issue is, as you're saying, is they're set on their strategy kind of a little bit. So it's not like they can 
I mean, I guess one of them could try now uh, doing a shorter fill um, and then trying to save those laps then to the end. But it's a little bit more of an awkward way of doing it. It's a much more efficient to do it at the start of the race like Redline did. Yeah, it's uh, it certainly is. Uh, unfortunately, a bit late now if you're uh, someone trying to get on terms. So there's uh, Enzo Benito working his way uh, around uh, right now. Now, it's uh, I've, I've just noticed actually that the 44 Team Redline car is indeed out of the race for sure now. Gustavo Ariel will not be returning in that Lamborghini. So one race leader down, but still three to go for Redline and Italy. But still, that means that only the BS Competition number 16 car is, uh, is one that has... Uh, Continued on after problems in this race. There is Bruno Spengler actually who's at the wheel now. Real world driver of course as well. We've seen a few of those so far today. And Bruno Spengler can be added to our list. So uh, props to him especially for uh, getting into this race. Getting stuck in and continuing despite being four laps down on the uh, on the leaderboards at the moment in 42nd position. Yeah, it's great to see uh, Bruno coming in. And of course, uh, over the course of the year, we see many real world drivers uh, coming into the sim and getting involved in these races. But Bruno is especially one of those who's actually properly involved uh, with the team of BS competition as well. He's not one of these drivers who just shows up and races for one of our, our sim teams. Um, for uh, for a random race Bruno's actually there involved with the team and he's proper passionate about it as well which is really really good to see he's proper involved and even though the car's uh, multiple laps down he's still getting in there with uh, six and a half hours to go and putting in a stint and that is really what you want um from the uh from the real world drivers to uh, to get that involved and really just show how important it is um and of course with the the famous quote of max over the last week or so uh, really mentioning that he does think that there is a crossover between the sim and the real world um which uh, as we ever hope gets closer and closer and we do see that with multiple uh, drivers now being able to, to do both sides uh, to explain the quote that in case you've uh, not seen it i, th I think max seven says something along the lines of uh, sim drivers can 100 percent be drivers in the real world or, or something to that effect yeah. um would you go along with that i suppose you're we're a bit biased aren't we really uh, a little bit biased but i th i mean i think it's um it, it, it can be seen there's obviously uh, there's less drivers who've gone from the sim to the real world and uh, made it work but it's also coming back the other way um the fact that they still just prove their class uh in the sim and then but then when someone around them uh who's pretty fast gets the opportunity in a real world car then they're often fast uh, as well and one i think a good example is also for instance like james baldwin um for instance uh when he came to british gt a couple of years ago and just instantly i don't know if it was his first race but it's one of the first races he won anyway um so just straight away getting up towards the to the top speed so it definitely can work obviously it depends on the person because in the real world you still need to have some level of fitness um which maybe is lost in some sim races um in the nicest way possible um so i think definitely there's that part of it but from the ability and from the understanding point of view i definitely think there's a crossover uh, roman grosjean agreed with the, uh, the statement on twitter as well by the way that uh, that was posted out so uh, so fair enough do you not think that uh, it's important to train for sim racing as well it's it's sort of been a long held or well a, a long long time ago in other sports that don't require uh, much physical uh, exertion, for example. Um, I mean, I've got a big answer for that. Okay. Big answer. Okay. Um, it, 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 a long, long time ago, it was thought that it didn't really matter how you how you trained or ate or drank in a sport that doesn't require a fi as much physical exertion as, as uh, some of the more traditional ones. Uh, because you know you're not using your body that much after all, but uh, it, but it's since been found that it does help with concentration, and so um, I, I guess that applies to sim racers too. And the stereotype of everybody just being um, unhealthy and overweight is no longer the case. Yeah, it's not also just about being overweight; it's the other way around as well. Um, 
uh, you know, being a bit, a bit skinny as well sometimes. But yeah, there's a big, big crossover between your physical health and your mental health. And the only thing uh, that's really important in sim, sim racing is the uh, the mental side of things. As uh, I just want to take a quick moment to see, because BS Turner might actually make this move down in towards uh, the chicane, going through the chase. And yes, that is going to be a nice, easy move up the inside there. No real uh, battle uh, on the brakes as that move has been uh, completely clear. But that's a prime example there in, uh, in racing. When you have these uh, moments like that, it's all about the mental side of it. You have to have the, um, the ability to stay calm and to complete the move and not to overreact, not to get uh, hot-headed, and then also to have the concentration over the course of a long, long stint. And you have to have your, your brain in the right mindset uh, to do that. So some people, maybe they need that physical exercise, not just for the strength uh, side thing or the fitness side of things, but also just for the, for the mental clarity to be able to drive. Because it's not healthy. If you think about it, it's not healthy to be on your rig 12 hours a day to get fast. Sure, maybe for that race, you're going to be faster. But if you do that for six months, you're going to be completely burnt out. And then you're actually going to be slower um, at the end of it. So you have to actually uh, think about it. And I, I definitely think it's a big thing that um, teams are sort of looking into to make sure that their drivers are as fit as possible. Yes, it, there's a fine balance, isn't there, between practicing uh, too much and practicing not enough. And it does feel like it. Do you not feel like it in sim racing at the moment, especially in the year or so? I think as, as a whole c community, uh, I might pause that thought here for a second. This is fight for 10th place, just uh, continues on. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second, don't worry. But uh, for now, Drago Racing and Apex Racing team going side by side. In fact, it was Drago Racing side by side in the last battle we just, and the pass position that we just saw, but it's the 169 that goes through into 10th position this time, but Apex Racing team not willing to go down without a fight here. Absolutely, then got the other Drago car, the uh, the Porsche up in behind as well. So Drago trying to make a double overtake on the 99 there. And they might be able to do so, of course, splitting their uh, chassis <laughs> between the teams as well, trying to go for um, you know, the best of both worlds. And certainly we'll see how that one works because it's now the opportunity of the nine, uh, sorry, the 696 car to try and get through as we come up the mountain straight. Are they going to be able to follow their team through or even the 99 uh, may be able to get back past. Let's see if they get close. They're certainly... Uh, closing in as we get up towards the braking zone. We've definitely seen the overtakes into that corner, though it is very difficult and they do choose to stay behind uh, just for now. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, uh, a close battle forming there. Uh, there it is. They make their way over the top of the mountain uh, again. Just before we resume that discussion, by the way, a, a good afternoon to uh, Kev from Adelaide, who's in our Twitch our racing chat at the moment. He says uh, he's 72 and so training for him is getting in and out of the sim rig. Well, fair enough. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's great that uh, you're still driving in the sim and, and still here on our racing. And the beauty of it is that uh, pretty much anybody can do it. So um, that's uh, oh, that absolutely. a great thing, especially on, uh, especially on our racing and, and a special event like this where anyone can compete in any split. Um, meanwhile, Dan Woods tries to hang on ahead of Vasilios Pelletziotis here for eighth position and will do so into the chase. Uh, do you not feel in the last year or so that we've maybe gone a bit too far in sim racing in terms of the amount of practice that has gone in for s some events in the course of 2023? It feels like some uh, professionals have spent almost all day and all night in their sim rig, uh, sort of contrary to what you were saying earlier about practicing too much. And it feels like some certain drivers might have even done that. Yeah, there's definitely that. I think that comes the nature of two things. Uh, the major one is also um, just how competitive it is now. So you have to do that extra thousand laps to gain that extra tenth of a second because you need to, otherwise you're not competitive. But also, most of these drivers at the top level are on some sort of full-time or part-time contract. So they're literally paid to do the practice. So therefore, um, obviously that's what they're going to do. But up the inside, we're going to see a bit of a side-by-side -side battle once more as the uh, one machine goes through on Damon Woods as the uh, nine there drops down into that ninth place. So Belisot is uh, back up to eighth and he's got a few seconds to catch down to his teammate. Very uh, aggressive and forceful move, but uh, easily, uh, easily done there uh, up the inside. And yeah, I definitely think it's also to do with the, um, the amount of competitions that we have now. So you've got these full-time drivers or semi-pro uh, semi drivers who are literally, as I said, multiple hours a week to do these practices and to get up to speed for these races. But then we also have so many competitions now. Obviously, obviously these special events, you know, they're one a month or, you know, one every three weeks over the course of the year. But in between that, we have all these big esports competitions where every week there's two, three races. And a lot of these drivers do all of that. 
So you have to do that six, seven, eight hours practice for every single one of those races, every single week. And it's just constant. They're always, always driving. So I definitely think we have gone that way of too much practice. Maybe we need to start limiting certain knowledge uh, of certain mm. events. That's been something that's come around. Maybe not knowing the track or maybe not knowing the car. Um, so you can't uh, directly practice. Yeah, it's, it's always impossible to do that for this, isn't it, really? Because it's... Uh it's the buffer Strovo. <laughs> what are you going to hide from the drivers about that? You know, everyone's going to know. Yeah, for even this, if, definitely. Even if you don't sort of announce it, then everyone sort of knows. But I, I definitely agree that for some uh, other championships, it'd be a great idea. Maybe you should do that in your championship camp. <laughs> well, yes, uh, potentially. Um, yeah, so in the league, in the, you know, the, the community leagues uh, situation that Ewan is talking about, I do host one myself. Um, I guess that would be a little bit more of a, an opportunity where we could say, you know, it's a 10 race season, but maybe we do a pool of 20 tracks and it could be any one of those that's drawn from a hat like an hour before, something like that. That is definitely a, a possibility. It's just also whether drivers want that as well, <laughs> you know, whether well, teams want to sign up for that. If, if we if we cave to what the drivers want all the time, then we'll have all the nice driver things and no nice spectator things, won't we? So we can't That's give the drivers what they want every time. That is a fair point. That is a fair point. So maybe something to, uh, to look at because I do agree. It is a, is a big problem um, now. And uh, being able to limit that is uh, something that I think, yeah, organizers need to, to look at over the next uh, couple of years. Because while it's fun doing all of this, we have to think about the longevity. And I think burnout is definitely a, a big thing in some drivers. Yeah, I think it's uh, already happened to a degree for uh, for some of them as well. So uh, so there we go. Uh, just to let you know on YouTube, by the way, we are about to switch over our streams in about 15 minutes time. So uh, just make sure you are uh, aware of that and you know where the second one is. It should be on the uh, RaceBot YouTube channel or iRacing's YouTube channel. You can find the second part. We'll be starting that up in about 15 minutes time. So make sure you uh, come and join us over there for the second half of the iRacing Bathurst 12-hour for 2024. Um, meanwhile, we'll be continuing uh, on this stream for another quarter of an hour or so and seeing whether the Apex Racing Team can stop losing positions quite so quickly here because the 99 car now, driven by Jimmy Antunes, has started to lose a bit of speed and a bit of time. Dragger Racing's uh, 169 has gotten through and the 696 is looking for a way through here pretty quickly uh, and pretty soon as well. Yeah, Maciejewski's uh, cutting uh, a little bit closer, but not quite enough to make a move just yet. So uh, definitely looking, um, you know, ahead, trying to make that move. But also in the background, we've got the five uh, Williams Esports Fanatec car, uh, Parker White, not too far back and doing very similar lap times. So maybe he's going to be closing up at some point um, as well. Maybe turning this into a four-way battle, just see coming in towards the final breaking zone. Um, so uh, Antonis, yeah, not... I thought it might be a bit of a, you know, a leak where the tap opens sometimes, <laughs> the floodgates open and you lose one, two, three positions at once, but he was able to uh, control that and only lose that one place to uh, to the first Drago car. But actually I say that, he goes a little bit wide there. That's going to lose him a bit of momentum down the straight. See if uh, there'll be any changes into turn two. You'd imagine he'll just protect the inside line and so there won't be any move here. And uh, no, the answer uh, will remain... Uh, 11th for Apex Racing Team, so they hang on in the Mercedes. And meanwhile, by the way, just to update you on the leading gap, two and a half seconds now for Enzo Benito and Gabi Montoro, nearly 25 seconds off of the lead now. The gaps are growing out front all over again. We're getting to that stage in the race where it's actually pretty difficult to expect these drivers to bring this gap down. I mean, can Simi Fai really gain four seconds per in on that first red line car? It's difficult to do that. Uh, considering they've lost four this time rather than gained. I don't think so. Uh, not on pure pace uh, anyway. But there could always be further contacts like we saw with the 44 red line car. And uh, having said that, it was the 99. Uh, that was the uh, the uh, the issue in the way of the 44. Not this time around through that same section of corner, through the dipper. Uh, but certainly the 696 getting closer and closer as they've ever been. And of course, the car pulling away ahead means less draft as we come down this back straight. Let's see if there's going to be a move. The exit needs to be good from Forest Elbow here. And was it good enough? Well, the Porsche seemingly struggling a little bit in the slipstream of the Mercedes ahead. 
Is it a bit of a car thing that's uh, holding Dago Racing back at the moment? Well, maybe, because they can't do it into the chase, even despite being that close behind on the way out. Good run through the chase again, though. Maybe there'll be a chance into the final corner here. It's going to have to be a late dive, though, and it's very difficult to uh, make those kind of uh, dives, really, for Jakub uh, Masiewski. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you saw... Oh, dear, that was a strange line off of Boris Telbo for Yuri Kazdorp. Is that, but, is that crapping a little bit, or is that just a shadow? Looks maybe like it is. Um, yeah, I think it might be. Let's have a look at what happened to Yuri. He's sliding from quite a long time through and actually doesn't hit any walls. Oh, dear. That's a nervous place to be. I, uh, I'm actually scared about the reverse here more th more so than the spin itself. He actually does that in a very smart way. So I think... Oh, Yuri, gonna... oh, no. <laughs> that was very close. Avoided major contacts. Um, I think that was that the Sabolt car. Maybe that's a few laps Simon down. But, uh, oh, yeah, Simon C, sorry. Yeah. Um, either way, uh, not a nice situation to be in. As we have seen a swap of positions, the 696 has got through. Uh, in the meantime, as the 99 drops down to 12th place, and I wonder if that was up into turn two this time around. We did see, of course, on the previous lap, the 99 making a move, and let's see how it was done. Uh, did he grab the inside at turn two, or was it somehow differently? Ah, does he... Oh, this is a puzzling one. So he's very close through turn two there. He's not going to dive at the cutting, surely. Masievsky. Oh my goodness! Audacious from Jakub Masievsky, and there's contact as well. Dimi Antunes stamped on the brakes actually to get rid of the contact, and he loses the place as a result. That was ambitious, but it did turn out all right for Jakub Masievsky, who's now into 11th position. And considering we saw that maybe it was a top speed issue for the Porsche to get through, he had to do it somewhere else. And we did say he don't always overtake into the cutting, but he managed to make it work. And he certainly is holding on to that position just now. Not without the tiny bit of a door bang, um, but that's just nature of that corner. It gets very tight on the exit and he had to do so. And I seeming, uh, seeming to remember um, back at Daytona as well, the Porsche may be struggling a little bit. But let's see this. Leaves him room. And yeah, I guess he does come a little bit wide and does the 696 of Maciejewski. Um, but I don't think there will be anything really too much to um, uh, to moan about from Apex. Uh, just the nature of that corner. But what it has done as well is it's brought in uh, the car in behind uh, that I was mentioning, the Williams Esports car. Uh, very close now, just about half a second behind. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty close, actually, from 10th place on back. Very close gaps right down to like to the 23rd or so. Zenzo Benito makes his way past uh, another bit of lap traffic. I don't know if you saw last weekend, by the way, at Cam, but Jakub Masiewski had one of the least or most unlucky um, uh, pesk rounds I've ever seen. Getting caught up in two crashes that weren't really his fault either time, um, with incidents happening in front of him. And he got caught up in the first lap, in the first sector both times. So he's uh, had a bit of bad luck recently, but back on it again now. Back racing again. And... Uh, Back at Bathurst as well for uh, Drago Racing, which is uh, very pleased about. He'll be uh, driving with Nicholas Matteo today in uh, in that Porsche. One of uh, four cars that Drago Racing have got entered into this race. They're becoming quite a big team, actually, in uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of size. That's what you have to do to compete against these five Williams teams of the four red lines and uh, multiple others. Uh, was it three or four BS cars out there as well? Um, so definitely that's what you have to do to, to compete nowadays. Uh, unfortunately, over the course of the last couple of years, there's been a few teams, um, you know, uh, closed doors, uh, basically. So these these drivers have gone to other teams that have just got bigger. And now we have these huge organizations. And it's uh, it really is a big machine uh, running the top level of uh, sim racing, especially here on the uh, the iRacing service. And they, uh, they put a lot of effort a lot of time, a lot of money into these things, and so do the drivers. And uh, the ones getting the rewards at the moment is Team Redline. Uh, but let's see how this one uh, unfolds as uh, Benito has extended that gap further. It's now up to three seconds. He, he has. I, I said this to Arjuna earlier on on the broadcast. You know, this, do you think this could become a problem in the coming years? Because there's a lot of teams now who've got a lot of drivers to their name. And so in... in 
Multi-class events, it's not quite as bad. There's uh, a little bit more variety and, and the big teams generally all come out to play and there's uh, quite an even amount of them. But in some single car championships where there's, you know, a lot of these drivers from the same team, all very quick, all working together in some ways, I mean, could be a problem for sim racing to solve in the next few years if there's uh, some of these big teams maybe hoarding uh, a lot of good drivers, as you sort of see in some team sports sometimes. As uh, Oh, that's a pretty late move to the pit lane from Benito, but he's uh, made it in. Um, you see this sometimes in team sports, some of the best teams hoarding good players and not really letting them play very much. Um, whereas in sim racing, we've got some big teams with a lot of uh, a lot of big drivers on them could be a problem to solve soon yeah i guess <clears throat> guess it's a difficult thing to regulate really because there's no um yeah sort of governing body <laughs> i guess you would call it um of that sort of thing um but then it just comes down to contracts and obviously most of the drivers will have you know legitimate contracts um so then it comes down to drivers negotiating these things as well and potentially not signing really long-term deals um, where they get held up with these teams. And that will, um, um, yeah, obviously open up the door potentially for moves at some point, and then it becomes a competitive game. Uh, but there's also a thing in sim racing. I think drivers like being in the same place for quite a while. It's not like you know, maybe a football team or something uh, where you want to change every couple of years to go to a different environment. I think especially in sim racing, you, you've got to find the people who work together well and uh, prepare in the right way. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's plenty of, exam of examples of that. Gustavo Aero was at his previous team before Redline for three years, for example, beforehand, which is maybe a little bit on the short side, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still starting on that time. Uh, just a reminder that in five minutes' time, we'll be moving out over YouTube streams, so if you are watching us over there, then, uh, then get ready for that. Uh, in about five minutes' time, so you can continue watching the 2024 Bathurst 12 Hour uh, with us here on iRacing. And um, if you're on the Twitch channel, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you can just sit there and enjoy the race uh, for now. And we're almost at the halfway point of, of this race at the moment. It's fair to say who the favourites are at this stage, really. Team Redline are a long way out front in the rest of the field, but plenty of the other positions are still to be settled. And arguably the battle for the race win between the red lines is still to be settled as well with the, the car that leads for most of the stint having to come in so early compared to the others yes yeah, definitely a lot of things still to be written in the second half of this race so it is by no means over and it's definitely one to uh, to keep watching in that uh, second part that we'll go to uh, in a few minutes' time. And uh, one thing that we did see was this Williams, number 15, obviously dropped back. But uh, the 89 hasn't been able to keep up with their teammate up ahead. So maybe this is a bit of a change of form. Of course, the 89 being driven by uh, Phil Dinez, not being able to keep up with his teammate coming back. And now he's got Pashtor right on the back of his car, maybe looking for a move. Uh, that Marla Racing Team car has really been flying here as well. That's the car just further up the road, fourth place for them. Then it's PS Competition and then Williams, who are having a bit of a resurgence here, maybe on the older tyres. Porsche has been able to look after them uh, better, but the BMW is not exactly bad at looking after its tyres by any means. So Pastor has been able to close in a little bit as a result. Uh, he stays behind, though, on the way towards Turn 3 and probably will do so over the top of the mountain as well. And... Making a move, I think, at this stage is maybe not a good idea. We're about to hit the six-hour mark, of course, and that means pit stops very soon. It's probably better to just stay behind and work your way past in the pit stops rather than risking a move actually on the track. And we'll see if the potential slight deficit in top speed is going to be the same uh, for this car as we saw a little bit early as well for the uh, for the Drago HC entry in 10th place right now and whether that is going to be an, an issue to overtake. Uh, of course, it's been very close so far um, and that might need a, uh, a bit of a send down the inside like Maciejewski uh, tried in towards the cutting and as you say, it might be better to try and do it in the pit stop somehow but then if you're you know, just going into the uh, into pit stop and taking a full tank of fuel, there's a little bit less you can do. But that's a little bit of a wiggle, actually. Uh, coming out to the elbow, might be half an opportunity here for the 15. Let's see, in towards the chase, is the Porsche going to be strong enough in a straight line? We know it had problems uh, as it was uh, released for the first time, this Porsche, in terms of uh, a straight line. We saw that at Daytona. 
What about into the chase this time around? He gets very close to Pasteur, but not close enough to make a dive. It would have been uh, pretty audacious anyway. And so uh, he stays behind for the moment. In towards the final couple of corners they go. And he uh, has to uh, stick where he is. These guys are about half a minute off of the lead, by the way, of Team Redline. And they're about half a minute ahead of those uh, behind as well. The notable thing here, Cam, is that Johnny Vetto is now in the number 70 car and he's ahead of the traffic. So you think a repeat of what happened to Gustavo Ariel may not well be on the cars. Yeah, that is uh, very true. Um, they obviously gained some time then on that pack over the course of the last hour or so, because before they were going right in between that battle. And now um, he is ahead of it, as you say. And 20 seconds up the road. So, yeah, he's going to be loving that one. Um, nice bit of uh, clean air uh, so far. But clean air is not what the 15 has at the moment. But he just can't quite find a way past. This is where uh, Maciejewski sent it down the inside. Is he going to be thinking about it? Not quite enough, because the issue is the gap between the, sort of the apex of the kink and then uh, the actual breaking zone isn't quite enough realistically to make an overtake so you do have to send it a little bit and start taking some risk and um, looking at how close he got on the previous lap uh, down the Commonwealth straight into the chase I do think he lifted off if he was really going for the overtake he probably could have sent it but I think he's just as you say saved him to the pit stop uh, he certainly is uh, thanks very much Camp for joining us here in this uh, race it's been uh, great to be alongside you for the last couple of hours here at the Bathurst 12 hour that was Cam Roger joining us uh, here on Racebot TV now joining myself, you and O'Leary, for the next couple of hours, uh, Peter Mackay, who will uh, be taking you towards four hours to go uh, in this one. Good to be uh, alongside you, Peter, for this one. Six hours still to go in this uh, race and uh, a long way to go and, and some very big gaps as well. It's fair to say that Team Redline have been uh, dominant so far, I think is the word. I would use the same word, definitely, Ewan. I mean, the... Yeah, the sheer just impressive nature that uh, Team Redline have brought to this, not only this running of the uh, iRacing Bathurst 12 hours, but in general, they've won the event twice before. If they were to win today, which at the moment they're going very much the right way about it, it would be a record third win in the running of this event. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty ominous for the rest of the field right now, it must be said. Very ominous indeed. In terms of those who are giving chase, semi far Esports are the best of the rest in third place. Gabby Montoro, although that's really fourth place because of uh, what we've been talking about throughout this race so far. The number 70 car is slightly out of whack with the rest. Then there is uh, Marla Racing Team, BS Competition and Williams Esports, which is the battle that you're seeing on your screen at the moment. And into turn two, Fildenes is continuing to lead the Porsche around but we really do hit six hours to go now we're halfway through the bat first 12 hour for 2024 here on iRacing and uh, we've still got half of it remaining we're on the countdown now rather than the counts up counting down of course towards that checkered flag uh, now there was a great countdown towards the checkered flag in the real world of course Peter very much enjoyed last weekend's race I've got to say uh, in terms of seeing a similar grandstand finish here well it's going to be a bit different isn't it because there's no safety cars but nevertheless there's still a world in which we get a close finish here but it could even just be between the teammates Gavin Montoro 23 seconds off the lead and Luke Bennett was even a few seconds behind the 70 car before it came in to make its necessary stop the one thing you have to always keep in mind though at Bathurst is it can go wrong in a flash very much like it can at the Nürburgring uh, or a 24-hour, the Bathurst 12, you can be leading the race, everything can be looking great, and this circuit can just bite if you let your guard down at any one point. We saw that in the, uh, the IRL event last week uh, when the leading BMW went to pass a slower car, got it ever so slightly wrong, and bang, they were out of the... They did a Tony Hawk, uh, Tony Hawk skateboarding move up the barrier, and they were out the race, and that was it. So, and then... OK, we don't have the intervention of weather yet in the iRacing platform, uh, but, you know, that was what we had last weekend as well. A little bit of weather can mix it up there too. But in this virtual version, it's more just one little blip in concentration coming up over the mountain. You clip a wall and all of a sudden you're not in the, the hunt. The one caveat to that is, is that Team Redline, if one car falters, they've still got several others in the uh, right up there at the front, which is a, a rare luxury to have. Exactly. They, they were covering the positions first to fourth uh, until that incident. Just to let you know, the first stream, by the way, will be ending on Racebot TV 
uh, and iRacing now on YouTube. So make sure you switch over now if you haven't already, because it will be closing very soon. And so uh, make sure you join us on part two if you are able to. And uh, we hope to see you over there. If you're on Twitch, of course, you've been sitting back. You don't have to do anything um, to uh, to continue watching us here on Racebot TV this afternoon. So uh, I hope you'll uh, remain in our company here today and you will uh, remain watching the race for the remainder of this one until the finish. I see everyone's very uh, very excited for Rain Pit, and there's, uh, there's no question about that. I do wonder what it's going to bring to the iRacing service in terms of these special events uh, and in terms of these professionals as well, because that's what we watch a lot of here on the uh, on Racebot TV. Is it going to bring in that bit of adaptability maybe that is sometimes lacking from sim racing? People are so aware of where each round is going to be and what car they're going to be using that they get so much practice in they know almost every or they think they, they know almost everything that a car and track combination has to offer and so that does mean there's a fairly fairly limited adaptability that the drivers have to do sure the conditions change a little bit these days in our racing but it's not very much and it's certainly not much compared to the rain that we're going to see so I for one hope that Adaptability is going to be part of the skill set that a, a modern uh, sim racing professional is going to need as opposed to these days where they just need a lot of practice. It's definitely going to add a hugely interesting element to these uh, special events. I, I firmly believe that. Um, and I think it's going to change the way the teams have to prepare. As you rightly say, right now they can do huge amounts of uh, huge amounts of laps and simply dial in the absolute perfect setup and drill themselves then as well with muscle memory where they could drive around almost seemingly blindfolded at times because they're just so in the groove because of the amount of practice that they've done but the the addition of uh, of, of changeable weather uh, in the iRacing simulator is going to change all that and I think you then will need to know what the lap time differences are when you switch from a dry to uh, are we going to have intermediates and wets or is it going to be a dry or a wet do we know? That is a good question that um, I don't know the answer to. Well, that it, is important as well. They'll need to know what the deltas are and is it worth changing onto a different tyre and coming into the pits or whether do you just stick it out? We might see a lot of drivers simply having to learn how to drive on a, on a damp track on slicks. That'll be fun to watch. Yeah, and, and rain being in one part of the circuit and not another mm. is uh, something else to consider. And it will be there in time for the Nürburgring 24. I thought I'd... Uh, put those two sentences sort of together, if you like, <laughs> to uh, because that will be important when we get to there in May. So uh, watch out for that. Uh, or June it is these days, isn't it? Or, or, uh, around that time, May sort of time. Um, uh, this, the, I, the IRL one is at the end of May. Um, so I'm not think, sure if it's the weekend before or the weekend after. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, it's got to, it can't be on the weekend of the actual race either, which is... Uh, uh, all, all the Indy 500 is something to work around, so it's it's all a bit of a headache in May. So um, it, it'll be some time in that part of the year. Um, so uh, so we'll have that on Racebot TV, of course. A couple of people asking what happened to Gustavo Ariel uh, today. Um, that happened about an hour ago, unfortunately, for the 44 Team Redline car. They are now out of the race. They uh, hit into the back of the Apex Racing Team number 99 car, which is currently running in seventh place. After they'd made their stop, after Ariel had made a stop, he hit the back of him on the way down the dipper, went for a spin, did a good job of getting back going again. In fact, this is the incident. This is a replay of what happened. See, Dunn just gets a little bit sideways. Errol gets into the back of him, goes for a spin, and then he goes for a quite precarious roll down the hill here. And a really difficult moment for everybody as they try to figure their way past through a blind corner. And that is a perfect example of how just... Oh... How one ever so slight, ever so slight error of judgment under pressure. Well, no, not even under pressure, just one slight blip in concentration and it's game over. And I'm sure the leading Team Redline cars will be fully aware of that. In fact, that incident will have brought it into much sharper focus. So uh, the 20 car, the 7 car for Team Redline, 70 car also, you know, they will... Uh, they'll all be fully aware of that. And also, they're at the teams that are chasing them, you know, uh, they will semify in uh, Mala, BMW, BS competition, etc. They will all be keeping that in mind, thinking we, if we keep pushing to the max, 
we can keep the keep Team Redline under pressure and hope that little mistakes like that happen. And before you know it, we've got a different conversation. It's, uh, it's mistakes is what it's going to take uh, around here. Although it is uh, it is Bathurst, so maybe the chances of those slightly increase somewhat. Now they seem to have this uh, the circuit absolutely down at the moment, and they're uh, driving very well. Are the whole red line team? There's Gianni Vecchio now at the wheel of the number 70 car as the number seven comes into pit lane. We're, we're quite a long way past the hour now. So in terms of fuel stints here, I think the, the encouraging thing for the number 20 and the number seven is that they're going a long way past the hour. So that means they can save a bit of time in the final pit stop of the day. They can uh, afford not to fill the tank up all the way. Whereas the number 70 car still pitting short of the hour. They've got to do a bit of fuel saving and they'll be taking on pretty much a full tank at the end of the race. So, as I said, it probably is a conversation just between red line cars at the moment, but it is an interesting conversation, and we're still at that stage where we don't really know who's going to win here. It's more, I think it's more, of a, at the moment, the decision of, yeah, who's, uh, which red line car could come out on, on top. We may well see them all converging with those slightly different strategies. Um, and they've all gone for the, uh, the Lamborghini, Hurricane, uh, have, after a couple of years winning uh, in the, uh, well, the, the McLaren, actually, the McLaren MP412C, the winner of the uh, Bathurst 12-hour and I racing last year with the Apex Racing Team and the year before with Team Redline. It was Max Verstappen and a McLaren. That's some uh, soundbite to break the internet with. Absolutely. A couple of uh, Audis before that. Uh, and would you believe it, a BMW Z4 the year before that. Um, I just thought I'd mention that. It's uh, my favourite Brilliant car. car. What a car. Such a great car. And Lewis McLeod still thinks the M4 looks better, which is unbelievable. Lewis, McGre Lewis McLeod is wrong. He is wrong about that, yeah. That is uh, that is not uh, a better-looking car. <laughs> than the, uh, not that it's a bad-looking car. It's just that the Z4 is one of the best race cars visually, but also sound-wise, too. I think sound-wise, even, be even better than its looks. Oh, so good. I, I had the pleasure of uh, listening to that car, and it was very much towards the end of his li end of its life as a GT3. It must have been 2016 or 15, maybe. What, sort of that kind of era in the British GT Championship, the final round. And uh, there was that... I can't remember who sponsored them, but it's sort of this bright green and orange livery that was very bright um, on a BMW Z4, and it sounds absolutely brutal. It was... Just fantastic uh, to listen to at Donington Park, which is uh, where I was. And uh, yeah, what a great car. That, I'm very glad that I got there at the final year. I don't know, I can't remember what year it was, but it was the final year of circulation of that car. And I'm very glad I got there for its final, one of its final races anywhere, actually, uh, at, uh, at one of the top classes of competition because it was about to be phased out by the M6, I believe, was taking over at the time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, what a great car. I've heard it in the GTLM specification on a parade run a couple of times. Um, and I presume they're, they're fairly similar in terms of uh, engine, etc. And it's the sounds absolutely, I agree with you, it sounds absolutely superb. It's a pity that it's, uh, it's not eligible anymore, but time moves on. Time moves on. Maybe it can make its way in, the, uh, in one of the historic classes in, uh, in iRacing, which actually have taken a, a real resurgence. The... Um, the GT1 cars, the Aston Martin, DBR9 and Chevrolet Corvette C6 have struggled for participation in the uh, officials, but then they added in what is the best car on iRacing, the HPD ARX. And uh, yeah, that's that's given the whole the whole official series there a massive, massive lift and I've nice. been thoroughly enjoying driving the, uh, the HPD. It's great fun. Very nice. That's sort of a, a throwback as to what iRacing used to be like for a mm. prototype versus GT sort of uh, sort of battle. And by the way, you mentioned you can't uh, drive the Z4 very often anymore or, or at all in officials sort of been phased out. But 